Dogs and All About Them by Robert Layton Chapter 26 The Basset Hound The Basset was not familiarly known to British sportsmen before 1863, in which year specimens of the breed were seen at the first exhibition of dogs held in Paris, and caused general curiosity and admiration among English visitors. In France, however, this hound has been used for generations, much as we use our spaniel, as a finder of game in covert, and it has long been a popular sporting dog in Russia and Germany. In early times it was chiefly to be found in Artois and Flanders, where it is supposed to have had its origin. But the home of the better type of Basset is now chiefly in La Vendée, in which department some remarkably fine strains have been produced. There are three main strains of the French Basset, the Lane, the Couteau, and the Griffon. The Griffon Basset is a hound of a hard, bristly coat and short, crooked legs. It has never found great favour here. The Lane hounds are derived from the kennels of Monsieur Lane of Francfield, Baus, Seine Inferieure, and are also very little appreciated in this country. They are a lemon and white variety, with torse or bent legs. The Couteau hounds were a type bred up into a strain by Comte Le Couteau de Canteleur. They were tricolour with straight, short legs, of sounder constitution than other strains, with a make generally of a more agile hound, and in the pedigree of the best bassets owned in this country fifteen years ago, when the breed was in considerable demand, Comte de Couteau's strain was prominent and always sought for. With careful selection and judicious breeding, we have now produced a beautiful hound of fine, smooth coat and a rich admixture of markings, with a head of noble character and the best of legs and feet. Their short, twinkling legs make our bassets more suitable for covert hunting than for hunting hares in the open, to which latter purpose they have frequently been adapted with some success. Their note is resonant with wonderful power for so small a dog, and in tone it resembles the voice of the bloodhound. The basset hound is usually very good-tempered, and not inclined to be quarrelsome with his kennel mates, but he is willful, and loves to roam apart in search of game, and is not very amenable to discipline when alone. On the other hand, he works admirably with his companions in the pack, when he is most painstaking and indefatigable. Endowed with remarkable powers of scent, he will hunt a drag with keen intelligence. There are now several packs of bassets kept in England, and they show very fair sport after the hares. But it is not their natural vocation, and their massive build is against the possibility of their becoming popular as harriers. The general custom is to follow them on foot, although occasionally some sportsmen use ponies. Their pace, however, hardly warrants the latter expedient. On the continent, where big game is more common than with us, the employment of the basset is varied. He is a valuable help in the tracking of boar, wolf, and deer, and he is also frequently engaged in the lighter pastimes of pheasant and partridge shooting. The Earl of Onslow and the late Sir John Everett Millay were among the earliest importers of the breed into England. They both had recourse to the kennels of Count Couteau. Sir John Millais' model was the first basset hound, exhibited at an English dog show at Wolverhampton in 1875. Later owners and breeders of prominence were Mr. G. Crell, Mrs. Stokes, Mrs. C. C. Ellis, and Mrs. Mabel Totty. As with most imported breeds, the basset hound when first exhibited was required to undergo a probationary period as a foreign dog in the variety class of the principal shows. It was not until 1880 that a class was provided for it by the Kennel Club. It is to be regretted that owners of this beautiful hound are not more numerous. Admirable specimens are still to be seen at the leading exhibitions, but the breed is greatly in need of encouragement. At the present time, the smooth dog hound taking the foremost place in the estimate of our most capable judges is Mr. W. W. M. White's champion Lou Lou Lou, bred by Mrs. Totty, by champion Louis Le Beau out of Sibella. Mr. Croxton Smith's Waverer is also a dog of remarkably fine type. Among bitch hounds, Sandringham Dido, the favourite of Her Majesty the Queen, ranks as the most perfect of her kind. The rough or griffin basset 
introduced into England at a later date than the smooth, has failed for some reason to receive great attention. In type it resembles the shaggy otterhound, and as at present favoured it is larger and higher on the leg than the smooth variety. Their colouring is less distinct, and they seem generally to be lemon and white, grey and sandy red. Their note is not so rich as that of the smooth variety. In France the rough and the smooth bassets are not regarded as of the same race, but here some breeders have crossed the two varieties, with indifferent consequences. Some beautiful specimens of the rough basset have from time to time been sent to exhibition from the Sandringham Kennels. His Majesty the King has always given affectionate attention to this breed, and has taken several first prizes at the leading shows, latterly with Sandringham Bobs, bred in the home kennels by Sandringham Babel ex Saracenesca. Perhaps the most explicit description of the perfect basset hound is still that compiled twenty-five years ago by Sir John Millet. It is at least sufficiently comprehensive and exact to serve as a guide. The basset, for its size, has more bone, perhaps, than nearly any other dog. The skull should be peaked like that of the bloodhound, with the same dignity and expression. The nose black although some of my own have white about theirs, and well flewed. For the size of the hound, I think the teeth are extremely small. However, as they are not intended to destroy life, this is probably the reason. The ears should hang like the bloodhounds, and are like the softest velvet drapery. The eyes are deep brown, and are brimful of affection and intelligence. They are pretty deeply set, and should show a considerable haw. A basset is one of those hounds incapable of having a wicked eye. The neck is long, but of great power, and in the basset of Jean Boutos, the flews extend very nearly down to the chest. The chest is more expansive than even in the bulldog, and should in the bassets of Jean Boutos be not more than two inches from the ground. In the case of the bassets of Jean Demitours and Jean Droit, being generally lighter, their chests do not, of course, come so low. The shoulders are of great power, and terminate in the crooked feet of the basset, which appear to be a mass of joints. The back and ribs are strong, and the former of great length. The stern is carried gaily, like that of hounds in general, and when the hound is on the scent of game, this portion of his body gets extremely animated, and tells me in my own hounds when they have struck a fresh or a cold scent, and I even know when the foremost hound will give tongue. The hindquarters are very strong and muscular, the muscles standing rigidly out down to the hocks. The skin is soft in the smooth-haired dogs, and like that of any other hound, but in the rough variety it is like that of the otter hounds. Colour, of course, is a matter of fancy, although I infinitely prefer the tricolour, which has a tan head and a black and white body. End of chapter 26 Chapter 27 The Dachshund Persons unfamiliar with the sporting properties of this long-bodied breed are apt to refer smilingly to the dachshund as the dog that is sold by the yard, and few even of those who know him give credit to the debonair little fellow for the grim work which he is intended to perform in doing battle with the vicious badger in its lair. Dachshund means badger dog, and is a title fairly and squarely earned in his native Germany. Given proper training, he will perform the duties of several sporting breeds rolled into one. Possessing a wonderful nose, combined with remarkable steadiness, his kind will work out the coldest scent and once fairly on the line, they will give plenty of music and get over the ground at a pace almost incredible. Dachshunds hunt well in a pack, and, though it is not their recognized vocation, they can be successfully used on hare, on fox, and any form of vermin that wears a furry coat. But his legitimate work is directed against the badger, in locating the brock underground, worrying and driving him into his innermost earth, and there holding him until dug out. It is no part of his calling to come to close grips, though that often happens in the confined space in which he has to work. In this position a badger, with his powerful claws, digs with such energy and skill as rapidly to bury himself. 
and the dachshund needs to be provided with such apparatus as will permit him to clear his way and keep in touch with his formidable quarry. The badger is also hunted by dachshunds above ground, usually in the mountainous parts of Germany and in the growing crops of maize on the lower slopes, where the vermin work terrible havoc in the evening. In this case, the badger is rounded up and driven by the dogs up to the guns, which are posted between the game and their earths. For this sport, the dog used is heavier, coarser, and of larger build, higher on leg, and more generally houndy in appearance. Dachshunds are frequently used for deer driving, in which operation they are especially valuable, as they work slowly and do not frighten or overrun their quarry, and can penetrate the densest undergrowth. Packs of dachshunds may sometimes be engaged on wild boar, and, as they are web-footed and excellent swimmers, there is no doubt that their terrier qualities would make them useful assistance to the otterhound. Apropos of their capabilities in the water, it is the case that a year or two ago, at Offenbach on Maine, at some trials arranged for life-saving by dogs, a dachshund carried off the first prize against all comers. As a companion in the house, the dachshund has perhaps no compeer. He is a perfect gentleman, cleanly in his habits, obedient, unobtrusive, incapable of smallness, affectionate, very sensitive to rebuke or to unkindness, and amusingly jealous. As a watch, he is excellent, quick to detect a strange footstep, valiant to defend the threshold and to challenge with deep voice any intruder yet sensibly discerning his master's friends and not annoying them with prolonged growling and grumbling as many terriers do when a stranger is admitted. Properly brought up, he is a perfectly safe and amusing companion for children, full of animal spirits and ever ready to share in a romp, even though it be accompanied by rough-and-tumble play. In Germany, where he is the most popular of all dogs, large or small, he is to be found in every home from the emperor's palace downwards and his quaint appearance coupled with his entertaining personality is daily seized upon by the comic papers to illustrate countless jokes at his expense the origin of the dachshund is not very clear some writers have professed to trace the breed or representations of it on the monuments of the egyptians some aver that it is a direct descendant of the french basset hound and others that he is related to the old turnspits, the dog so excellent in kitchen service, of whom Dr. Caius wrote, When any meat is to be roasted, they go into a wheel, where they, turning about with the weight of their bodies, so diligently look to their business that no drudge nor scullion can do the feats more cunningly, whom the popular sort thereupon termed turnspits. Certainly, the dog commonly used in this occupation was long of body and short of leg, very much resembling the dachshund. In all probability, the dachshund is a manufactured breed, a breed evolved from a large type of hound intermixed with a terrier to suit the special conditions involved in the pursuit and extermination of a quarry that, unchecked, was capable of seriously interfering with the cultivation of the land. He comprises in his small person the characteristics of both hound and terrier. His wonderful powers of scent, his long pendulous ears, and, for his size, enormous bone, speak of his descent from the hound that hunts by scent. In many respects he favors the bloodhound, and one may often see dachshunds which, having been bred from parents carefully selected to accentuate some fancy point, have exhibited the very pronounced peak occipital bone, the protruding haw of the eye, the loose dewlap and the color markings characteristic of the bloodhound. His small stature, iron heart, and willingness to enter the earth bespeak the terrier cross. The dachshund was first introduced to this country in sufficient numbers to merit notice in the early sixties, and speedily attracting notice by his quaint formation and undoubted sporting instincts soon became a favorite. At first appearing at shows in the foreign dog class, he quickly received a recognition of his claims to more favored treatment, and was prompted by the Kennel Club to a special classification as a sporting dog. Since then his rise has been rapid, and he now is reckoned as one of the numerically largest breeds exhibited. 
Unfortunately, however, he has been little, if ever used for sport in the sense that applies in Germany, and this fact, coupled with years of breeding from too small a stock, or stock too nearly related, and the insane striving after the fanciful and exaggerated points demanded by judges at dog shows, many of whom never saw a dog suit at his legitimate work, has seriously affected his usefulness. He has deteriorated in type, lost grit and sense too, and often a parody of the true type of dachshund that is to be found in his native land. To the reader who contemplates possessing one or more dachshunds, a word of advice may be offered. Whether you want a dog for sport or show or as a companion, endeavor to get a good one, a well-bred one. To arrive at this, do not buy from an advertisement on your own knowledge of the breed, but seek out an expert amateur breeder and exhibitor, and get his advice and assistance. If you intend to start a kennel for show purpose, do not buy a high-priced dog at a show, but start with a well-bred bitch and breed your own puppies, under the guidance of an aforementioned expert. In this way, and by rearing and keeping your puppies till they are of an age to be exhibited, and at the same time carefully noting the awards the best shows, you will speedily learn which to retain and the right type of dog to keep and breed for and in future operations you will be able to discard inferior puppies at an earlier age but it is a great mistake if you intend to form a kennel for show purposes or to sell or part with your puppies too early it is notorious with all breeds that puppies change very much as they grow the best looking in the nest often go wrong later and the ugly ducklings turn out to be the best of the litter this is especially true of dachshunds and it requires an expert to pick the best puppy of a litter at a month or two old, and even he may be at fault unless a puppy is exceptionally well reared. To rear dachshund puppies successfully, you must not overload them with fat. Give them strengthening food that does not lay on flesh. Lean, raw beef, finely chopped, is an excellent food once or twice a day for the first few months, and, though this comes expensive, it pays in the end. Raw meat is supposed to cause worm troubles, but these pests are found also where meat is not given, and in any case a puppy is fortified with more strength to withstand them if fed on raw meat than otherwise, and a good dosing from time to time will be all that is necessary to keep him well and happy. Young growing puppies must have their freedom to gamble about and get their legs strong. Never keep the puppies cooped up in a small kennel run or house. If you have a fair-sized yard, give them the run of that, or even the garden, in spite of what your gardener may say. They may do a little damage to the flowers, but assuredly do good to themselves. They love to dig in the soft borders. Digging is second nature to them, and is of great importance in their development. If you have not a garden, or if the flowers are too sacred, it is better to place your puppies as early as possible with respectable cottagers or small farmers especially the latter with whom they will have entire freedom to run about and will not be overfed if you intend to show your puppies you should begin some time in advance to school them to walk on the lead and to stand quiet when ordered to much depends on this in the judging ring where a dog who is unused to being on a lead often spoils his chances of appearing at his best under the to him strange experiences of restraint which the lead entails during the past five and twenty years, the names of two particular dachshunds stand out head and shoulders above those of their competitors, champions Jackdaw and Pterodactyl. Jackdaw had a wonderful record during a long show career, never being beaten in his class from start to finish and having won many valuable prizes. He was credited with being the most perfect dachshund that had ever been seen in England, and probably as good as anything in Germany. Champion Jackdaw was a black and tan dog, bred and owned by Mr. Harry Jones of Ipswich. He was sired by Champion Charkow out of Wagtail and born 20th July, 1886. Through his dam, he was descended from a famous bitch, Thusnelda, who was imported by Mr. Muddy in the early 80s. She was a winner of high honors in Hanover. The name of Jackdaw figures in all the best pedigrees of today. Champion Pterodactyl was born in 1888 and bred by Mr. Willink. He was in a measure an outcross from the standard type of the day, 
and his dam, whose pedigree is in dispute, was thought to have been imported. After passing through one or two hands, he was purchased by Mr. Harry Jones, and in his kennel speedily made a great name in the show ring and at the stud, and was eventually sold for a high price to Mr. Sidney Woodwiss, who at that period had the largest kennel of dachshunds in England. Taro, as he was called, was a big, light red dog, with wonderful forequarters and great muscular development. He also possessed what is called a punishing jaw, and rather short ears, and looked a thorough business dog. He had an almost unbroken series of successes at shows in England, and being taken to Germany in the days before the quarantine regulations, he took the highest honors in the heavyweight class and a special prize for the best dachshund of all classes. This dog became the favorite sire of his day, and the fashionable color. The black and tan thereupon went quite out of favor, and this fact, coupled with the reckless amount of inbreeding of red to red that has been going on since Tarot's day, accounts largely for the prevalence of light eyes, pink noses, and bad colored coats of the dachshunds as a class today. There are, strictly speaking, three varieties of dachshund. A. The short-haired. B. The long-haired. And C. The rough-haired. Of these, we most usually find the first named in England, and they are no doubt the original stock. Of the others, though fairly numerous in Germany, few are to be seen in this country, and although one or two have been imported, the type has never seemed to appeal to exhibitors. Both the long-haired and rough-haired varieties had no doubt been produced by crosses with other breeds, such as the Spaniel and probably the Irish Terrier, respectively. In the long-haired variety, the hair should be soft and wavy, forming lengthy plumes under the throat, lower parts of the body, and the backs of the legs, and is longest on the underside of the tail, where it forms a regular flag like that of a setter or spaniel. The rough-haired variety shows strongly a terrier cross by his varmint expression and short ears. The Germans also subdivide by color, and again for show purposes by weight. These subdivisions are dealt with in their proper order in the standard of points, and it is only necessary to say here that all the varieties, colors, and weights are judged by the same standard except in so far as they differ in the texture of coat. At the same time, the Germans themselves do not regard the dappled dachshunds as so yet fixed in type as the original colored dogs, and this exception must also apply to the long and the rough-haired varieties. The following German standard of points embodies a detailed description of the breed. General Appearance and Disposition In general, the appearance of the dachshund is a very long and low dog, with compact and well-muscled body, resting on short, slightly crooked forelegs, a long head and ears, with bold and defiant carriage and intelligent expression. In disposition, the dachshund is full of spirit, defiant when attacked, aggressive even to foolhardiness when attacking, in play amusing and untiring, by nature willful and unheeding. Head Long and appearing conical from above and from a side view, tapering to the point of the muzzle, wedge-shaped. The skull should be broad rather than narrow to allow plenty of brain room, slightly arched and fairly straight, without a stop, but neither deep nor snippy. Eyes Medium in size, oval and set obliquely, with very clear, sharp expression, and of a dark color except in the case of the liver and tan, when the eyes may be yellow, and in the dapple when the eyes may be light or wall-eyed. Nose, preferably deep black. The flesh-colored and spotted noses are allowable only in the liver and tan and dapple varieties. Ears, set on moderately high or seen in profile above the level of the eyes, well back, flat, not folded, pointed or narrow, hanging close to the cheeks, very mobile, and, when at attention, carried with the back of the ear upward and outward. Neck, moderately long, with slightly arched nape, muscular and clean, showing no dewlap, and carried well up and forward. Forequarters. His work underground demands strength and compactness, and, therefore, the chest and shoulder regions should be deep, long, and wide. The shoulder blade should be long and set on very sloping, the upper arm of equal length with, and at right angles to, the shoulder blade. 
strong-boned and well-muscled and lying close to the ribs but moving freely the lower arm is slightly bent inwards and the feet should be turned slightly outwards giving an appearance of crooked legs approximating to the cabriole of a chippendale chair straight narrow short shoulders are always accompanied by straight short upper arms forming an obtuse angle badly developed brisket and keel or chicken breast and the upper arm, being thrown forward by the weight of the body behind, causes the legs to knuckle over at the knees. Broad, sloping shoulders, on the other hand, ensure soundness of the forelegs and feet. Legs and Feet Forelegs very short and strong in bone, slightly bent inwards, seen in profile, moderately straight and never bending forward or knuckling over. Feet large, round, and strong, with thick pads, compact and well-arched toes nails strong and black the dog must stand equally on all parts of the foot body should be long and muscular the chest very oval rather than very narrow and deep to allow ample room for heart and lungs hanging low between front legs the brisket point should be high and very prominent the ribs well sprung out towards the loins not flat-sided loins short and strong the line of the back only slightly depressed behind the shoulders and only slightly arched over loins. The hind quarters should not be higher than the shoulders, thus giving a general appearance of levelness. Hind quarters. The rump, round, broad, and powerfully muscled. Hip bone not too short, but broad and sloping. The upper arm, or thigh, thick of good length and jointed at right angles to the hip bone. The lower leg, or second thigh, is, compared with other animals, short and set on at right angles to the upper thigh, and is very firmly muscled. The hind legs are lighter in bone than the front ones, but very strongly muscled, with well-rounded out buttocks, and the knee joint well developed. Seen from behind, the legs should be wide apart and straight, and not cow-hocked. The dog should not be higher at the quarters than at shoulder. Stern set on fairly high strong at root and tapering but not too long neither too much curved nor carried too high well but not too much feathered a bushy tail is better than too little hair coat and skin hair short and close as possible glossy and smooth but resistant to the touch if stroked the wrong way the skin tough and elastic but fitting close to the body color one colored there are several self-colors recognized, including deep red, yellowish red, smutty red. Of these, the dark, or cherry, red is preferable. And in this color, light shadings on any part of the body or head are undesirable. Black is rare, and is only a sport from black and tan. Two-colored, deep black, brown, liver or gray, with golden or tan markings, spots over the eyes and at the sides of the jaws and lips, inner rim of ears, the breast, inside and back of legs, the feet, and under the tail for about one-third of its length. In the above-mentioned colors, white markings are objectionable, the utmost that is allowed being a small spot or a few hairs on the chest. Dappled, a silver-gray, almost white foundation color with dark, irregular spots, small for preference, of dark gray brown tan or black the general appearance should be a bright indefinite coloration which is considered especially useful in a hunting dog weight dachshunds in germany are classified by weight as follows light weight dogs up to sixteen and one half pound bitches up to fifteen and one half pound middle weight dogs up to twenty two pound bitches up to twenty two pound heavy weight over twenty two pound toys up to twelve pound the german pound is one tenth more than the english the lightweight dog is most used for going to ground end of chapter twenty seven chapter twenty eight the old working terrier there can hardly have been a time since the period of the norman conquest when the small earth dogs which we now call terriers were not known in these islands and used by sporting men as assistants in the chase and by husbandmen for the killing of obnoxious vermin. The two little dogs shown in the bayou tapestry running with the hounds in advance of King Harold's hawking party were probably meant for terriers. 
Dame Juliana Berners in the 15th century did not neglect to include the terrors in her catalogue of sporting dogs, and a hundred years later Dr. Caius gave pointed recognition to their value in unearthing the fox and drawing the badger. Another sort there is, wrote the doctor's translator in 1576, which hunteth the fox and the badger or grey onely, whom they call terrors, because they, after the manner and custom of ferrets in searching for conies, creep into the ground, and by that means make afraid, nip and bite the fox and the badger in such sort that either they tear them in pieces with their teeth, being in the bosom of the earth, or else haul and pull them perforce out of their lurking angles, dark dungeons and close caves, or at the least, through concerned fear, drive them out of their hollow harbours, insomuch that they are compelled to prepare speedy flight, and, being desirous of the next, albeit the, the safest refuge, are otherwise taken and entrapped with snares and nets laid over holes to the same purpose. But these be the least in that kind called sajax. The color, size, and shape of the original terriers are not indicated by the early writers, and art supplies but vague and uncertain evidence. Nicholas Cox, who wrote of sporting dogs in The Gentleman's Recreation, 1667, seems to suggest that the type of working terrier was already fixed sufficiently to be divided into two kinds, the one having shaggy coats and straight limbs, the other smooth coats and short bent legs. Yet some years later another authority, Blom, in the same publication was more guarded in his statements as to the terrier type when he wrote, Everybody that is a fox hunter is of opinion that he hath a good breed, and some will say that the terrier is a peculiar species of itself. I will not say anything to the affirmative or negative of the point. Searching for evidence on the subject, one finds that perhaps the earliest references to the colors of terriers were made by Daniel in his field sports at the end of the 18th century, when he described two sorts, the one rough, short-legged, and long-backed, very strong, and most commonly of a black or yellowish color mixed with white, evidently a hound-marked dog, and another smooth-coated and beautifully formed, with a shorter body and more sprightly appearance, generally of a reddish-brown color or black with tanned legs. Gilpin's portrait of Colonel Thornton's celebrated pitch, painted in 1790, presents a terrier having a smooth white coat with a black patch at the set-on of the undocked tail, and black markings on the face and ears. The dog's head is badly drawn and small in proportion but the body and legs and coloring would hardly disgrace the totteridge kennels of today. Fox terriers of a noted strain were depicted from life by Wrangell in the Sportsman's Cabinet, published over a hundred years ago, and in the text accompanying the engraving a minute account is given of the peculiarities and working capacities of the terrier. We are told that there were two breeds, the one wire-haired, larger, more powerful, and harder bitten, the other smooth-haired and smaller, with more style. The wire hairs were white with spots, the smooths were black and tan, the tan apparently predominating over the black. The same writer states that it was customary to take out a brace of terriers with a pack of hounds, a larger and a smaller one, the smaller dog being used in emergency when the earth proved to be too narrow to admit his bigger companion. It is well known that many of the old fox hunters have kept their special breeds of terrier, and the Belvoir, the Grove, and Lord Middleton's are among the packs to which particular terrier strains have been attached. That even a hundred years ago terriers were bred with care, and that certain strains were held in a special value, is shown by the recorded fact that a litter of seven puppies was sold for twenty-one guineas, a good price even in these days, and that on one occasion so high a sum as twenty guineas was paid for a full-grown dog. At that time there was no definite and well-established breed recognized throughout the islands by a specific name. The embracing title of Terrier included all the varieties which have since been carefully differentiated, but very many of the breeds existed in their respective localities awaiting national recognition. Here and there some squire or huntsman nurtured a particular strain and developed a type which he kept pure, and at many a manor house and farmstead in Devonshire and Cumberland, 
on many a highland estate and Irish riverside where there were foxes to be hunted or otters to be killed, terriers of definite strain were religiously cherished. Several of these still survive, and are as respectable in descent and quite as important historically as some of the favored and fashionable champions of our time. They do not perhaps possess the outward beauty and distinction of type which would justify their being brought into general notice, but as workers they retain all the fire and verve that are required in dogs that are expected to encounter such vicious vermin as the badger and the fox. Some of the breeds of terriers seen nowadays in every dog show were equally obscure and unknown a few years back. Thirty-seven years ago the now popular Irish terrier was practically unknown in England, and the Scottish terrier was only beginning to be recognized as a distinct breed. The Welsh terrier is quite a new introduction that a dozen or so years ago was seldom seen outside the Principality, and so recently as 1881 the Airedale was merely a local dog known in Yorkshire as the Waterside or the Bingley Terrier. Yet the breeds just mentioned are all of unimpeachable ancestry, and the circumstance that they were formerly bred within limited neighborhoods is in itself an argument in favor of their purity. We have seen the process of a sudden leap into recognition enacted during the past few years in connection with the White Terrier of the Western Highlands a dog which was familiarly known in Argyllshire centuries ago, yet which has only lately emerged from the heathery hillsides around Pultalock to become an attraction on the benches at the Crystal Palace and on the lawns of the Botanical Gardens. And the example suggests the possibility that in another decade or so the neglected Sealyham Terrier, the ignored terrier of the borders, and the almost forgotten Jack Russell strain may have claimed a due recompense for their long neglect. There are lovers of the hard-bitten working earth dogs who still keep these strains inviolate, and who greatly prefer them to the better-known terriers whose natural activities have been too often atrophied by a system of artificial breeding to show points. Few of these old unregistered breeds would attract the eye of the fancier accustomed to judge a dog parading before him in the show ring. To know their value and to appreciate their sterling good qualities, one needs to watch them at work on badger or when they hit upon the line of an otter. It is then that they display the alertness and the daredevil courage which have won for the English terriers their name and fame. An excellent working terrier was the white, rough-haired strain kept by the Reverend John Russell in Devonshire, and distributed among privileged sportsmen about Somersetshire and Gloucestershire. The working attributes of these energetic terriers have long been understood, and the smart, plucky little dogs have been constantly coveted by breeders all over the country, but they have never won the popularity they deserve. Those who have kept both varieties prefer the Russell to the Sealyham Terrier, which is nevertheless an excellent worker. It is on record that one of these, a bitch of only nine pounds weight, fought and killed single-handed a full-grown dog fox. The Sealyham derives its breed name from the seat of the Edwards family near Haverfordswest, in Pembrokeshire, where the strain has been carefully preserved for well over a century. It is a long-bodied, short-legged terrier with a hard, wiry coat, frequently whole white, but also white with black or brown markings, or brown with black. They may be as heavy as 17 pounds, but 12 pounds is the average weight. Some years ago the breed seemed to be on the downgrade, requiring fresh blood from a well-chosen outcross. One hears very little concerning them nowadays but it is certain that when in their prime they possessed all the grit, determination, and endurance that are looked for in a good working terrier. A wire-haired black and tan terrier was once common in Suffolk and Norfolk, where it was much used for rabbiting, but it may now be extinct, or, if not extinct, probably identified with a Welsh terrier, which it closely resembled in size and coloring. There was also in Shropshire a well-known breed of wire-haired terriers, black and tan, on very short legs and weighing about 10 pounds or 12 pounds, with long, punishing heads and extraordinary working powers. So, too, in Lancashire and Cheshire one used to meet with sandy-colored terriers of no very well-authenticated strain, 
but closely resembling the present breed of Irish Terrier, and Squire Thornton, at his place near Pickering in Yorkshire, had a breed of wire hairs tan in color with a black stripe down the back. Then there is the Cowley strain, kept by the Cowleys of Callipers near King's Langley. These are white, wire-haired dogs marked like the Fox Terrier and exceedingly game. Possibly the Elterwater Terrier is no longer to be found, but some few of them still existed a dozen years or so ago in the Lake District, where they were used in conjunction with the West Cumberland Otter Hounds. They were not easily distinguishable from the better-known Border Terriers, of which there are still many strains, ranging from Northumberland, where Mr. T. Robson of Bellingham has kept them for many years, to Galloway and Ayrshire and the Lothians, where their coats become longer and less crisp. There are many more local varieties of the working terrier, as, for example, the Rosaneath, which is often confused with the Pultilock, or the White West Highlander, to whom it is possibly related, and the Pittenweem, with which the Pultilock terriers are now being crossed while well, Mrs. Alastair Campbell of Ardrashegg has a pack of Cairn Terriers which seem to represent the original type of the improved Scotty. Considering the great number of strains that have been preserved by sporting families and maintained in more or less purity to type, it is easy to understand how a new breed may become fashionable and still claim the honor of long descent. They may not in all cases have the beauty of shape which is desired on the show bench, but it is well to remember that while our show terriers have been bred to the highest perfection, we still possess in Great Britain a separate order of earth dogs that for pluckily following the fox and the badger into their lairs or bolting an otter from his holt cannot be excelled all the world over. End of chapter 28 Chapter 29 The White English Terrier This dog, one would think, ought, by the dignified title which he bears, to be considered a representative national terrier, forming a fourth in the distinctively British quartet, whose other members are the Scottish, the Irish, and the Welsh terriers. Possibly in the early days, when Pearson and Rucroft bred him to perfection, it was hoped and intended that he should become a breed typical of England. He is still the only terrier who owns the national name, but he has long ago yielded pride of place to the fox terrier, and it is the case that the best specimens of his race are bred north of the border, while, instead of being the most popular dog in the land, he is actually one of the most neglected and the most seldom seen. At the Kennel Club show of 1909 there was not a single specimen of the breed on view, nor was one to be found at the recent shows at Edinburgh, Birmingham, Manchester, or Islington, nor at the National Terrier Show at Westminster. It is a pity that so smart and beautiful a dog should be suffered to fall into such absolute neglect. One wonders what the reason of it can be. Possibly it is that the belief still prevails that he is of delicate constitution and is not gifted with a great amount of intelligence or sagacity. There is no doubt, however, that a potent factor in hastening the decline is to be found in the edict against cropping. Neither the White Terrier nor the Manchester Terrier has since been anything like so popular as they both were before April 1898, when the Kennel Club passed the law that dogs' ears must not be cropped. Writers on canine history, and Mr. Rawdon Lee among the number, tell us that the English White Terrier is a comparatively new breed, and that there is no evidence to show where he originally sprang from, who produced him, or for what reason he was introduced. His existence as a distinct breed is dated back no longer than forty years. This is about the accepted age of most of our named English Terriers. Half a century ago, before the institution of properly organized dog shows drew particular attention to the differentiation of breeds, the generic term terrier, without distinction, was applied to all earth dogs, and the consideration of color and size was the only common rule observed in breeding. But it would not be difficult to prove that a white terrier resembling the one now under notice existed in England as a separate variety, many generations anterior to the period usually assigned to its recognition. 
in the national portrait gallery there is a portrait of mary of modena queen consort of james the second painted in sixteen hundred and seventy by william wissing who has introduced at the queen's side a terrier that is undoubtedly of this type the dog has slight brown or brindle markings on the back as many english white terriers have and it is to be presumed that it is of the breed from which this variety is descended apart from colour there is not a great difference between the white english terrier and the manchester black and tan but although they are of similar shape and partake much of the same general character yet there is the distinction that in the black and tan the conservation of type is stronger and more noticeable than in the white in which the correct shape and action are difficult to obtain it ought naturally to be easier to breed a pure white dog from white parents than to breed correctly marked and well tanned puppies from perfect black and tans but the efforts of many breeders do not seem to support such a theory in connection with the english terrier whose litters frequently show the blemish of a spot of brindle or russet these spots usually appear behind the ears or on the neck and are of course a disfigurement on a dog whose coat to be perfect should be of an intense and brilliant white it appears to be equally difficult to breed one which while having the desired purity of colour is also perfect in shape and terrier character it is to be noted too that many otherwise good specimens are deaf a fault which seriously militates against the dog's possibilities as a companion or as a watch birmingham and manchester were the localities in which the english terrier was most popular forty years ago but it was mr frederick white of clapham who bred all the best of the white variety and who made it popular in the neighbourhood of london his terriers were of a strain founded by a dog named king dick and in eighteen hundred and sixty three he exhibited a notable team in laddie fly teddy and nettle mr s e shirley m p was attracted to the breed and possessed many good examples as also did the rev j w mellor and mr j h murchison mr alfred benjamin sylvia was a prominent dog in eighteen hundred and seventy seven sylvia was bred by mr james rucroft of bolton who owned a large kennel of this variety of terrier and who joined with his townsman joe walker and with bill pearson in raising the breed to popularity in lancashire bill pearson was the breeder of tim who was considered the best terrier of his time a dog of fourteen pounds with a brilliant white coat the darkest of eyes and a perfect black nose it is apparent that the whippet was largely used as a cross with the english terrier which may account to a great extent for the decline of terrier character in the breed wiser breeders had recourse to the more closely allied bull terrier mr shirley's prize-winning purity was by tim out of a bull terrier bitch and there is no doubt that whatever stamina remains in the breed has been supported by this cross the following is the description laid down by the white english terrier club head narrow long and level almost flat skull without cheek muzzles wedge shaped well filled up under the eyes tapering to the nose and not lippy eyes small and black set fairly close together and oblong in shape nose perfectly black ears cropped and standing perfectly erect neck and shoulders the neck should be fairly long and tapering from the shoulders to the head with sloping shoulders the neck being free from throatiness and slightly arched at the occiput chest narrow and deep body short and curving upwards at the loins sprung out behind the shoulders back slightly arched at loins and falling again at the joining of the tail to the same height as the shoulders legs perfectly straight and well under the body moderate in bone and of proportionate length feet feet nicely arched with toes set well together and more inclined to be round than hare-footed tail moderate length and set on where the arch of the back ends thick where it joins the body and tapering to a point and not carried higher than the back coat close hard short and glossy colour pure white coloured marking to disqualify condition flesh and muscles to be hard and firm weight from twelve pounds to twenty pounds. End of chapter twenty nine. Chapter thirty. The Black and Tan Terrier. The Black and Tan, or Manchester Terrier, 
as we know him today, is a comparatively new variety, and he is not to be confounded with the original terrier with tan and black colouring which was referred to by Dr. Chaos in the sixteenth century, and which was at that time used for going to ground and driving out badgers and foxes. Formerly there was but little regard paid to colour and markings, and there was a considerably greater proportion of tan in the coat than there is at the present day, while the fancy markings such as pencilled toes, thumb marks, and kissing spots were not cultivated. The general outline of the dog, too, was less graceful and altogether coarser. During the first half of the nineteenth century the chief accomplishment of this terrier was rat-killing. There are some extraordinary accounts of his adroitness, as well as courage, in destroying these vermin. The feats of a dog called Billy are recorded. He was matched to destroy one hundred large rats in eight minutes and a half. The rats were brought into the ring in bags, and as soon as the number was complete, Billy was put over the railing into their midst. In six minutes and thirty-five seconds they were all destroyed. In another match he killed the same number in six minutes and thirteen seconds. It was a popular terrier in Lancashire, and it was in this county that the refining process in his shape and colouring was practised, and where he came by the name of the Manchester Terrier. Like the white English terriers, the black and tan has fallen on evil days. It is not a popular dog among fanciers, and although many good ones may be seen occasionally about the streets, the breed suffers from want of the care and attention that are incidental to the breeding and rearing of dogs intended for competition at shows. There are many who hold the opinion that one of the chief reasons for the decadence in the popularity of the black and tan terrier, notwithstanding its many claims to favour, is to be found in the loss of that very alert appearance which was a general characteristic before the kennel club made it illegal to crop the ears of such as were intended for exhibition. It must be admitted that until very recently there was a considerable amount of truth in the prevalent opinion, inasmuch as a rather heavy ear, if carried erect, was the best material to work upon, and from which to produce a long, fine, and upright or pricked effect, which was looked upon as being the correct thing in a cropped dog. Hence it followed that no care was taken to select breeding stock likely to produce the small, semi-erect, well-carried and thin years required to-day consequently when the edict forbidding the use of scissors came into force there were very few small eared dogs to be found it has taken at least ten or a dozen years to eradicate the mischief and even yet the cure is not complete Another factor which has had a bad effect is the belief, which has become much too prevalent, that a great deal of faking has been practised in the past, and that it has been so cleverly performed as to deceive the most observant judge, whereby a very artificial standard of quality has been obtained. The standard of points by which the breed should be judged is as follows. General appearance, a terrier calculated to make his own part in the rat pit, and not of the whippet type head the head should be long flat and narrow level and wet shaped without showing cheek muscles well filled up under the eyes with tapering tightly lipped jaws and level teeth eyes the eyes should be very small sparkling and bright set fairly close together and oblong in shape nose black ears the correct carriage of ears is a debatable point since cropping has been abolished Probably in the large breed the drop ear is correct, but for toys, either erect or semi-erect carriage of the ear is most desirable. Neck and shoulders. The neck should be fairly long and tapering from the shoulders to the head, with sloping shoulders, the neck being free from throatiness and slightly arched at the occiput. Chest. The chest should be narrow but deep. Body. The body should be moderately short and curving upwards at the loin. Ribs well sprung back slightly arched at the loin and falling again at the joining of the tail to the same height as the shoulders feet the feet should be more inclined to be cat than hare-footed tail the tail should be of moderate length and set on where the arch of the back ends thick where it joins the body tapering to a point and not carried higher than the back coat the coat should be close smooth short and glossy color the coat should be jet black and rich mahogany tan distributed over the body as follows on the head the muzzle is tanned to the nose which with the nasal bone is jet black there is also a bright spot on each cheek and above each eye 
the under jaw and throat are tanned and the hair inside the ears is the same color the forelegs stand up to the knee with black lines pencil marks up each toe and a black mark thumb mark above the foot inside the hind legs tanned but divided with black at the hock joints and under the tail also tanned and so is the vent but only sufficiently to be easily covered by the tail also slightly tanned on each side of the chest tan outside the hind legs commonly called breeching is a serious defect in all cases the black should not run into the tan nor vice versa but the division between the two colors should be well defined weight for toys not exceeding seven pounds for the large breed from ten to twenty pounds is most desirable End of chapter thirty chapter thirty one the bull terrier the bull terrier is now a gentlemanly and respectably owned dog wearing an immaculate white coat and a burnished silver collar he has dealings with aristocracy and is no longer condemned for keeping bad company but a generation or two ago he was commonly the associate of rogues and vagabonds skulking at the heels of such members of society as mr william sykes whom he accompanied at night on darksome business to keep watch outside while bill was within cracking the crib in those days the dog's ears were closely cropped not for the sake of embellishment but as a measure of protection against the fangs of his opponent in the pit when money was laid upon the result of a well-fought fight to the death for fighting was the acknowledged vocation of his order and he was bred and trained to the work he knew something of rats too and many of his kind were famed in the land for their prowess in this direction jimmy shaw's jacko could finish off sixty rats in three minutes and on one occasion made a record by killing a thousand in a trifle over an hour and a half the breed is sufficiently modern to leave no doubt as to its derivation in the first quarter of the nineteenth century attention was being directed to the improvement of terriers generally and new types were sought for they were alert agile little dogs excellent for work in the country but the extravagant corinthians of the time the young gamesters who patronized the prize ring and the cockpit desired to have a dog who should do something more than kill rats or unearth the fox or bolt the otter which accomplishments afforded no amusement to the town they wanted a dog combining all the dash and gameness of the terrier with the heart and courage and fighting instinct of the bulldog wherefore the terrier and the bulldog were crossed a large type of terrier was chosen and this would be the smooth-coated black and tan or the early english white terrier but probably both were used indifferently and for a considerable period the result gave the young bucks what they required a dog that was at once a determined vermin killer and an intrepid fighter upon whose skill in the pit wagers might with confidence be laid the animal however was neither a true terrier nor a true bulldog but an uncompromising mongrel albeit he served his immediate purpose and was highly valued for his pertinacity if not for his appearance in eighteen not six lord camelford possessed one for which he had paid the very high price of eighty-four guineas and which he presented to belker the pugilist this dog was figured in the sporting magazine of the time he was a short-legged thick-set fawn-coloured specimen with closely amputated ears a broad blunt muzzle and a considerable layback and this was the kind of dog which continued for many years to be known as the bull and terrier he was essentially a man's dog and was vastly in favour among the undergraduates of oxford and cambridge gradually the bulldog element at first pronounced was reduced to something like a fourth degree and with the terrier character predominating the head was sharpened the limbs were lengthened and straightened until little remained of the bulldog strain but the dauntless heart and the fearless fighting spirit together with the frequent reversion to brindle colouring which was the last outward and visible characteristic to appear within the remembrance of men not yet old the bull terrier was as much marked with fawn brindle or even black as are the fox terriers of our own period but fifty years or so ago white was becoming frequent and was much admired a strain of pure white was bred by james hinks a well-known dog dealer of birmingham and it is no doubt to hinks we are indebted for the elegant bull terrier of the type that we know to-day these birmingham dogs showed a refinement and grace and an absence of the crook legs and coloured patches which betrayed that hinks had been using an outcross with the english white terrier thus getting away further still from the bulldog 
with the advent of the hinks strain in eighteen sixty two the short-faced dog fell into disrepute and pure white became the accepted colour there was a wide latitude in the matter of weight if all other points were good a dog might weigh anything between ten and thirty-eight pounds but classes were usually divided for those above and those below sixteen pounds the type became fixed and it was ruled that the perfect bull terrier quote, must have a long head wide between the ears level jaws a small black eye a large black nose a long neck straight forelegs a small hare foot a narrow chest deep brisket powerful loin long body a tail set and carried low a fine coat and small ears well hung and dropping forward End quote. Idstone, who wrote this description in eighteen seventy two earnestly insisted that the ears of all dogs should be left uncut and as nature made them but for twenty years thereafter the ears of the bull terrier continued to be cropped to a thin erect point the practice of cropping it is true was even then illegal and punishable by law but although there were occasional convictions under the cruelty to animals act the dog owners who admired the alertness and perkiness of the cut ear ignored the risk they ran and it was not until the kennel club took resolute action against the practice that cropping was entirely abandoned the president of the kennel club mr s e shirley m p had himself been a prominent owner and breeder of the bull terrier his nelson bred by joe willock was celebrated as an excellent example of the small-sized terrier at a time however when there were not a great many competitors of the highest quality his dick also was a remarkably good dog earlier specimens which have left their names in the history of the breed were hinks's old touch who was perhaps even a more perfect terrier than the same breeders madman and puss lancashire and yorkshire have always been noted for good bull terriers and the best of the breed have usually been produced in the neighbourhoods of leeds bradford manchester bolton and liverpool while birmingham also shared in the reputation at one time londoners gave careful attention to the breed stimulated thereto by the encouragement of mr shirley and the success of alfred george of recent years the bull terrier has not been a great favourite and it has sadly deteriorated in type but there are signs that the variety is again coming into repute and within the last two years many admirable specimens as nearly perfect perhaps as many that won honour in former generations have been brought into prominence among dogs for example there are mr e t pym's sweet lavender dr m amsler's macgregor mr chris holker's his highness and mr j haynes's bloomsbury young king among bitches there are mrs kipping's delphinium wild and desdemona mr hornby's lady sweetheart mr w mayer's mill girl mr t ganaway's charlwood bell dr j w lowe's best of hardwick and mrs e g money's eastburn tarquinia while these and such as these beautiful and typical terriers are being bred and exhibited there is no cause to fear a further decline in popularity for a variety so eminently engaging the club description is as follows general appearance the general appearance of the bull terrier is that of a symmetrical animal the embodiment of agility grace elegance and determination head the head should be long flat and wide between the ears tapering to the nose without cheek muscles there should be a slight indentation down the face without a stop between the eyes the jaws should be long and very powerful with a large black nose and open nostrils eyes small and very black almond shape preferred the lips should meet as tightly as possible without a fold the teeth should be regular in shape and should meet exactly any deviation such as big jaw or being underhung is a great fault ears the ears when cropped should be done scientifically and according to fashion cropped dogs cannot win a prize at shows held under kennel club rules if born after march thirty first eighteen ninety five when not cropped it should be a semi erect ear but others do not disqualify neck the neck should be long and slightly arched nicely set into the shoulders tapering to the head without any loose skin as found in the bulldog shoulders the shoulders should be strong muscular and slanting chest wide and deep with ribs well rounded back the back short and muscular but not out of proportion to the general contour of the animal legs the forelegs should be perfectly straight with well-developed muscles 
not out at shoulder but set on the racing lines and very strong at the pastern joints the hind legs are long and in proportion to the forelegs muscular with good strong straight hocks well let down near the ground feet the feet should resemble those of a cat than a hare colour should be white coat short close and stiff to the touch with a fine gloss tail short in proportion to the size of the dog set on very low down thick where it joins the body and tapering to a fine point it should be carried at an angle of about forty five degrees without curl and never over the back height at shoulders from twelve to eighteen inches weight from fifteen pounds to fifty pounds End of chapter thirty one chapter thirty two the smooth fox terrier to attempt to set forth the origin of the fox terrier as we know him to-day would be of no interest to the gentle reader and would entail the task of tracing back the several heterogeneous sources from which he sprang it is a matter of very little moment whether he owes his origin to the white english terrier or to the bull terrier crossed with the black and tan or whether he has a mixture of beagle blood in his composition so it will suffice to take him as he emerged from the chaos of mongreldom about the middle of the last century rescued in the first instance by the desire of huntsmen or masters of well-known packs to produce a terrier somewhat in keeping with their hounds and in the second place to the advent of dog shows prior to that time any dog capable from his size conformation and pluck of going to ground and bolting his fox was a fox terrier were he rough or smooth black brown or white the starting point of the modern fox terrier dates from about the sixties and no pedigrees before that are worth considering from three dogs then well known old jock trap and tartar he claims descent and thanks to the fox terrier club and the great care taken in compiling their stud books he can be brought down to today of these three dogs old jock was undoubtedly more of a terrier than the others it is a moot point whether he was bred as stated in most records of the time by captain percy williams master of the rufford or by jack morgan huntsman to the grove it seems however well established that the former owned his sire also called jock and that his dam grove pepper was a property of morgan he first came before the public at the birmingham show in eighteen sixty two where shown by mr wootton of nottingham he won first prize he subsequently changed hands several times till he became the property of mr murchison in whose hands he died in the early seventies he was exhibited for the last time at the crystal palace in eighteen seventy and though then over ten years old one second to the same owner's trimmer at his best he was a smart well-balanced terrier with perhaps too much daylight under him and wanting somewhat in jaw power but he showed far less of the bull terrier type than did his contemporary tartar this dog's antecedents were very questionable and his breeder is given as mr stevenson of chester most of whose dogs were bull terriers pure and simple save that they had drop ears and short sterns being in this respect unlike old trap whose sire is generally supposed to have been a black and tan terrier this dog came from the oakley kennels and he was supposed to have been bred by a miller at leicester however questionable the antecedents of these three terriers may have been they are undoubtedly the progenitors of our present strain and from them arose the kennels that we have to-day mention has been made of mr murchison and to him we owe in a great measure the start in popularity which since the foundation of his large kennel the fox terrier has enjoyed mr murchison's chief opponents in the early seventies were mr gibson of brockenhurst with his dog Stike and old foiler mr luke turner of leicester with his belvoir strain which later gave us champion brockenhurst joe champion olive and her son champion spice mr theodore bassett mr allison and a year or so later mr frederick burbage the messiahs clark mr tin mr francis redmond and mr vickery about this time a tremendous impetus was given to the breed by the formation in eighteen seventy six of the fox terrier club which owed its inception to mr harding cox and a party of enthusiasts seated round his dinner-table at thirty six russell square among whom were 
messrs bassett burbage doyle allison and redmond the last two named being still members of the club the idea was very warmly welcomed a committee formed and a scale of points drawn up which with but one alteration is in vogue to-day every prominent exhibitor or breeder then and with few exceptions since has been a member and the club is by far the strongest of all specialist clubs it will be well to give here the set standard of points head and ears the skull should be flat and moderately narrow and gradually decreasing in width to the eyes not much stop should be apparent but there should be more dip in the profile between the forehead and top jaw than is seen in the case of a greyhound the cheeks must not be full the ears should be v-shaped and small of moderate thickness and dropping forward close to the cheek not hanging by the side of the head like a foxhound's the jaw upper and under should be strong and muscular should be of fair punishing strength but not so in any way to resemble the greyhound or modern english terrier there should not be much falling away below the eyes this part of the head should however be moderately chiselled out so as not to go down in a straight line like a wedge the nose towards which the muzzle must gradually taper should be black the eyes should be dark in colour small and rather deep set full of fire life and intelligence as nearly as possible circular in shape the teeth should be as nearly as possible level that is the upper teeth on the outside of the lower teeth neck should be clean and muscular without throatiness of fair length and gradually widening to the shoulders shoulders and chest the shoulders should be long and sloping well laid back fine at the points and clearly cut at the withers the chest deep and not broad back and loin the back should be short straight and strong with no appearance of slackness the loin should be powerful and very slightly arched the fore ribs should be moderately arched the back ribs deep and the dog should be well ribbed up hind quarters should be strong and muscular quite free from droop or crouch the thighs long and powerful hocks near the ground the dog standing well up on them like a foxhound and not straight in the stifle stern should be set on rather high and carried gaily but not over the back or curled it should be of good strength anything approaching a pipe stopper tail being especially objectionable legs and feet the legs viewed in any direction must be straight showing little or no appearance of an ankle in front they should be strong in bone throughout short and straight to pastern both fore and hind legs should be carried straight forward in travelling the stifles not turned outwards the elbows should hang perpendicular to the body working free of the side the feet should be round compact and not large the soles hard and tough the toes moderately arched and turned neither in nor out coat should be straight flat smooth hard dense and abundant the belly and underside of the thighs should not be bare as regards colour white should predominate brindle red or liver markings are objectionable otherwise this point is of little or no importance symmetry size and character the dog must present a general gay lively and active appearance bone and strength in a small compass are essentials but this must not be taken to mean that a fox terrier should be cloggy or in any way coarse speed and endurance must be looked to as well as power and the symmetry of the foxhound taken as a model the terrier like the hound must on no account be leggy nor must he be too short in the leg he should stand like a cleverly made hunter covering a lot of ground yet with a short back as before stated he will then attain the highest degree of propelling power together with the greatest length of stride that is compatible with the length of his body weight is not a certain criterion of a terrier's fitness for his work general shape size and contour are the main points and if a dog can gallop and stay and follow his fox up a drain 
it matters little what his weight is to a pound or so though roughly speaking it may be said he should not scale over twenty pounds in show condition disqualifying points nose white cherry or spotted to a considerable extent with either of these colours ears prick tulip or rose mouth much overshot or much undershot in order to give some idea of the extraordinary way in which the fox terrier took the public taste it will be necessary to hark back and give a resume of the principal kennels and exhibitors to whom this was due in the year in which the fox terrier club was formed mr fred burbage at one time captain of the survey eleven had the principal kennels he was the pluckiest buyer of his day and once he fancied a dog nothing stopped him till it was in his kennels he bought nimrod dorcas tweezers and nettle and with them and other discriminating purchases he was very hard to beat on the show bench strange to say at this time he seemed unable to breed a good dog and determined to have a clear out and start afresh a few brood bitches only were retained and the kennels moved from champion hill to hunton bridge in hertfordshire from thence in a few years came bloom blossom tweezers the second hunton baron hunton bridegroom and a host of others which spread the fame of the great hunton strain when the kennel was dispersed at mr burbage's untimely death in eighteen ninety two the dogs one hundred and thirty lots in all were sold by auction and realized thousand eight hundred pounds hunton tartar fetched hundred and thirty five pounds justice eighty four pounds bliss seventy pounds and scramble sixty five pounds messrs a h and c clark were at this time quietly founding a kennel which perhaps has left its mark more indelibly on the breed than any before or since brockenhurst rally was a most fortunate purchase from his breeder mr herbert peel and was by brockenhurst joe from a bitter's bitch as from this dog came roisterer and ruler their dam being jess an old turk bitch and from rollick by buff was bred ruse and ransom roisterer was a sire of rissolt by many considered the best fox terrier dog of all time and rissolt's own daughter rachel was certainly the best bitch of her day all these terriers had intense quality and style due for the most part to inbreeding very little new blood was introduced with an inevitable result and by degrees the kennel died out no history of the fox terrier could be complete without mention of mr francis redmond and his kennel going back as it does to the murchison and luke turner period and being still to-day the most prominent one in existence we can date his earlier efforts from his purchase of deacon nettle the dam of deacon ruby dusty was the dam of champion diamond dust deacon he had from luke turner and in this dog we have one of the foundation stones of the fox terrier stud book as he was the sire of splinter who in his turn was the sire of vesuvian mr redmond's next great winners were d'orsay and domini two sterling good terriers the former of which was the sire of dame d'orsay who bred to despoiler produced dame fortune the mother of donna fortuna whose other parent was domini donna fortuna considered universally the best specimen of a fox terrier ever produced had from the first a brilliant career for though fearlessly shown on all occasions she never knew defeat some took exception to her want of what is called terrier character and others would have liked her a shade smaller but we have still to see the fox terrier taken all round that could beat her as an outcross mr redmond purchased dreadnought one of the highest class dogs seen for many years but had very bad luck with him an accident preventing him from being shown and subsequently causing his early death we must not forget duchess of durham or dukedom but to enumerate all mr redmond's winners it would be necessary to take the catalogues of all the important shows held for the past thirty years to no one do we owe so much no one has made such a study of the breed reducing it almost to a science with the result that even outside his kennels no dog has any chance of permanently holding his own unless he has an ample supply of the blood the great opponent of the totteridge kennel 
up to some few years ago was unquestionably mr vickery of newton abbott who laid the foundation of his kennel with vesuvian who was by splinter out of kohinoor and from whom came the long line of winners vinio vesuvian vice regal valuator visto and veracity fierce war raged round these kennels each having its admiring and devoted adherents until one side would not look at anything but a redmond terrier to the exclusion of the vicary type the newton abbott strain was remarkable for beautiful heads and great quality but was faulty in feet and not absolute as to fronts each of which properties was a scene qua non among the totteridge dogs latter-day breeders have recognized that in the crossing of the two perfection lies and mr redmond himself has not hesitated to go some way on the same road it is fortunate for the breed of fox terriers how great a hold the hobby takes and how enthusiastically its votaries pursue it otherwise we should not have amongst us men like mr j c tin whose name is now a household word in the fox terrier world as it has been any time for the past thirty years close proximity in those days to mr gibson at brockenhurst made him all the keener and one of his first terriers was a bitch of that blood by bitters with daughters of old foiler he did very well to wit pungent sister of dorcas while through terror we get banquet the grandam of despoiler he purchased from mr redmond both deacon diamond and days each of whom was bred to spice and produced respectively auburn and brockenhurst dainty from the latter pair sprang lottery and worry the grandam of tom newcomb to whom we owe brockenhurst agnes brockenhurst dame and dinah morris and consequently adam bede and hester sorrel it has always been mr tin's principle to aim at producing the best terrier he could irrespective of the fads of this kennel or that and his judgment has been amply vindicated as the price lists of every large show will testify and to-day he is the proud possessor of champion the sylph who has beaten every one of her sex and is considered by many about the best fox terrier ever seen no name is better known or more highly respected by dog owners than that of the late mr j a doyle as a writer breeder judge or exhibitor of fox terriers whilst breeding largely from his own stock he was ever on the lookout for a likely outcross he laid great store on terrier character and was a stickler for good coats a point much neglected in the present-day dog amongst the smaller kennels is that of mr reeks now mostly identified with oxonian and that dog's produce but he will always be remembered as a breeder of that beautiful terrier avon minstrel mr arnold gillett has had a good share of fortune's favours as the ridgewood dogs testify whilst the messires powell castle glynn dale and crossweight have all written their names on the pages of fox terrier history ladies have ever been supporters of the breed and no one more prominently so than mrs bennett edwards who through duke of doncaster a son of durham has founded a kennel which at times is almost invincible and which still shelters such grand terriers as doncaster domine dodger dauphine and many others well known to fame mrs j h brown too as the owner of captain double a terrier which has won and deservedly more prizes than any fox terrier now or in the past must not be omitted whether the present fox terrier is as good both on the scores of utility and appearance as his predecessors is a question which has many times been asked and as many times decided in the negative as well as in the affirmative it would be idle to pretend that a great many of the dogs now seen on the show bench are fitted to do the work nature intended them for as irrespective of their make and shape they are so oversized as to preclude the possibility of going to ground in any average sized earth this question of size is one that must sooner or later be tackled in some practical way by the fox terrier club unless we are to see a race of giants in the next few generations their own standard gives twenty pounds a very liberal maximum but there are dogs several pounds heavier constantly winning prizes at shows and consequently being bred from with the result which we see there are many little dogs and good ones to be seen 
but as long as the judges favour the big ones these hold no chance and as it is far easier to produce a good big one than a good little one breeders are encouraged to use sires who would not be looked at if a hard and fast line were drawn over which no dogs should win a prize there are hundreds of fox terriers about quite as capable of doing their work as your ancestors ever were and there is hardly a large kennel which has not from time to time furnished our leading packs with one or more dogs and with gratifying results it is therefore a great pity that our leading exhibitors should often be the greatest delinquents in showing dogs which they know in their hearts should be kept at home or drafted altogether and it is deplorable that some of our oldest judges should by their words encourage them before concluding this chapter it may not be out of place to say a few words as to the breeding and rearing of fox terriers in the first place never breed from an animal whose pedigree is not authenticated beyond a shadow of a doubt and remember that while like may beget like the inevitable tendency is to throw back to former generations the man who elects to breed fox terriers must have the bumps of patience and hope very strongly developed as if the tyro imagines that he has only to mate his bitch to one of the known prize-winning dogs of the day in order to produce a champion he had better try some other breed let him fix in his mind the ideal dog and set to work by patient effort and in the face of many disappointments to produce it it is not sufficient that having acquired a bitch good in all points save in head that he breeds her to the best-headed dog he can find he must satisfy himself that the head is not a chance one but is an inherited one handed down from many generations good in this particular and consequently potent to reproduce its like so in all other points that he wishes to reproduce in the writer's experience little bitches with quality are the most successful those having masculine characteristics should be avoided and the best results will be obtained from the first three litters after which a bitch rarely breeds anything so good see that your bitch is free from worms before she goes to the dog then feed her well and beyond a dose of castor oil some days before she is due to whelp let nature take its course dose your puppies well for worms at eight weeks old give them practically as much as they will eat and unlimited exercise avoid the various advertised nostrums and rely rather on the friendly advice of some fancier or your veterinary surgeon take your hobby seriously and you will be amply repaid even if success does not always crown your efforts as while the breeding of most animals is a fascinating pursuit that of the fox terrier presents many varying delights End of chapter thirty two chapter thirty three the wire hair fox terrier the wire hair fox terrier is with the exception of its coat identical with the smooth fox terrier full brother in fact to him the two varieties are much interbred and several litters in consequence include representatives of both and not only this but it is quite a frequent occurrence to get a smooth puppy from wire hair parents although for some generations neither of the parents may have had any smooth cross in their pedigrees the north of england and south wales to a lesser extent have ever been the home of the wire hair and nearly all the best specimens have come originally from one or the other of those districts there is no doubt that there was excellent stock in both places and there is also no doubt that though at times this was used to the best advantage there was a good deal of carelessness in mating and a certain amount in recording the parentage of some of the terriers with regard to this latter point it is said that one gentleman who had quite a large kennel and several stud dogs but who kept no books used never to bother about remembering which particular dog he had put to a certain bitch but generally satisfied himself as to the sire of a puppy when it came in from walk by just examining it and saying oh that pup must be by old jock or jim as the case might be cause he's so like him and down he would go on the entry form accordingly however this may be there is no doubt that the sire would be a wire hair fox terrier and although the pedigree therefore may not have been quite right the terrier was invariably purebred 
in the early days the smooth was not crossed with the wire to anything like the extent that it was later and this fact is probably the cause of the salvation of the variety the wire hair has had more harm done to him by his being injudiciously crossed with the smooth than probably by anything else the greatest care must be exercised in the matter of coat before any such cross is effected the smooth that is crossed with the wire must have a really hard and not too full coat and as there are very very few smooths now being shown with anything like a proper coat for a terrier to possess the very greatest caution is necessary some few years back almost incalculable harm was done to the variety by a considerable amount of crossing into a strain of smooths with terribly soft flannelly coats good-looking terriers were produced and therein lay the danger but their coats were as bad as bad could be and though people were at first too prone to look over this very serious fault they now seemed to have recovered their senses and thus although much harm was done any serious damage has been averted if a person has a full-coated wire-hair bitch he is too apt to put her to a smooth simply because it is a smooth whom he thinks will neutralize the length of his bitch's jacket but this is absolute heresy and must not be done unless the smooth has the very hardest of hair on him if it is done the result is too horrible for words you get an elongated smooth full coat as soft as cotton wool and sometimes as silkily wavy as a lady's hair this is not a coat for any terrier to possess and it is not a wire hair terrier's coat which ought to be a hard crinkly peculiar looking broken coat on top with a dense undercoat underneath and must never be mistakable for an elongated smooth terrier's coat which can never at any time be a protection from wind water or dirt and is in reality the reverse the wire hair has had a great advertisement for better or worse in the extraordinarily prominent way he has been mentioned in connection with faking and trimming columns have been written on this subject speeches of inordinate length have been delivered motions and resolutions have been carried rules have been promulgated etc etc and the one dog mentioned throughout in connection with all of them has been our poor old much maligned wire hair he has been the scapegoat the subject of all this brilliancy and eloquence and were he capable of understanding the language of the human we may feel sure much amusement would be his there are several breeds that are more trimmed than the wire hair and that might well be quoted before him in this connection there is a vast difference between legitimate trimming and what is called faking all dogs with long or wire hair or rough coats naturally require more attention and more grooming than those with short smooth coats for the purposes of health and cleanliness it is absolutely necessary that such animals should be frequently well groomed there is no necessity given a wire hair with good and proper coat to use anything but an ordinary close-toothed comb a good hard brush and an occasional removal of long old hairs on the head ears neck legs and belly with the finger and thumb the kennel club regulations for the preparation of dogs for exhibition are perfectly clear on this subject and are worded most properly they say that a dog shall be disqualified if any part of his coat or hair has been cut clipped singed or rasped down by any substance or if any of the new or fast coat has been removed by pulling or plucking in any manner and that no comb shall be used which has a cutting or rasping edge there is no law therefore against the removal of old coat by finger and thumb and any one who keeps long-haired dogs knows that it is essential to the dog's health that there should be none it is in fact most necessary in certain cases at certain times to pull old coat out in this way several terriers with good coats are apt to grow long hair very thickly round the neck and ears and unless this is removed when it gets old the neck and ears are liable to become infested with objectionable little slate-coloured nits which will never be found as long as the coat is kept down when necessary bitches in whelp and after whelping although ordinarily good coated seem to go all wrong in their coats unless properly attended to in this way and here again if you wish to keep your bitch free from skin trouble it is a necessity in those cases which need it to use finger and thumb 
if the old hair is pulled out only when it is old there is no difficulty about it and no hurt whatever is occasioned to the dog who does not in reality object at all if however new or fast coat is pulled out it not only hurts the dog but it is also a very foolish thing to do and the person guilty of such a thing fully merits disqualification most of the nonsense that is heard about trimming emanates of course from the ignoramus the knife he says is used on them all a sharp razor is run over their coats they are singed they are cut they are rasped the latter is the favourite term anything like such a sweeping condemnation is quite inaccurate and most unfair it is impossible to cut a hair without being detected by a good judge and very few people ever do such a thing at any rate for some months before the terrier is exhibited for if they do they know they are bound to be discovered and as a fact are when the soft-coated dogs are clipped they are operated on say two or three months before they are wanted and the hair gets a chance to grow but even then it is easily discernible and any one who like the writer has any experience of clipping dogs in order to cure them of that awful disease follicular mange knows what a sight the animal is when he grows his coat and how terribly unnatural he looks the wire hair has never been in better state than he is to-day he is generally speaking far ahead of his predecessors of twenty-five years ago not only from a show point of view but also in working qualities one has only to compare the old portraits of specimens of the variety with dogs of the present day to see this a good many individual specimens of excellent merit it is true there were but they do not seem to have been immortalized in this way the portraits of those we do see are mostly representations of awful-looking brutes as bad in shoulders and light of bone as they could be they appear also to have had very soft coats somewhat akin to that we see on a pomeranian nowadays though it is true this latter fault may have been that of the artist or probably amplified by him perhaps the strongest kennel of wire hairs was that owned a good many years ago by messrs maxwell and castle several champions were in the kennel at the same time and they were a sorty lot of nice size and won prizes all over the country jack frost jacks again liffey barton wonder barton marvell and several other good ones were inmates of this kennel the two latter especially being high-class terriers which at one time were owned by sir h the trufford barton marvell was a very beautiful bitch and probably the best of those named above though barton wonder was frequently put above her sir h the trufford had for years a very good kennel of the variety and at that time was probably the biggest and best buyer mr carrick of carlisle was also a prominent owner years ago and showed some excellent terriers the best being carlisle tack trick and tyro the latter was an exceptionally good dog mr sam hill of sheffield had also a strong kennel always well shown by george porter who is now and has been for some years in america where he still follows his old love mr hill's name will ever be associated with that of his great dog maresbrook bristles who has undoubtedly done the breed a great amount of good mr mayhew was another old fancier who nearly always showed a good one mr mayhew has been in america now for many years one dog of his who it is believed became a champion viz brittle did at one time a big business at stud perhaps not to the advantage of the breed for he was possessed of a very bad fault in that he had what was called a topknot ring a bunch of soft silky hairs on his forehead an unfailing sign of a soft coat all over and a thing which breeders should studiously avoid this topknot was at one time more prevalent than it is now whether it is a coincidence or not one cannot say and it is a fact that in the writer's experience several terriers possessed of this fault have also blue markings which again are almost invariably accompanied by a soft coat and taking these two peculiarities together it would seem that at some time years ago a cross with that wonderfully game but exceedingly soft-coated terrier the bedlington may have been resorted to though if so it would appear that nowadays any effect of it is gradually dying out mr george raper is one of the old fanciers who has for many years owned some of the best specimens of the variety champion gobank perhaps being the most notable 
Gilbank was a beautiful terrier. There was no denying his quality. Mr. Raper sold him to Mr. G. M. Carnocan of New York for something like five hundred pounds, probably the biggest price that has ever been paid for any fox terrier. Mr. Hayward Field is another gentleman who has been exhibiting the breed for very many years and has owned several good terriers. The late Mr. Clear had also at one time a strong kennel, the best of which by a long way was champion Jack St. Legger. Mr. Wharton was a well-known exhibitor and judge some time back. It was he who owned that excellent little terrier, champion Bushy Broom, who created quite a furor when first exhibited at the Westminster Aquarium. Mr. Harding Cox was years ago a great supporter of the variety. He exhibited with varying success and was always much in request as a judge. One knew in entering under him that he wanted firstly a terrier, and further that the terrier had to be sound. Mr. Cox has, of course, played a big part in the popularization of the fox terrier, for, as all the world knows, he was the instigator of the fox terrier club, it being founded at a meeting held at his house his love has ever been for the small terrier and certainly the specimens shown by him whatever their individual faults were invariably a sporting game-looking lot mr sidney castle has for many years shown white hair fox terriers of more than average merit and thoroughly understands the variety indeed perhaps as well as anybody messrs bartle brumby mutter g welch and s wilson are all old fanciers who have great experience have bred and shown excellent specimens in mentioning the names of celebrated men and terriers of years gone by reference must be made to a terrier shown some time ago which was as good taken all round as any that have so far appeared this was champion quantock nettle afterwards purchased by gentlemen in wales and renamed lexton nettle of correct size with marvellous character an excellent jacket and very tackingly marked with badger tan and black on a wonderful head and ears this bitch swept the board as they say and unquestionably rightly so no article on the wire hair fox terrier would be complete without mentioning the name of the late mr s e shirley president of the kennel club mr shirley was a successful exhibitor in the early days of the variety and while his terriers were a good-looking lot though not up to the show form of to-day they were invariably hard-bitten game dogs kept chiefly for work on the question of size nearly all the principal judges of the fox terrier are agreed their maxim is a good little one can always beat a good big one the difficulty arises when the little ones are no good and the big ones are excellent it is a somewhat common occurrence and to anyone who loves a truly formed dog and who knows what a truly formed dog can do it is an extremely difficult thing to put the little above the larger all big dogs with properly placed shoulders and sound formation are better terriers for work of any sort than dogs half their size short on the leg but bad in these points it is in reality impossible to make an inexorable rule about this question of size each class must be judged on its own merits End of chapter thirty three chapter thirty four the airedale terrier there is perhaps no breed of dog that in so short a time has been improved so much as the airedale he is now a very beautiful animal whereas but a few years back although maybe there were a few fairly nice specimens by far the greater number were certainly the reverse of this in place of the shaggy soft-coated ugly colored brute with large hound ears and big full eyes we have now a very handsome creature possessing all the points that go to make a really first-class terrier of taking color symmetrical build full of character and go amply justifying in looks at any rate its existence as a terrier whether it is common sense to call a dog weighing forty to fifty pounds a terrier is a question that one often hears discussed the fact remains the dog is a terrier a sort of glorified edition of what we understand by the word it is true but in points looks and character a terrier nevertheless and it is impossible otherwise to classify him people will ask how can he be a terrier why he is an outrage on the very word which can only mean a dog to go to ground and to what animal in the country of his birth can an airedale go to ground above ground and in water however an airedale can and does perform in a very excellent manner everything that any other terrier can do 
as a water dog he is, of course, in his element. For work on land requiring a hard, strong, fast, and resolute terrier, he is, needless to say, of great value. And he is said to be also, when trained, as can easily be imagined when one considers his power of scent, his strength, sagacity, and speed, a most excellent gun dog. He is, in fact, a general utility dog. For add to the above-mentioned qualities those of probably an incomparable guard and a most excellent companion, faithful and true. And ask yourself, what do you want more? And what breed of dog, taken all around, can beat him? The Airedale is not of ancient origin. He was probably first heard of about the year 1850. He is undoubtedly the product of the Otterhound and the old black and tan wire-haired terrier, referred to in the chapters on the wire-hair fox and the Welsh terriers. When one considers the magnificent nobleness, the great sagacity, courage, and stateliness of the Otterhound, the great gameness, cheek, and pertinacity of the old black and tan wire-hair, such a cross must surely produce an animal of excellent type and character. Yorkshire, more especially that part of it round and about the town of Otley, is responsible for the birth of the Airedale. The inhabitants of the country of broad acres are, and always have been, exceedingly fond of any kind of sport, as indeed may also be said of their brothers of the Red Rose. But if in connection with that sport a dog has to be introduced, then indeed they are doubly blessed, for they have no compeers at the game. Otter hunting was formerly much indulged in by the people living in the dales of the air and the war, and not only were packs of otter hounds kept, but many sportsmen maintained on their own account a few hounds for their personal delectation. These hounds were no doubt in some instances a nondescript lot, as indeed are several of the packs hunting the otter today, but there was unquestionably a good deal of otter hound blood in them, and some purebred hounds were also to be found. Yorkshire also has always been the great home of the terrier. Fox terriers, as we now know them, had at this time hardly been seen. The terrier in existence then was the black and tan wire hare, a hardy game terrier, a great workman on land or in water. Whether by design or accident is not known, but the fact remains that in or about the year mentioned, a cross took place between these same hounds and terriers. It was found that a handier dog was produced for the business for which he was required, and it did not take many years to populate the district with these terrier hounds, which soon came to be recognized as a distinct breed. The Waterside Terrier was the name first vouchsafed to the new variety. After this they went by the name of Bingley Terriers, and eventually they came to be known under their present appellation. The specimens of the Airedale which were first produced were not of very handsome appearance, being what would now be called bad in color, very shaggy coated, and naturally big and ugly in ear. It of course took some time to breed the hound out at all satisfactorily. Some authorities tell us that for this purpose the common fighting pit bull terrier and also the Irish terrier were used, the latter to a considerable extent. And whether this is correct or not, there is no doubt that there would also be many crosses back again into the small black and tan terrier, primarily responsible for his existence. In about twenty years' time, the breed seems to have settled down and become thoroughly recognized as a variety of the terrier. It was not, however, for some ten years after this that classes were given for the breed at any representative show. In 1883, the committee of the National Show at Birmingham included three classes for Airedales in their schedule, which were fairly well supported, and three years after this, recognition was given to the breed in the stud book of the ruling authority. From this time on, the breed prospered pretty well. Several very good terriers were bred. The hound gradually almost disappeared, as also did, to a great extent, the bad colored ones. The best example amongst the early shown dogs was undoubtedly Newbold Test, who had a long and very successful career. This dog excelled in terrier character, and he was sound all over. His advent was opportune. He was just the dog that was wanted, and there is no doubt he did the breed a great amount of good. A dog called Cone Crack, who was a beautiful little terrier, was another of the early shown ones by whom the breed has lost nothing. And two other terriers, whose names are much revered by lovers of the breed, are Colmondelli Briar and Briar Test. Some years ago, when the breed was in the stage referred to above, a club was formed to look after its interests. And there is no doubt that though perhaps phenomenal success did not attend its efforts, it did its best and forms a valuable link in the chain of popularity of the Airedale. It was at best apparently a sleepy sort of concern, 
and never seems to have attracted new fanciers. Some dozen or so years ago, however, a club, destined not only to make a great name for itself, but also to do a thousandfold more good to the breed it espouses than ever the old club did, was formed under the name of the South of England Airedale Terrier Club, and a marvelously successful and popular life it has so far lived. The younger club was in no way an antagonist to the older one, and it has ever been careful that it should not be looked upon in any way as such. The old club has, however, been quite overshadowed by the younger, which, whether it wishes it or not, is now looked upon as the leading society in connection with the breed. At a meeting of the first club, which went by the name of the Airedale Terrier Club, held in Manchester some eighteen or twenty years ago, the following standard of perfection and scale of points was drawn up and adopted. Head. Long, with flat skull, but not too broad between the ears. Narrowing slightly to the eyes, free from wrinkle. Stop hardly visible, and cheeks free from fullness. Jaw deep and powerful, well filled up before the eyes. Lips light. Ears V-shaped with a side carriage, small but not out of proportion to the size of the dog. The nose black, the eyes small and dark in color, not prominent, and full of terrier expression. The teeth strong and level. The neck should be of moderate length and thickness, gradually widening towards the shoulders, and free from throatiness. Shoulders and chest. Shoulders long and sloping well into the back. Shoulder blades flat, chest deep, but not broad. Body. Back short, strong, and straight. Ribs well sprung. Hindquarters. Strong and muscular, with no drop. Hocks well let down. The tail set on high and carried gaily, but not curled over the back. Legs and feet. Legs perfectly straight, with plenty of bone. Feet small and round, with good depth of pad. Coat. Hard and wiry, and not so long as to appear ragged. It should also be straight and close, covering the dog well over the body and legs. Color. The head and ears, with the exception of dark markings on each side of the skull, should be tan, the ears being a darker shade than the rest, the legs up to the thigh and elbows being also tan, the body black or dark drizzle. Weight. Dogs 40 to 45 pounds. Bitches slightly less. At the time of the formation of the Southern Club, the state of the Airedale was critical. Possessed of perhaps unequaled natural advantages, lovely dog as he is, he had not made that progress that he should have done. He had not been boomed in any way, and had been crawling when he should have galloped. From the moment the new club was formed, however, the Airedale had a new lease of life. Mr. Holland Buckley and other keen enthusiasts seem to have recognized to a nicety exactly what was required to give a necessary fillip to the breed. They appeared also to have founded their club at the right moment and to have offered such an attractive bill of fare that not only did everyone in the South who had anything to do with Airedales join at once, but very shortly a host of new fanciers was enrolled, and crowds of people began to take the breed up who had had nothing to do with it, or indeed any other sort of dog previously. Some few years after the foundation of this club, a junior branch of it was started, and this, ably looked after by Mr. R. Lauder McLaren, is almost as big a success in its way as is the parent institution. Other clubs have been started in the North and elsewhere, and altogether the Airedale is very well catered for in this respect, and, if things go on as they are now going, is bound to prosper and become even more extensively owned than he is at present. To Mr. Holland Buckley, Mr. G. H. Elder, Mr. Royston Mills, and Mr. Marshall Lee, the Airedale of the present day owes much. The Airedales that have struck the writer as the best he has come across are Master Briar, Clomel Monarch, Clomel Marvel, Dumbarton Lass, Tone Masterpiece, Mistress Royal, Master Royal, Tone Chief, Huckleberry Lass, Felden Fashion, York Scepter, and Clonmel Floriform. Nearly every one of these is now, either in flesh or spirit, in the United States or Canada. In all probability, the person who knows more about this terrier than anyone living is Mr. Holland Buckley. He has written a most entertaining book on the Airedale. He has founded the principal club in connection with the breed. He has produced several very excellent specimens, and it goes without saying that he is, when he can be induced to take the ring, a first-rate judge. 
Mr. Buckley has frequently told the writer that, in his opinion, one of the best terriers he has seen was the aforesaid Clonmel Floriform. But, as this dog was sold for a big price very early in his career, the writer never saw him. Most of the articles that have been written on the Airedale have come from the pen of Mr. Buckley, and therefore but modest reference is made to the man who has worked so wholeheartedly, so well, and so successfully in the interests of the breed he loves. It would be ungenerous and unfair in any article on the Airedale, written by anyone but Mr. Buckley, if conspicuous reference were not made to the great power this gentleman has been, and to the great good that he has done. The Airedale is such a beautiful specimen of the canine race, and is, in reality, in such healthy state, that every one of his admirers, and they are legion, is naturally jealous for his welfare, and is wishful that all shall go well with him. It is gratifying to state that he has never been the tool of faction, though at one time he was doubtless near the brink, but this was some time ago, and it would be a grievous pity if he ever again became in jeopardy of feeling the baneful influence of any such curse. There is one serious matter in connection with him, however, and that is the laxity displayed by some judges of the breed in giving prizes to dogs shown in a condition with regard to their coats which ought to disentitle them to take a prize in any company. Shockingly badly trimmed shoulders are becoming quite a common thing to see in Airedales. There is no necessity for this sort of thing. It is very foolish, and it is impossible to imagine anything more likely to do harm to a breed than that the idea should get abroad that this is the general practice in connection with it. End of chapter 34 Chapter 35 The Bedlington Terrier This gamest of all the terriers has been known as a distinct and thoroughly British breed for over a century, which is, I think, a fairly ancient lineage. There are various theories as to its original parentage, but the one which holds that he was the result of a cross between the Otterhound and the Dandy Dinment suggests itself to me as the most probable one. His characteristics strongly resemble in many points both these breeds, and there can be but little doubt of his near relationship at some time or other to the Dandy. The earliest authentic record we have of the Bedlington was a dog named Old Flint, who belonged to Squire Trevelyan and was whelped in 1782. The pedigree of Mr. William Clark Scamp, a dog well known about 1792, is traced back to Old Flint, and the descendants of Scamp were traced in direct line from 1792 to 1873. A mason named Joseph Ainsley has the credit for giving the name of Bedlington to this terrier in 1825. It was previously known as the Rothbury Terrier or the Northern Counties Fox Terrier. Mr. Thomas J. Pickett of Newcastle on Tyne was perhaps the earliest supporter of the breed on a large scale, and his Tynesdale and Tyneside in especial have left their names in the history of the Bedlington. The present-day Bedlington, like a good many other terriers, has become taller and heavier than the old-day specimens. This, no doubt, is due to breeding for show points. He is a lady dog, but not Shelley, inclined to be flat-sided, somewhat light in bone for his size, very lively in character, and has plenty of courage. If anything, indeed, his pluck is too insistent. The standard of points as adopted by the National Bedlington Terrier and the Yorkshire Bedlington Terrier Clubs is as follows. Skull. Narrow but deep and rounded, high at the occiput and covered with a nice silky tuft or top knot. Muzzle. Long, tapering, sharp and muscular, as little stop as possible between the eyes, so as to form nearly a line from the nose end along the joint of skull to the occiput. The lips close fitting and without flu. Eyes should be small and well sunk in the head. The blues should have a dark eye, the blues and tans ditto with amber shades. Livers and sandies, a light brown eye, Nose, large, 
well angled, blues and blues and tans should have black noses, livers and sandies flesh-coloured, teeth level or pincher-jawed, ears moderately large, well-formed, flat to the cheek, thinly covered and tipped with fine silky hair. They should be filbert-shaped. Legs of moderate length, not wide apart, straight and square set, and with good-sized feet, which are rather long. Tail, thick at the root, tapering to a point, slightly feathered on lower side, nine inches to eleven inches long, and scimitar-shaped. Neck and shoulders, neck long, deep at base, rising well from the shoulders, which should be flat. Body, long and well-proportioned, flat-ribbed and deep, not wide in chest, slightly arched back, well ribbed up with light quarters. Coat, hard, with close bottom and not lying flat to sides. Colour, dark blue, blue and tan, liver, liver and tan, sandy or sandy and tan. Height, about 15 inches to 16 inches. Weight, dogs about 24 pounds, bitches about 22 pounds. General appearance, he is a light-made, lazy dog, but not shelly. There is a tendency nowadays towards excess of size in the Bedlington. It is inclined to be too long in the body and too leggy, which, if not checked, will spoil the type of the breed. It is therefore very important that size should be more studied by judges than is at present the case. The faults referred to are doubtless the result of breeding for exceptionally long heads which seem to be the craze just now and of course one cannot get extra long heads without proportionately long bodies and large size. If it were possible to do so then the dog would become a mere caricature. As a sporting terrier the Bedlington holds a position in the first rank he is very fast and enduring, and exceedingly pertinacious, and is equally at home on land and in water. He will work an otter, draw a badger, or bolt a fox, and he has no superior at killing rats and all kinds of vermin. He has an exceptionally fine nose, and makes a very useful dog for rough shooting, being easily taught to retrieve. If he has any fault at all, it is that he is of too jealous a disposition which renders it almost impossible to work him with other dogs, as he wants all the fun to himself, and if he cannot get it, he will fight for it. But by himself he is perfect. As a companion, he is peculiarly affectionate and faithful, and remarkably intelligent. He makes a capital house dog, is a good guard, and is very safe with children. Bellingtons are not dainty feeders, as most riders have asserted, nor are they tender dogs. If they are kept in good condition and get plenty of exercise, they feed as well as any others, and are as hard as nails, if not pampered. They are easy to breed and rear, and the bitches make excellent mothers. If trained when young, they are very obedient and their tendency to fight can in great measure be cured when they are puppies. But if not checked, then it cannot be done afterwards. Once they take to fighting, nothing will keep them from it, and instead of being pleasurable companions, they become positive nuisances. On the other hand, if properly broken, they give very little trouble, and will not quarrel unless set upon. End of chapter 35 Chapter 36 The Irish Terrier The daredevil Irish Terrier has most certainly made his home in our bosom. There is no breed of dog more genuinely loved by those who have sufficient experience and knowledge to make the comparison. Other dogs have a larger share of innate wisdom. Others are more aesthetically beautiful. Others more peaceable. But our Rufus friend has a way of winning into his owner's heart and making there an abiding place 
which is all the more secure because it is gained by sincere and undemonstrative devotion perhaps one likes him equally for his faults and for his merits his very failings are due to his soldierly faithfulness and loyalty to his too ardent vigilance in guarding the threshold to his officious belligerence towards other canines who offend his sense of proprietorship in his master his particular stature may have some influence in his success as a chum he is just tall enough to rest his chin upon one's knee and look up with all his soul into one's eyes whatever be the secret of his attraction tis certain that he has the hibernian art of compelling affection and forgiveness and that he makes one value him not for the beauty of his ruddy raiment the straightness of his forelegs the set of his eye and ear the levelness of his back or his ability to win prizes but rather for his true and trusty heart that exacts no return and seeks no recompense he may be but an indifferent specimen of his kind taken in as a stranger at the gates but when at length the inevitable time arrives as it does all too soon in canine nature one then discovers how surely one has been harboring an angel unawares statistics would probably show that in numbers the fox terrier justifies the reputation of being a more popular breed and the scottish terrier is no doubt a formidable competitor for public esteem it is safe however to say that the irish terrier shares with these the distinction of being one of the three most popular terriers in the british isles this fact taken into consideration it is interesting to reflect that thirty years ago the daredevil was virtually unknown in england idstone in his book on dogs published in eighteen seventy two did not give a word of vengeance to the breed and dog shows had been instituted sixteen years before a class was opened for the irish terrier the dog existed of course in its native land it may indeed be almost truthfully said to have existed as long as that country has been an island about the year eighteen seventy five experts were in dispute over the irish terrier and many averred that his rough coat and length of hair on forehead and muzzle were indubitable proof of scotch blood his very expression they said was scotch but the argument was quelled by more knowing disputants on the other side who claimed that ireland had never been without her terrier and that she owed no manner of indebtedness to scotland for a dog whose every hair was essentially irish in the same year at a show held at belfast a good number of the breed were brought together notable among them mr d o'connell's slasher a very good-looking wire-coated working terrier who was said to have excelled as a field and water dog slasher was lint white in color and reputed to be descended from a pure white strain two other terriers of the time were mr morton's fly the first irish terrier to gain a championship and mr george jameson's sport the prominent irish terrier of the seventies varied considerably in type stinger who won the first prize at lisburn in eighteen seventy five was long-backed and short-legged with a dark blue grizzle colored back tan legs and white turned out feet the dam of mr burke's killiney boy was a rough black and tan a combination of colors which was believed to accompany the best class of coats brindles were not uncommon some were tall on the leg some short some were lanky and others cobby many were very small there were classes given at a dublin show in eighteen seventy four for irish terriers under nine pounds of weight jameson's sport is an important dog historically for various reasons he was undoubtedly more akin to our present type than any other irish terrier of his time of which there is record his dark ears were uncropped at a period when cropping was general his weight approximated to our modern average he was an all-coloured red and his legs were of a length that would not be seriously objected to but in his day he was not accepted as typical and was not particularly successful in the show ring the distinguished terrier of his era was burke's killiney boy to whom and to mr w graham's bitch aaron with whom he was mated nearly all the pedigree of the best irish terriers of to-day date back erin was said to be superior in all effects to any of her breed previous to eighteen eighty in her first litter by killiney boy were playboy pretty lass poppy gerald pagan the second and peggy every one of whom became famous more than one of these showed the black markings of their grandam and their progeny for several generations were apt to throw back to the black and tan gray or brindle coloring playboy and poppy were the best of erin's first litter 
the dog's beautiful ears which were left as nature made them were transmitted to his son bogey rattler who was sire of bachelor and benedict the latter the most successful stud dog of his time poppy had a rich red coat and this colour recurred with fair regularity in her descendants red which had not at first been greatly appreciated came gradually to be the accepted colour of the irish terrier's jacket occasionally it tended towards flaxen occasionally to a deep rich auburn but the black and brindle were so rigidly bred out that by the year eighteen ninety or thereabout they were very seldom recurred nowadays it is not often that any other colour than red is seen in a litter of irish terriers although a white patch on the breast is frequent as it is in all self-coloured breeds in addition to the early celebrities already named extreme carelessness michael brickback poppy the second moya dulan straight tip and gaelic have taken their places in the records of the breed while yet more recent irish terriers who have achieved fame have been miss butcher's bond boy and bond beauty mr wallace's treasurer mr s wilson's bolton woods mixer dr smith's sarah kidd and mr c j barnett's bread and muddler naturally in the case of a breed which has departed from its original type discussions were frequent before a standard of perfection for the irish terrier was fixed his size and weight the length or shortness of his limbs the carriage of his tail the form of his skull and muzzle the colour and texture of his coat were the subjects of controversy it was considered at one juncture that he was being bred too big and at another that he was being brought too much to resemble a red wire hair fox terrier when once the black marking on his body had been eliminated no one seems to have desired that it should be restored red was acknowledged to be the one and only colour for an irish terrier but some held that the correct red should be deep auburn and others that wheaten colour was the tone to be aimed at a medium shade between the two extremes is now generally preferred as to size it should be about midway between that of the airedale and the fox terrier represented by a weight of twenty two to twenty seven pounds the two breeds just mentioned are as a rule superior to the irish terrier in front legs and feet but in the direction of these points great improvements have recently been observable the heads of our irish terriers have also been brought nearer to a level of perfection chiselled to the desired degree of leanness with the determined expression so characteristic of the breed and with the length squareness and strength of muzzle which formerly were so difficult to find this squareness of head and jaw is an important part to be considered when choosing an irish terrier opinions differ in regard to slight details of this terrier's conformation but the official description issued by the irish terrier club supplies a guide upon which the uncertain novice may implicitly depend head long skull flat and rather narrow between the ears getting slightly narrower toward the eye free from wrinkles stop hardly visible except in profile the jaw must be strong and muscular but not too full in the cheek and of a good punishing length there should be a slight falling away below the eye so as not to have a greyhound appearance hair on face of same description as on body but short about a quarter of an inch long in appearance almost smooth and straight a slight beard is the only longish hair and it is only long in comparison with the rest that is permissible and this is not characteristic teeth should be strong and level lips not so tight as a bull terrier's but well fitting showing through the hair their black lining nose must be black eyes a dark hazel colour small not prominent and full of life fire and intelligence ears small b-shaped of moderate thickness set well on the head and dropping forward closely to the cheek the ear must be free of fringe and the hair thereon shorter and darker in colour than the body neck should be a fair length and gradually widened toward the shoulders well carried and free of throatiness there is generally a slight sort of frill visible at each side of the neck running nearly to the corner of the ear shoulders and chest 
shoulders must be fine long and sloping well into the back the chest deep and muscular but neither full nor wide back and loin body moderately long back should be strong and straight with no appearance of slackness behind the shoulders the loin broad and powerful and slightly arched ribs fairly sprung rather deep than round and well ribbed back hind quarters should be strong and muscular thighs powerful hocks near ground stifles moderately bent stern generally docked should be free of fringe or feather but well covered with rough hair set on pretty high carried gaily but not over the back or curled feet and legs feet should be strong tolerably round and moderately small toes arched and neither turned out nor in black toenails most desirable legs moderately long well set from the shoulders perfectly straight with plenty of bone and muscle the elbows working freely clear of the sides pastern short and straight hardly noticeable both fore and hind legs should be moved straight forward when traveling the stifles not turned outwards the legs free of feather and covered like the head with as hard a texture of coat as body but not so long coat hard and wiry free of softness or silkiness not so long as to hide the outlines of the body particularly in the hind quarters straight and flat no shagginess and free of lock or curl color should be whole colored the most preferable being bright red red wheaten or yellow red white sometimes appears on chest and feet it is more objectionable on the latter than on the chest as a speck of white on chest is frequently to be seen in all self-colored breeds size and symmetry the most desirable weight in show condition is for a dog twenty four pounds and for a bitch twenty two pounds the dog must be present and active lively lithe and wiry appearance lots of substance at the same time free of clumsiness as speed and endurance as well as power are very essential they must be neither cloddy nor cobby but should be framed on the lines of speed showing a graceful racing outline temperament dogs that are very game are usually surly or snappish the irish terrier as a breed is an exception being remarkably good-tempered notably so with mankind it being admitted however that he is perhaps a little too ready to resent interference on the part of other dogs there is a heedless reckless pluck about the irish terrier which is characteristic and coupled with the headlong dash blind to all consequences with which he rushes at his adversary has earned for the breed the proud epithet of the daredevils when off duty they are characterized by a quiet careless invitating appearance and when one sees them endearingly timidly pushing their heads into their master's hands it is difficult to realize that on occasions at the set on they can prove they have the courage of a lion and will fight until the last breath in their bodies they develop an extraordinary devotion to and have been known to track their masters almost incredible distances it is difficult to refer to particular irish terriers of to-day without making invidious distinctions there are so many excellent examples of the breed that a list even of those who have gained championship honors would be formidable but one would hardly hesitate to heed the list with the same of paymaster a dog of rare and almost superlative quality and true irish terrier character paymaster is the property of miss lillian paul of weston supermare who bred him from her beautiful bitch erasmic from brenda mudler the sire of many of the best side by side with paymaster mr f clinton's mile and barrister might be placed it would need a council of perfection indeed to decide which is the better dog of the two very high in the list also would come mr henry ridley's redeemer and mr breakell's killer and knee sport and among bitches one would name certainly mr gregg's belfast aaron mr clifton's chairwoman mr everhill's ermine and mr j s mccombs beast and betty these are but half a dozen but they represent the highest level of excellence that has yet been achieved by scientific breeding in irish terrier 
breeding up to the standard of excellence necessary in competition in dog shows has doubtless been the agent which has brought the irish terrier to its present condition of perfection and it is the means by which the general dog-owning public is most surely educated to a practical knowledge of what is a desirable and what a not desirable dog to possess but after all success in the show ring is not the one and only thing to be aimed at and the irish terrier is not to be regarded merely as the possible winner of prizes he is above all things a dog for man's companionship and in this capacity he takes a favored place he has the great advantage of being equally suitable for town and country life in the home he requires no pampering he has a good hardy constitution and when once he has got over the ills incidental to puppyhood worms and distemper he needs only to be judiciously fed kept reasonably clean and to have his fill of active exercise if he is taught to be obedient and of gentlemanly habit there is no better house dog he is naturally intelligent and easily trained although he is always ready to make his own part he is not quarrelsome but remarkably good-tempered and a safe associate of children perhaps with his boisterous spirits he is prone sometimes to be overzealous in the pursuit of trespassing tabbies and in assailing the angles of intruding butcher boys and officious postmen these characteristics come from his sense of duty which is strongly developed and careful training will make him discriminative in his assaults very justly is he classed among the sporting dogs he is a born sportsman and of his pluck it were superfluous to speak fear is unknown to him in this characteristic as in all others he is truly a son of aaron end of chapter thirty six chapter thirty seven the welsh terrier this breed is near akin to the wire hair fox terrier the principal differences being merely of color and type the welsh terrier is a wire haired black or grizzle and tan the most taking coloring is a jet black body and back with deep tan head ears legs belly and tail several specimens have however black foreheads skulls ears and tail and the black will frequently be seen also extending for a short way down the legs there must be no black however below the hock and there must be no substantial amount of white anywhere a dog possessing either of these faults is according to the recognized standard of the breed disqualified many of the most successful bench winners have nevertheless been possessed of a little white on the chest and even a few hairs of that color on their hind toes and apparently by the common consent of all the judges of the breed they have been in no wise handicapped for these blemishes there are not so many grizzled colored welsh terriers now as there used to be a grizzle and tan never looks so smart as a black and tan but though this is so if the grizzle is of a dark hard color its owner should not be handicapped as against a black and tan if on the contrary it is a washed-out bluish-looking grizzle a judge is entitled to handicap its possessor apart altogether from the fact that any such color on the back is invariably accompanied by an objectionable light tan on the legs the whole being a certain sign of a soft silky unterrier like coat the coat of the welsh terrier slightly differs from that of the wire hair fox terrier in that it is as a rule not so abundant and is in reality a different class of coat it is not so broken as is that of the fox terrier and is generally a smoother shorter coat with the hairs very close together when accompanied with this there is a dense undercoat one has for a terrier used to work a good deal in water an ideal covering as waterproof almost as the feathers on a duck's back the other difference between the fox and welsh terrier viz type is very hard to define 
to any one who really understands welsh terriers the selection of those of proper type from those of wrong type presents little if any difficulty as a show bench exhibit the welsh terrier is not more than twenty-two years old he has however resided in wales for centuries there is no doubt that he is in reality identical with the old black and tan wire-haired dog which was england's first terrier and which has taken such a prominent part in the production and evolution of all the other varieties of the sporting terrier there are several people living in or about carnarvonshire who can show that welsh terriers have been kept by their ancestors from at any rate a hundred to two hundred years ago notable among these is the present master of the innis for otterhounds whose great-grandfather john jones of innis for owned welsh terriers in or about the year seventeen sixty this pack of otterhounds has always been kept by the jones of innis for who have always worked and still work welsh terriers with them from this strain some good terriers have sprung and this although neither the present master nor any of his ancestors have concerned themselves greatly about the looks of their terriers or kept anything but a head record of their pedigrees they are all however pure-bred and are set much store on by their owner and his family just as they always have been by their predecessors until about the year eighteen eighty four no one seems to have considered the question of putting specimens of the breed on the show bench about that year however several gentlemen interested in the variety met together to see what could be done in connection with the matter the outcome being that the welsh terrier club was shortly afterwards founded the kennel club recognized the breed and the terrier himself began his career as a show dog the specimens which were first shown were as may be imagined not a very high class looking lot although the breed had been kept pure no care had been taken in the culture of it except that which was necessary to produce a sporting game terrier able to do its work one can readily understand therefore that such an entirely fancy point as a long foreface and narrow clean skull had never been thought of for a moment and it was in these particulars that the welsh terrier at first failed from a show point of view naturally enough good shoulders sound hindquarters more than fair legs and feet and excellent jackets were to be found in abundance but as the body was almost invariably surmounted by a very short and wedge-shaped head and jaw often accompanied with a pair of heavy round ears an undershot mouth and a light full eye it will be realized that the general appearance of the dog was not prepossessing the welsh terrier to-day is very much improved beyond what he was when first put on the bench this improvement has been brought about by careful and judicious breeding from nothing but pure-bred specimens no outside aid has been invoked at any rate in the production of any of the best terriers and none has been required it is a matter of great congratulation that the breed has been kept pure despite all temptation and exhortation the welsh terrier breeds as true as steel you know what you are going to get had popular clamour had its way years ago goodness only knows what monstrosities would now be being bred the colour of the welsh terrier is of course against him for working with a pack of hounds especially in water 
it is only fair however to the breed to say that barring this color drawback there is no better terrier to hounds living they are not quarrelsome show very little jealousy one of another in working can therefore easily be used exercised and kenneled together being much better in this respect than any of the other breeds of terriers they also as a general rule are dead game they want a bit of rousing and are not so flashily showily game as say the fox terrier but just as with humans when it comes to real business when the talking game is played out and there is nothing left but the doing part of the business then one's experience invariably is that the quiet man the quiet terrier is the animal wanted on the formation of the welsh terrier club a standard of perfection was drawn up and circulated with the club rules this standard has remained unchanged up to the present day and is as follows head the skull should be flat and rather wider between the ears than the wire hair fox terrier the jaw should be powerful clean cut rather deeper and more punishing giving the head a more masculine appearance than that usually seen in a fox terrier the stop not too defined fair length from stop to end of nose the latter being of a black color ears the ears should be v-shaped small not too thin set on fairly high carried forward and close to the cheek eyes the eyes should be small not being too deeply set in or protruding out of skull of a dark hazel color expressive and indicating abundant pluck neck the neck should be of moderate length and thickness slightly arched and sloping gracefully into the shoulders body the back should be short and well ribbed up the loin strong good depth and moderate width of chest the shoulders should be long sloping and well set back the hindquarters should be strong thighs muscular and of good length with the hocks moderately straight well set down and fair amount of bone the stern should be set on moderately high but not too gaily carried legs and feet the legs should be straight and muscular possessing fair amount of bone with upright and powerful pasterns the feet should be small round and cat-like coat the coat should be wiry hard very close and abundant color the color should be black and tan or black grizzle and tan free from black penciling on toes size the height at shoulders should be fifteen inches for dogs bitches proportionately less twenty pounds shall be considered a fair average weight in working condition but this may vary a pound or so either way disqualifying points nose white cherry or spotted to a considerable extent with either of these colors ears prick tulip or rose undershot jaw or pig-jawed mouth black below hocks or white anywhere to any appreciable extent black penciling on toes end of chapter thirty seven chapter thirty eight the scottish terrier the scottish terrier as a show dog dates from about eighteen seventy seven to eighteen seventy nine he seems almost at once to have attained popularity 
and he has progressed gradually since then, ever in an upward direction, until he is today one of the most popular and extensively owned varieties of the dog. Sir Peyton Pigott had, at the date mentioned, a very fine kennel of the breed, for in the Livestock Journal of May 30th, 1879, we find his kennel fully reviewed in a most enthusiastic manner by a correspondent who visited it in consequence of a controversy that was going on at the time as to whether or not there was such a dog at all, and who, therefore, wished to see and judge for himself as to this point. At the end of his report on the kennel, the writer adds these words. It was certainly one of the happiest days of my life to have the pleasure of looking over so many grand little dogs, but to find them in England quite staggered me. Four dogs and eight bitches are not a bad beginning, and with care and judicious selection in mating, I have little doubt, but Mr. Pigott's kennel will be as renowned for terriers as the late Mr. Laverick's was for setters. I know but few that take such a delight in the brave little diehards as Mr. Pigott, and he may well feel proud of the lot he has got together at great trouble and expense. The fact that there was such a kennel already in existence proved, of course, a strong point in favor of the bona fides of the breed. The best dog in it was Granite, whose portrait and description were given in the journal in connection with the said review, and the other animals in the kennel being of the same type, it was at once recognized that there was, in fact, such a breed, and the mouths of the doubters were stopped. Granite was unquestionably a typical Scottish Terrier, even as we know them at the present day. He was certainly longer in the back than we care for nowadays, and his head also was shorter, and his jaw more snippy than is now seen but his portrait clearly shows he was a genuine Scottish Terrier, and there is no doubt that he, with his kennelmates, Tartan, Crofter, Syringa, Cavick, and Posey, conferred benefit upon the breed. To dive deeper into the antiquity of the Scottish Terrier is a thing which means that he who tries it must be prepared to meet all sorts of abuse, ridicule, and criticism. One man will tell you there never was any such thing as a present-day Scottish Terrier, that the mere fact of his having prick ears shows he is a mongrel another that he is merely an offshoot of the sky or the dandy, another that the only Scottish Terrier that is a Scottish Terrier is a white one, another that he is merely a manufactured article from Aberdeen, and so on ad infinitum. It is a most extraordinary fact that Scotland should have unto herself so many different varieties of the Terrier. There is strong presumption that they one and all came originally from one variety, and it is quite possible, nay probable, that different crosses into other varieties have produced the assortment of today. The writer is strongly of the opinion that there still exist in Scotland at the present time specimens of the breed which propagated the lot, which was what is called even now the Highland Terrier, a little long-backed, short-legged, snippy-faced, prick or drop-eared, mostly sandy and black-colored terrier, game as a pebble, lively as a cricket, and all in all a most charming little companion. And further, that to produce our present-day Scottish Terrier, or shall we say to improve the points of his progenitor, the assistance of our old friend the black-and-tan wire-haired Terrier of England was sought by a few astute people living probably not very far from Aberdeen. Scottish Terriers frequently go by the name of Aberdeen Terriers, an appellation, it is true, usually heard only from the lips of people who do not know much about them. Mr. W. L. McCandlish, one of the greatest living authorities on the breed, in an able treatise published some time back, tells us, in reference to this matter, that the terrier under notice went at different periods under the names of Highland, Cairn, Aberdeen, and Scotch, that he is now known by the proud title of Scottish Terrier, and that the only surviving trace of the differing nomenclature is the title Aberdeen, which many people still regard as a different breed, a want of knowledge frequently turned to account by the unscrupulous dealer who is able to sell under the name of Aberdeen a dog too bad to dispose of as a Scottish Terrier, but there can be no doubt that originally there must have been some reason for the name. In a letter to the writer, Sir Peyton Pigott says, some people call them and advertise them as the Aberdeen Terrier, which is altogether a mistake. But the reason of it is that forty years ago, a Dr. Van Bust, who lived in Aberdeen, bred these Terriers to a large extent and sold them, and those buying them called them, in consequence, Aberdeen Terriers whereas they were in reality merely a picked sort of old Scotch or Highland Terrier. Sir Peyton himself, as appears from the columns of the Livestock Journal, March 2, 1877, bought some of the strain of Van Bust, and therein gives a full description of the same. 
Sir Payton Pickett's kennel of the breed assumed quite large proportions and was most successful, several times winning all the prizes offered in the variety at different shows. He may well be called the father of the breed in England, for when he gave up exhibiting, a great deal of his best blood got into the kennels of Mr. H. J. Ludlow, who, as everyone knows, has done such a tremendous amount of good in popularizing the breed and has also himself produced such a galaxy of specimens of the very best class. Mr. Ludlow's first terrier was a bitch called Splinter II. The name of Kildee is, in the breed, almost world famous. And it is interesting to note that in every line does he go back to the said Splinter II. Rambler, called by the great authorities the first pillar of the stud book, was a son of a dog called Bonacord. And it is to this latter dog and Roger Ruff, and also the aforesaid Tartan and Splinter II, that nearly all of the best present day pedigrees go back. This being so, it is unnecessary to give many more names of dogs who have in their generations of some years back assisted in bringing the breed to its present state of perfection. An exception, however, must be made in the case of two sons of Rambler, by name Dundee and Alistair, names very familiar in the Scottish Terrier pedigrees of the present day. Alistair especially was quite an extraordinary stud dog. His progeny were legion, and some very good terriers of today owe him as progenitor in nearly every line. The best descendants of Alistair were Kildee, Tyrie, Winston, Prince Alexander, and Heather Prince. He was apparently too much inbred to, and though he produced, or was responsible for several beautiful terriers, it is much to be doubted whether in a breed which is suffering from the ill effects of too much inbreeding, he was not one of the greatest sinners. The Scottish Terrier Club was formed in the year 1882. In the same year, a joint committee drew up a standard of perfection for the breed. Messrs. J. B. Morrison and Thomas Gray, two gentlemen who were looked upon as great authorities, having a good deal to do with it. Standard Points of the Scottish Terrier Skull Proportionately long, slightly domed and covered with short, hard hair about three-quarters of an inch long or less. It should not be quite flat, as there should be a sort of stop or drop between the eyes. Muzzle very powerful and gradually tapering towards the nose, which should always be black and of a good size. The jaws should be perfectly level and the teeth square, though the nose projects somewhat over the mouth, which gives the impression of the upper jaw being longer than the under one. Eyes, a dark brown or hazel color, small, piercing, very bright, and rather sunken. Ears, very small, prick or half prick. The former is preferable, but never drop. They should also be sharp pointed, and the hair on them should not be long, but velvety, and they should not be cut. The ears should be free from any fringe at the top. Neck, short, thick, and muscular, strongly set on sloping shoulders. Chest, broad in comparison to the size of the dog, and proportionally deep. Body, of moderate length, but not so long as the skies, and rather flat-sided, well ribbed up, and exceedingly strong in hind quarters. Legs and feet. Both fore and hind legs should be short and very heavy in bone, the former being straight and well set on under the body, as the Scottish Terrier should not be out at elbows. The hocks should be bent, and the thighs very muscular, and the feet strong, small, and thickly covered with short hair, the forefeet being larger than the hind ones. Tail. Should be about seven inches long, never docked, carried with a slight bend, and often gaily. Coat should be rather short, about two inches, intensely hard and wiry in texture, and very dense all over the body. Size. From 15 pounds to 20 pounds, the best weight being as near as possible 18 pounds for dogs and 16 pounds for bitches, when in condition for work. Color. Steel or iron gray, black brindle, brown brindle, gray brindle, black, sandy, and wheaten. White markings are objectionable and can only be allowed on the chest and to a small extent. General appearance. The face should wear a very sharp, bright, and active expression, and the head should be carried up. The dog, owing to the shortness of his coat, should appear to be higher on the leg than he really is, but at the same time he should look compact and possessed of great muscle in his hind quarters. In fact, a Scottish Terrier, though essentially a Terrier, cannot be too powerfully put together, and should be from about 9 inches to 12 inches in height. Special Faults. Muzzle either under or overhung. Eyes, large or light-colored. Ears, large, round at the points or drop. 
it is also a fault if they are too heavily covered with hair legs bent or slightly bent and out at elbows coat any silkiness wave or tendency to curl is a serious blemish as is also an open coat size specimens over twenty pounds should be discouraged there have in recent years been many very excellent specimens of the scottish terrier bred and exhibited preeminent among them stands mrs haney's champion heworth rascal who was a most symmetrical terrier and probably the nearest approach to perfection in the breed yet seen other very first-class terriers have been the same ladies champion gare mr pallet's champion callum Dew, mr mccandlish's m's cosmetic mr chapman's heather bob and heather charm mr kinner's seafield rascal mr wood's hindman chief messrs buckley and mills clonmel and vader and mr dean willis's champion huntley daisy and champion carter laddie it is highly probable that of all the terrier tribe the scotty taken as a whole is the best companion he makes a most excellent house dog is not too big does not leave white hairs about all over the place loves only his master and his master's household and is withal a capable and reliable guard he is as a rule a game attractive terrier with heaps of brain power and from a show point of view there is always some recompense in keeping him as it will be found he breeds true to type and does not beget offspring of all sorts shapes and makes End of chapter 38 Chapter 39 The West Highland White Terrier Man, being a hunting animal, kills the otter for his skin, and the badger also. The fox he kills because the animal likes lamb and game to eat. Man, being unable to deal in the course of a morning with the rocks under and between which his quarry harbours, makes use of the small dog which will go underground, to which the French name Terrier has been attached. Towards the end of the reign of James I of England and VI of Scotland, we find him writing to Edinburgh to have half a dozen earth dogs or terriers sent carefully to France as a present, and he directs that they be got from Argyle and sent over in two or more ships, lest they should get harm by the way. That was roughly three hundred years ago, and the king most probably would not have so highly valued a newly invented strain as he evidently did value the terriers from Argyle. We may take it then that in 1600 the Argyllshire Terriers were considered to be the best in Scotland, and likely enough too, seeing the almost boundless opportunities the county gives for the work of the earth dogs. But men kept their dogs in the evil pre-show days for work and not for points, and mighty indifferent they were whether an ear cocked up or lay flat to the cheek, whether the tail was exactly of fancy length or how high to a hair's breadth it stood. These things are sine qua non on the modern show bench, but were not thought of in the cruel, hard-fighting days of old. In those days two things, and two things only, were imperatively necessary, pluck and capacity to get at the quarry. This entailed that the body in which the pluck was enshrined must be small and most active to get at the innermost recesses of the lair, and that the body must be protected by the best possible teeth and jaws for fighting, on a strong and rather long neck, and directed by a most capable brain. It is held that feet turned out a little are better for scrambling up rocks than perfectly straight fox terrier-like feet. In addition, it was useful to have your dog of a colour easy to see when in motion, though no great weight was laid upon that point, as, in the days before newspaper and trains, men's eyes were good as a rule. Still, the quantity of white in the existing terriers all through the west coast of Scotland shows that it must have been a rather favoured colour. White West Highland Terriers were kept at Poltoloch sixty years ago, and so they were first shown as Poltoloch Terriers. Yet although they were kept in their purest strain in Argyllshire, they are still to be found all along the west coast of Scotland, good specimens belonging to Rosher, to Skye, and at Balakulish on Loch Levin, so that it is a breed with a long pedigree, and not an invented breed of the present day. Emphatically, they are not simply white-coloured Scottish terriers, and it is an error to judge them on Scottish terrier lines. They are smaller than the average Scotty, more foxy in general conformation, straight-limbed, rather long, rather low, and active in body, with a broad forehead, light muzzle and underjaw 
and a bright, small, intelligent eye. Colonel Malcolm of Poltelloch, who is recognised as the great authority on the breed, lays stress upon the quality of the coat. The outer coat, he says, should be very soft on the forehead and get gradually harder towards the haunches. But the harsh coat beloved of the show bench is all nonsense, and it is the easiest thing in the world to fake, as anyone can try who will dip his own hair in the now fashionable Anturic baths. The outer coat should be distinctly long, but not long in the fancy or show sense. Still, it should be long enough to hang as a thatch over the soft, woolly, real coat of the animal, and keep it dry so that a good shake or two will throw off most of the water, while the undercoat should be so thick and naturally oily that the dog can swim through a fair-sized river and not get wet, or be able to sit out through a drenching rain, guarding something of his master's, and be none the worst. This coat I, at least, have never seen a judge look for, but for the working terrier it is most important. The size of the dog is perhaps best indicated by weight. The dog should not weigh more than 18 pounds, nor the bitch more than 16 pounds. There is, amongst judges, I find, with all respect, I say it, an undue regard for weight and what is called strength, also for grooming, which means brushing or plucking out all the long hair to gratify the judge. One might as well judge of Sandow's strength, not by his performance, but by the kind of wax he puts on his moustache. The West Highland Terrier of the old sort, I do not, of course, speak of bench dogs, earned their living following fox, badger, or otter, wherever these went underground, between, over, or under rocks that no man could get at to move, and some of such size that a hundred men could not move them, and, oh, the beauty of their note when they came across the right scent. I want my readers to understand this, and not to think of a highland fox can as if it were an English fox earth dug in sand, nor of badger work as if it were a question of locating the badger and digging him out. No, the badger makes his home amongst rocks, the small ones perhaps two or three tons in weight, and probably he has his hinner end against one of three or four hundred tons, no digging him out, and, moreover, the passages between the rocks must be taken as they are, no scratching them a little wider. So if your dog's ribs are a trifle too big, he may crush one or two through the narrow slit and then stick. He will never be able to pull himself back, at least until starvation has so reduced him that he will probably be unable, if set free, to win, as we say in Scotland, his way back to the open. I remember a tale of one of my father's terriers who got so lost. The keepers went daily to the can, hoping against hope. At last, one day, a pair of bright eyes were seen at the bottom of a hole. They did not disappear when the dog's name was called. A brilliant idea seized one of the keepers. The dog evidently could not get up. So a rabbit skin was folded into a small parcel round a stone and laid down by a string. The dog at once seized the situation, and the skin, held on, was drawn up, and fainted on reaching the mouth of the hole. He was carried home tenderly and nursed. He recovered. Referring to the characteristics of this terrier, Colonel Malcolm continues, Attention to breeding as to colour has undoubtedly increased the whiteness, but other points being good, a dog of the West Highland White Terrier breed is not to be rejected if he shows his descent by a slight degree of pale red or yellow on his back or his ears. I know an old Argyleshire family who consider that to improve their terriers they ought all to have browny yellow ears. Either again, except for the show bench, is the slightest objection to half-drop ears, i.e. the points of one or both ears, just falling over. Unfortunately, the show bench has a great tendency to spoil all breeds from too much attention being given to what is evident, and ears are grand things for judges to pin their faith to. Also, they greatly admire a fine long face, and what is called, but wrongly called, a strong jaw, meaning by that an ugly, heavy face. I have often pointed out that the tiger, the cat, the otter, all animals remarkable for their strength of jaw, have exceedingly short faces, but their bite is cruelly hard. And what, again, could be daintier than the face of a fox? 
the terrier of the west highlands of scotland has come down to the present day built on what i may perhaps call the fox lines and it is a type evolved by work hard and deadly dangerous work it is only of late years that dogs have been bred for show the so-called scottish terrier which at present rules the roost dates from eighteen seventy nine as a show dog i therefore earnestly hope that no fancy will arise about these dogs which will make them less hardy less wise less companionable less active less desperate fighters underground than they are at present a young dog that i gave to a keeper got its stomach torn open in a fight it came out of the can to its master to be helped he put the entrails back to the best of his ability and then the dog slipped out of his hands to finish the fight and forced the fox out into the open that is the spirit of the breed but alas that cannot be exhibited on the show bench they do say that a keeper of mine when chaffed by the fancy about the baby faces of his lot was driven to ask well can any of you gentlemen oblige me with a cat and i'll show you i did not hear him say it so it may only be a tale anyhow i have in my kennel a dog who at ten months old met a vixen fox as she was bolting out of her can and he at once caught her by the throat stuck to her till the pack came up and then on till she was killed in the course of one month his wounds were healed and he had two other classic fights one with a cat and the other with a dog fox not bad for a pup with a baby face i trust my readers understand that west highland white terriers are not white aberdeens not a new invention but have a most respectable ancestry of their own i add a formal list of points but this is the work of show bench experts and it will be seen from what i have written that i do not agree with them on certain particulars there should be feather to a fair degree on the tail but if experts will not allow it put rosin on your hands and pull the hair out and the rosin will win your prize the eye should not be sunk which gives the sulky look of the scotch terrier but should be full and bright and the expression friendly and confiding the skull should not be narrow anywhere it is almost impossible to get black nails in a dog of pure breed and the black soon wears off the pad work so folk must understand this on two occasions recently i have shown dogs acknowledged as dogs to be quite first class but you see they are not the proper type the judges unfortunately have as yet their eyes filled with the scottish terrier type and prefer mongols that show it to the real simon pure standard of points the general appearance of the West Highland White Terrier is that of a small, game, hardy-looking terrier, possessed with no small amount of self-esteem, with a varminty appearance, strongly built, deep in chest and back ribs, straight back, and powerful quarters, on muscular legs, and exhibiting in a marked degree a great combination of strength and activity. Colour? White. Coat? very important and seldom seen to perfection, must be double-coated. The outer coat consists of hard hair, about two and a half inches long and free from any curl. The undercoat, which resembles fur, is short, soft and close. Open coats are objectionable. Size? Dogs to weigh from 14 to 18 pounds and bitches from 12 to 16 pounds, and measure from 8 to 12 inches at the shoulder. Skull should not be too narrow, being in proportion to his powerful jaw, proportionately long, slightly domed, and gradually tapering to the eyes, between which there should be a slight indentation or stop. Eyebrows heavy, the hair on the skull should be from 3 quarters to 1 inch long, and fairly hard eyes widely set apart medium in size dark hazel in color slightly sunk in the head sharp and intelligent which looking from under the heavy eyebrows give a piercing look full eyes and also light colored eyes are very objectionable muzzle should be powerful proportionate in length and should gradually taper towards the nose which should be fairly wide and should not project forward beyond the upper jaw. 
the jaws level and powerful, the teeth square or evenly met, well set and large for the size of the dog. The nose and roof of mouth should be distinctly black in colour. Ears, small, carried erect or semi-erect, but never drop, and should be carried tightly up. The semi-erect ear should drop nicely over at the tips, the break being about three-quarters up the ear, and both forms of ears should terminate at a sharp point. The hair on them should be short, smooth, velvety, and they should not be cut. The ears should be free from any fringe at the top. Round, pointed, broad and large ears are very objectionable. Also ears too heavily covered with hair. Neck. Muscular and nicely set on sloping shoulders. Chest. Very deep with breadth in proportion to the size of the dog. Body. Compact, straight back, ribs deep and well arched at the upper half of rib, presenting a flattish side appearance. Loins broad and strong, hind quarters strong, muscular and wide across the top. Legs and feet, both fore and hind legs should be short and muscular. The shoulder blade should be comparatively broad and well sloped backwards. The points of the shoulder blade should be closely knit into the backbone so that very little movement of them should be noticeable when the dog is walking. The elbow should be close into the body both when moving or standing, thus causing the foreleg to be well placed in under the shoulder. The foreleg should be straight and thickly covered with short hard hair. The hind legs should be short and sinewy. The thighs very muscular and not too wide apart. The hocks bent and well set in under the body so as to be fairly close to each other either when standing, walking, or running, trotting, and when standing, the hind legs, from the point of the hock down to the fetlock joint, should be straight or perpendicular and not far apart. The forefeet are larger than the hind ones, are round, proportionate in size, strong, thickly padded, and covered with short hard hair. The foot must point straight forwards. The hind feet are smaller, not quite as round as forefeet, and thickly padded. The under surface of the pads of feet and all the nails should be distinctly black in colour. Hocks too much bent. Cow hocks detract from the general appearance. Straight hocks are weak. Both kinds are undesirable and should be guarded against. Tail six or seven inches long, covered with hard hairs, no feathers, as straight as possible, carried gaily, but not curled over back. A long tail is objectionable. Movement should be free, straight, and easy all round. In front, the leg should be freely extended forward by the shoulder. The hind movement should be free, strong, and close. The hock should be freely flexed and draw close in under the body, so that when moving off the foot, the body is thrown or pushed forwards with some force. Stiff, stilty movement behind is very objectionable. Faults Coat Any silkiness, wave or tendency to curl is a serious blemish, as is also an open coat. Black or grey hairs disqualify for competition. Size. Any specimens under the minimum or above the maximum weight are objectionable. Eyes. Full or light coloured. Ears. Round pointed, drop, broad and large, or too heavily covered with hair. Muzzle. Either under or overshot and defective teeth. End of chapter 39 Chapter 40 The Dandy Dinmont The breed of terrier now known as the Dandy Dinmont is one of the races of the dog which can boast of a fairly ancient lineage. Though it is impossible now to say what was the exact origin of this breed, we know that it was first recognized under its present name after the publication of Scott's Guy Mannering in the year 1814, and we know that for many years previously there had existed in the border counties 
a rough-haired, short-legged race of terrier, the constant and very effective companion of the border farmers and others in their fox-hunting expeditions. Various theories have been suggested by different writers as to the manner in which the breed was founded. Some say that the dandy is the result of crossing a strain of rough-haired terriers with the Dachshund, others that a rough-haired terrier was crossed with the Otterhound, and others again assert that no direct cross was ever introduced to found the breed, but that it was gradually evolved from the rough-haired terriers of the border district, and this latter theory is probably correct. The dandy would appear to be closely related to the Bedlington Terrier. In both breeds we find the same indomitable pluck, the same pendulous ear, and a light silky topknot adorning the skull of each. But the dandy was evolved into a long-bodied, short-legged dog, and the Bedlington became a long-legged, short-bodied dog. Indeed, to illustrate the close relationship of the two breeds, a case is quoted of the late Lord Antrim, who, in the early days of dog shows, exhibited two animals from the same litter, and with the one obtained a prize or honorable mention in the dandy classes, and with the other a like distinction in the Bedlington classes. It may be interesting to give a few particulars concerning the traceable ancestors of the modern dandy. In Mr. Charles Cook's book on this breed, we are given the particulars of one William Allen of Holystone, born in 1704, and known as Piper Allen, and celebrated as a hunter of otters and foxes, and for his strain of rough-haired terriers who so ably assisted him in the chase. William Allen's terriers descended to his son James, also known as the Piper, and born in the year 1734. James Allen died in 1810, and was survived by a son, who sold to Mr. Francis Somner at Yetholm a terrier dog named Old Pepper, descended from his grandfather's famous dog Hitchum. Old Pepper was the great-grandsire of Mr. Somner's well-known dog Shem. These terriers belonging to the Allens and others in the district are considered by Mr. Cook to be the earliest known ancestors of the modern Dandy Dinmont. Sir Walter Scott himself informs us that he did not draw the character of Dandy Dinmont from any one individual in particular, but that the character would well fit a dozen or more of the Litterdale yeomen of his acquaintance. However, owing to the circumstance of his calling all his terriers mustard and pepper, without any other distinction except old and young and little, the name came to be fixed by his associates upon one James Davidson of Hindley, a wild farm in the Teviotdale Mountains. James Davidson died in the year 1820, by which time the dandy Dinmont Terrier was being bred in considerable numbers by the border farmers and others to meet the demand for it which had sprung up since the appearance of Guy Mannering. As a result of the controversies that were continually recurring with regard to the points of a typical dandy Dinmont, there was formed in the year 1876 the Dandy Dinmont Terrier Club, with the object of settling the question forever, and for this purpose all the most noted breeders and others interested were invited to give their views upon it. The standard points adopted by the club is as follows. Head. Strongly made and large, not out of proportion to the dog's size. The muscles showing extraordinary development, more especially the maxillary. Skull. Broad between the ears, getting gradually less towards the eyes, and measuring about the same from the inner corner of the eyes to back of skull as it does from ear to ear. The forehead well domed. The head is covered with very soft silky hair which should not be confined to a mere top knot, and the lighter in color and silkier it is the better. The cheeks, starting from the ears proportionately with the skull, have a gradual taper towards the muzzle, which is deep and strongly made, and measures about three inches in length, or in proportion to skull as three is to five. The muzzle is covered with hair of a little darker shade than the top knot, and of the same texture as the feather of the forelegs. The top of the muzzle is generally bare for about an inch from the black part of the nose, the bareness coming to a point towards the eye and being about one inch broad at the nose. The nose and inside of mouth black or dark colored. The teeth very strong, especially the canine which are of extraordinary size for such a small dog. The canines fit well into each other so as to give the greatest available holding and punishing power, and the teeth are level in front, the upper ones very slightly overlapping the under ones. 
Many of the finest specimens have a swine mouth, which is very objectionable, but it is not so great an objection as the protrusion of the underjaw. Eyes. Set wide apart, large, full, round, bright, expressive of great determination, intelligence, and dignity. Set low and prominent in front of the head. Color, a rich, dark hazel. Ears. Pendulous, set well back, wide apart, and low in the skull, hanging close to the cheek, with a very slight projection at the base. Broad at the junction of the head, and tapering almost to a point. The fore part of the ear tapering very little, the tapering being mostly on the back part, the fore part of the ear coming almost straight down from its junction with the head to the tip. They should harmonize in color with the body color. In the case of a pepper dog, they are covered with a soft, straight, brownish hair, in some cases almost black. In the case of a mustard dog, the hair should be mustard in color, a shade darker than the body, but not black. All should have a thin feather of light hair starting about two inches from the tip, and of nearly the same color and texture as the top knot, which gives the ear the appearance of a distinct point. The animal is often one or two years old before the feather is shown. The cartilage and skin of the ear should not be thick, but rather thin. Length of ear, from three to four inches. Neck. Very muscular, well-developed, and strong. Showing great power of resistance, being well set into the shoulders. Body. Long, strong, and flexible. Ribs well sprung and round. Chest well developed and let well down between the forelegs. The back rather low at the shoulder, having a slight downward curve and a corresponding arch over the loins, with a very slight gradual drop from trough of loins to root of tail. Both sides of backbone well supplied with muscle. Tail. Rather short, say from 8 inches to 10 inches, and covered on the upper side with wiry hair of darker color than that of the body, the hair on the underside being lighter in color and not so wiry, with a nice feather about two inches long, getting shorter as it nears the tip. Rather thick at the root, getting thicker for about four inches, then tapering off to a point. It should not be twisted or curled in any way, but should come up with a curve like a scimitar, the tip, when excited, being in a perpendicular line with the root of the tail. It should neither be set on too high nor too low. When not excited, it is carried gaily and a little above the level of the body. Legs. The forelegs short, with immense muscular development and bone set wide apart, the chest coming well down between them. The feet well formed and not flat, with very strong brown or dark colored claws. Bandy legs and flat feet are objectionable. The hair on the forelegs and feet of a pepper dog should be tan, varying according to the body color from a rich tan to a pale fawn. Of a mustard dog, they are of a darker shade than its head, which is a creamy white. In both colors, there is a nice feather, about two inches long, rather lighter in color than the hair on the fore part of the leg. The hind legs are a little longer than the fore ones, and are set rather wide apart, but not spread out in an unnatural manner, while the feet are much smaller, the thighs are well developed, and the hair of the same color and texture as the fore ones, but having no feather or dew claws. The whole claws should be dark, but the claws of all vary in shade according to the color of the dog's body. Coat. This is a very important point. The hair should be about two inches long, that from skull to root of tail a mixture of hardish and soft hair which gives a sort of crisp feel to the hand. The hair should not be wiry. The coat is termed pile or penciled. The hair on the under part of the body is lighter in color and softer than that on the top. The skin on the belly accords with the coloring of dog. Color. The color is pepper or mustard. The pepper ranges from a dark bluish black to a light silver gray, the intermediate shades being preferred, the body color coming well down the shoulder and hips, gradually merging into the leg color. The mustards vary from a reddish brown to a pale fawn, the head being a creamy white, the legs and feet of a shade darker than the head. The claws are dark as in other colors. Nearly all dandy dinmonts have some white on the chest, and some have also white claws. Size. The height should be from 8 to 11 inches at the top of shoulder, 
length from top of shoulder to root of tail should not be more than twice the dog's height, but preferably one or two inches less. Weight. From 14 pounds to 24 pounds, the best weight as near 18 pounds as possible. These weights are for dogs in good working order. In the above standard of points, we have a very full and detailed account of what a dandy should be like, and if only judges at shows would bear them in mind a little more, we should have fewer conflicting decisions given, and dandy fanciers and the public generally would not from time to time be set wondering as to what is the correct type of the breed. A dandy makes an excellent house guard. For such a small dog, he has an amazingly deep, loud bark, so that the stranger who has heard him barking on the far side of the door is quite astonished when he sees the small owner of the big voice. When kept as a companion, he becomes a most devoted and affectionate little friend, and is very intelligent. As a dog to be kept in kennels, there is certainly one great drawback where large kennels are desired, and that is the risk of keeping two or more dogs in one kennel. Sooner or later there is sure to be a fight, and when dandies fight, it is generally a very serious matter. If no one is present to separate them, one or both of the combatants is pretty certain to be killed. But when out walking, the dandy is no more quarrelsome than other breeds of terriers, if properly trained from puppyhood. There is one little matter in breeding dandies that is generally a surprise to the novice, and that is the very great difference in the appearance of the young pups and the adult dog. The pups are born quite smooth-haired, the peppers are black and tan in color, and the mustards have a great deal of black in their coloring. The top knot begins to appear sometimes when the dog is a few months old, and sometimes not till he is a year or so old. It is generally best to mate a mustard to a pepper, to prevent the mustards becoming too light in color, though two rich colored mustards may be mated together with good results. It is a rather curious fact that when two mustards are mated, some of the progeny are usually pepper in color, though when two peppers are mated, there are very seldom any mustard puppies. The popularity of the dandy has now lasted for nearly a hundred years, and there is no reason why it should not last for another century, if breeders will only steer clear of the exaggeration of show points and continue to breed a sound, active, and hardy terrier. End of chapter 40 Chapter 41 The Sky and Clydesdale Terriers that the Sky Terrier should be called the heavenly breed is a tribute to the favor in which he is held by his admirers. Certainly, when he is seen in perfection, he is an exceedingly beautiful dog, as certainly there is no breed more affectionate, more faithful, or more lovable. Among his characteristics are a long-enduring patience, a prompt obedience, and a deep-hearted tenderness, combined with fearless courage. He is more sensitive to rebuke and punishment than most dogs, and will nurse resentment to those who are unjust to him, not viciously, but with an almost human plaintiveness which demands an immediate reconciliation. He is staunch and firm as his native hills to those who are kind to him, and for entering into battle with an enemy there is no dog more recklessly daring and resolute. Visitors to dog shows are disposed to believe that the Sky Terrier, with its well-groomed coat that falls in smooth cascades down its sides, and its veil of thick hair that obscures the tender softness of its dark, thoughtful eyes, is meant only to look beautiful upon the bench or to recline in comfortable indolence on silken cushions. This is a mistake. See a team of skies racing up a hillside after a fugitive rabbit, tirelessly burrowing after a rat, or displaying their terrier strategy around a fox's earth or an otter's holt, and you will admit that they are meant for sport and are demons at it. Even their peculiarity of build is a proof that they are born to follow vermin underground. They are long of body with short, strong legs adapted for burrowing. With the dachshund they approximate more closely than any other breeds to the shape of the badger, the weasel, and the otter, and so many animals which nature has made long and low in order that they may inhabit earths and insinuate themselves into narrow passages in the moorland cairns. There can be no question that these dogs, which are so typically highland in character and appearance, as well as the Clydesdale, the Scottish, the Dandy Dinmont, and the white Poltalock Terriers, are all the descendants of a purely native Scottish original. They are all interrelated, but which was the parent breed is impossible to determine. It is even difficult to discover which of these two distinct types of the Skye Terrier was the earlier, 
the variety whose ears stand alertly erect, or its near relative whose ears are pendulous. Perhaps it does not matter. The differences between the prick-eared sky and the drop-eared are so slight, and the characteristics which they have in common are so many, that a dual classification was hardly necessary. The earliest descriptions and engravings of the breed present a terrier considerably smaller than the type of today, carrying a fairly profuse hard coat with short legs, a body long in proportion to its height, and with ears that were neither erect nor drooping, but semi-erect, and capable of being raised to alertness in excitement. It is the case that drop-eared puppies often occur in the litters of prick-eared parents, and vice versa. As its name implies, this terrier had its early home in the misty islands of Skye, which is not to say that it was not also to be found in Lewis, Oronsay, Collinsay, and others of the Hebrides, as well as on the mainland of Scotland. Dr. Johnson, who visited these islands with Boswell in 1773, noticed these terriers, and observed that otters and weasels were plentiful in Skye, that the foxes were numerous, and that they were hunted by small dogs. He was so accurate an observer that one regrets he did not describe the MacLeod's terriers and their work. They were at that time of many colors, varying from pure white to fawn and brown, blue-gray and black. The light-colored ones had black muzzles, ears, and tails. Their tails were carried more gaily than would be permitted by a modern judge of the breed. In those days the Highlander cared less for the appearance than he did for the sporting proclivities of his dogs, whose business it was to oust the Todd from the earth in which it had taken refuge, and for this purpose certain qualities were imperative. First and foremost the terrier needed to be small, short of leg, long and lithe in body, with ample face fringe to protect his eyes from injury, and possessed of unlimited pluck and dash. The Sky Terrier of today does not answer to each and every one of these requirements. He is too big, decidedly he is too big, especially in regard to the head. A noble-looking skull with large, well-feathered ears may be admirable as ornament, but would assuredly debar its possessor from following into a fox's lair among the boulders. Then again, his long coat would mitigate against the activity necessary for his legitimate calling. It was not until about 1860 that the Sky Terrier attracted much notice among dog lovers south of the border, but Queen Victoria's admiration of the breed, of which from 1842 onward she always owned favorite specimens, and Sir Edwin Landseer's paintings in which the sky was introduced, had already drawn public attention to the decorative and useful qualities of this terrier. The breed was included in the first volume of the Kennel Club Stud Book, and the best among the early dogs were such as Mr. Pratt's Gilly and Dune Vegan, Mr. D. W. Fife's Novelty, Mr. John Bowman's Dandy, and Mr. McDonough's Rook. These were mostly of the drop-eared variety and were bred small. About the year 1874, fierce and stormy disputes arose concerning the distinctions of the Scottish breeds of terriers. The controversy was continued until 1879, when the Kennel Club was approached with the view to furnishing classes. The controversy was centered upon three types of Scottish terriers, those which claimed to be pure Skye terriers, a dog described briefly as Scotch, and a third, which for a time was miscalled the Aberdeen. To those who had studied the varieties, the distinctions were clear, but the question at issue was to which of these three rightly belonged the title of Scottish Terrier. The dog which the Scots enthusiasts were trying to get established under this classification was the Cairn Terrier of the Highlands, known in some localities as the Shore-Coated Working Sky, and in others as the Fox Terrier or Todd Hunter. A subdivision of this breed was the more leggy Aberdeen variety. The present-day Skye is without doubt one of the most beautiful terriers in existence. He is a dog of medium size with a weight not exceeding 25 pounds and not less than 18 pounds. He is long in proportion to his height with a very level back, a powerful jaw with perfectly fitting teeth, a small hazel eye, and a long hard coat just reaching the ground. In the prick-eared variety the ears are carried erect, with very fine ear feathering, and the face fringe is long and thick. The ear feathering and face fall are finer in quality than the coat, which is exceedingly hard and weather resisting. And here it is well to point out that the sky has two distinct coats, the undercoat, somewhat soft and woolly, and the upper, hard and rainproof. 
this upper coat should be as straight as possible without any tendency to wave or curl the tail is not very long and should be nicely feathered and in repose never raised above the level of the back the same description applies to the drop-eared type except that the ears in repose instead of being carried erect fall evenly on each side of the head when however the dog is excited the ears are pricked forward in exactly the same fashion as those of the airedale terrier this is an important point a houndy carriage of ear being a decided defect the drop-eared variety is usually the heavier and larger dog of the two and for some reason does not show the quality and breeding of its neighbor lately however there has evidently been an effort made to improve the drop-eared type with the result that some very excellent dogs have recently appeared at the important shows probably mr james pratt has devoted more time and attention to the sky terrier than any other now living fancier though the names of mr kidd and mr todd are usually well known mr pratt's skies were allied to the type of terrier claiming to be the original sky of the highlands the head was not so large the ears also were not so heavily feathered as is the case in the sky of today and the colors were very varied ranging from every tint between black and white in eighteen ninety two a great impetus was given to the breed by mrs hughes whose kennels at wolverley were of overwhelmingly good quality mrs hughes was quickly followed by such ardent and successful fanciers as sir claude and lady alexander of bollockmile mrs freeman miss bower smith and miss mcchean lately other prominent exhibitors have forced their way into the front rank among whom may be mentioned the countess of aberdeen mrs hugh ripley mrs wilmer miss wishaw and mrs sandwith mrs hughes wolverley duchess and wolverley jock were excellent types of what a prick-eared sky should be excellent too were mrs freeman's alister and sir claude alexander's young roseberry olden times abbas and wee mac of adele mrs wilmer's jean and mr millar's prince donard but the superlative sky of the period and probably the best ever bred is wolverley chummy the winner of thirty championships which are but the public acknowledgment of his perfections he is the property of miss mcchean who is also the owner of an almost equally good specimen of the other sex in fairfield diamond among the drop-eared skies of present celebrity may be mentioned mrs hugh ripley's perfection miss wishaw's piper gray and lady aberdeen's cromar kelpie there are two clubs in england and one in scotland instituted to protect the interests of this breed namely the skye terrier club of england the skye and clydesdale club and the skye terrier club of scotland the scottish club's description is as follows head long with powerful jaws and incisive teeth closing level or upper just fitting over under skull wide at front of brow narrowing between the ears and tapering gradually towards the muzzle with little falling in between or behind the eyes eyes hazel medium size close set muzzle always black ears prick or pendant when prick not large erect at outer edges and slanting towards each other at inner from peak to skull when pendant larger hanging straight lying flat and close at front body preeminently long and low shoulders broad chest deep ribs well sprung and oval shaped giving a flattish appearance to the sides hind quarters and flank full and well developed back level and slightly declining from the top of the hip joint to the shoulders the neck long and gently crested tail when hanging the upper half perpendicular the under half thrown backward in a curve when raised a prolongation of the incline of the back and not rising higher nor curling up legs short straight and muscular no dew claws the feet large and pointing forward coat double and under short close soft and woolly and over long averaging five and a half inches hard straight flat and free from crimp or curl hair on head shorter softer and veiling the forehead and eyes on the ears overhanging inside falling down and mingling with the side locks 
not heavily but surrounding the ear like a fringe, and allowing its shape to appear. Tail also gracefully feathered. Color, any variety. Dark or light blue or gray, or fawn with black points. Shade of head and legs approximating that of body. 1. Average measurements. Dog. Height at shoulder, 9 inches. Length, back of skull to root of tail, 22 and a half inches. Muzzle to back of skull, 8 and a half inches. Root of tail to tip joint, 9 inches. Total length, 40 inches. Bitch. Half an inch lower and 2 and a half inches shorter than dog. All points proportional. Thus body, 21 inches. Head, 8 inches. And tail, 8 and a half inches. Total, 37 and a half inches. 2. Average weight. Dog. 18 pounds. Bitch, 16 pounds. No dog should be over 20 pounds, nor under 16 pounds. And no bitch should be over 18 pounds, nor under 14 pounds. Whereas the Scottish club limits the approved length of coat to 5.5 inches, the English club gives a maximum of 9 inches. This is a fairly good allowance, but many of the breed carry a much longer coat than this. It is not uncommon, indeed, to find a sky with a covering of 12 inches in length, which, even allowing for the round of the body, causes the hair to reach and often trail upon the ground. The Clydesdale may be described as an anomaly. He stands, as it were, upon a pedestal of his own, and unlike other Scotch terriers, he is classified as non-sporting. Perhaps his marvelously fine and silky coat precludes him from the rough work of hunting after vermin, though it is certain his game-like instincts would naturally lead him to do so. Of all the Scottish dogs he is perhaps the smallest, his weight seldom exceeding eighteen pounds. He is thus described by the Sky Terrier Club of Scotland. General Appearance a long, low-level dog with heavily fringed, erect ears, and a long coat, like the finest silk or spun glass, which hangs quite straight and evenly down each side, from a parting extending from the nose to the root of the tail. Head. Fairly long, skull flat and very narrow between the ears, gradually widening towards the eyes and tapering very slightly to the nose, which must be black. The jaws strong and the teeth level. Eyes. Medium in size, dark in color, not prominent but having a sharp terrier-like expression. Eyelids black. Ears. Small, set very high on top of the head, carried perfectly erect and covered with long silky hair hanging in a heavy fringe down the sides of the head. Body. Long, deep in chest, well ribbed up, the back being perfectly level. Tail. Perfectly straight, carried almost level with the back and heavily feathered. Legs, as short and straight as possible, well set under the body and entirely covered with silky hair. Feet, round and cat-like. Coat, as long and straight as possible, free from all trace of curl or waviness, very glossy and silky in texture with an entire absence of undercoat. Color, a level bright steel blue, extending from the back of the head to the root of the tail, and on no account intermingled with any fawn, light, or dark hairs. The head and legs and feet should be a clear, bright golden tan, free from gray, sooty, or dark hairs. The tail should be very dark blue or black. The Clydesdale Terrier is rare, at any rate as regards the show bench. There are never more than two or three at most exhibited south of the Tweed, even when classes are provided at the big shows and championships offered, thus indicating that the breed is not a popular one. And amongst those kennels who do show, there exists at the present time but one dog who can lay claim to the title of champion. This unique specimen is the property of Sir Claude Alexander, Bart, of Bollockmile, and is known under the name of Wee Waddy. There are, of course, several fanciers in Scotland, among whom may be mentioned Mr. G. Shaw of Glasgow, who is the owner of several fine examples of the breed, including beautiful Sand Toy and the equally beautiful Mozart. As with the Sky Terrier, it seems a matter of difficulty to produce a perfect Clydesdale, and until the breed is taken up with more energy, it is improbable that first-class dogs will make an appearance in the show ring. A perfect Clydesdale should figure as one of the most elegant of the Terrier breed. His lovely silken coat, 
the golden-brown hue of his face fringe, paws, and legs, his well-pricked and feathery ear, and his generally smart appearance should combine to form a picture exciting general admiration. End of chapter 41 Chapter 42 The Yorkshire Terrier the most devout lover of this charming and beautiful terrier would fail if he were to attempt to claim for him the distinction of descent from antiquity. Bradford, and not Babylon, was his earliest home, and he must be candidly acknowledged to be a very modern manufactured variety of the dog. Yet it is important to remember that it was in Yorkshire that he was made, Yorkshire, where lived the cleverest breeders of dogs that the world has known. One can roughly reconstitute the process, what the Yorkshiremen desired to make for themselves was a pygmy, prick-eared terrier with a long, silky, silvery-gray and tan coat. They already possessed the foundation in the old English black and tan wire-haired terrier. To lengthen the coat of this working breed, they might very well have had recourse to a cross with the prick-eared sky, and to eliminate the wiry texture of the hair, a further cross with the Maltese dog would impart softness and silkiness without reducing the length. Again, a cross with the Clydesdale, which was then assuming a fixed type, would bring the variety yet nearer to the ideal, and a return to the black and tan would tend to conserve the desired color. In all probability, the dandy Dinmont had some share in the process. Evidence of origin is often to be found more distinctly in puppies than in the mature dog, and it is to be noted that the puppies of both the dandy and the Yorkshire are born with decided black and tan coloring. The original broken-haired Yorkshire Terrier of thirty years ago was often called a Scottish Terrier, or even a Skye, and there are many persons who still confound him with the Clydesdale, whom he somewhat closely resembles. At the present time he is classified as a toy dog, and exhibited almost solely as such. It is to be regretted that until very lately the Terrier character was being gradually bred out of him, and that the perkiness, the exuberance, and gameness which once distinguished him as the companion of the Yorkshire operative, was in danger of being sacrificed to the desire for the diminutive size and inordinate length of coat. Perhaps it would be an error to blame the breeders of Yorkshire Terriers for this departure from the original type as it appeared, say about 1870. It is necessary to take into consideration the probability that what is now called the old-fashioned working variety was never regarded by the Yorkshiremen who made him as a complete and finished achievement. It was possibly their idea at the very beginning to produce just such a diminutive dog as is now to be seen in its perfection at exhibitions, glorying in its flowing tresses of steel-blue silk and ruddy gold, and one must give them full credit for the patience and care with which during the past forty years they have been steadily working to the fixed design of producing a dwarfed breed which should excel all other breeds in the length and silkiness of its robe. The extreme of cultivation in this particular quality was reached some years ago by Mrs. Trower, whose little dog Conqueror, weighing five and a half pounds, had a beautiful enveloping mantle of the uniform length of four and twenty inches. Doubtless all successful breeders and exhibitors of the Yorkshire Terrier have their little secrets and their peculiar methods of inducing the growth of hair. They regulate the diet with extreme particularity, keeping the dog lean rather than fat, and giving him nothing that they would not themselves eat. Bread mixed with green vegetables, a little meat and gravy, or fresh fish, varied with milk puddings and sprats toy pelt biscuits, should be the staple food. Bones ought not to be given, as the act of gnawing them is apt to mar the beard and moustache. For the same reason, it is well, when possible, to serve the food from the fingers. But many owners use a sort of mask or hood of elastic material which they tie over the dog's head at meal times to hold back the long face fall and whiskers that would otherwise be smeared and sullied. Similarly, as a protection for the coat, when there is any skin irritation and an inclination to scratch, linen or cotton stockings are worn upon the hind feet. Many exhibitors pretend that they use no dressing, or very little, and this only occasionally, for the jackets of their Yorkshire Terriers. But it is quite certain that continuous use of grease of some sort is not only advisable, but even necessary. Opinions differ as to which is the best cosmetic, but hair marrow, the dressing prepared for the purpose by Miss D. Wilmer of Yoxford, Suffolk, 
could not easily be improved upon for this or any other long-coated breed. For the full display of their beauty, Yorkshire Terriers depend very much upon careful grooming. It is only by grooming that the silvery cascade of hair down the dog's sides and the beautiful tan facefall that flows like a rain of gold from his head can be kept perfectly straight and free from curl or wrinkle. And no grease or pomade, even if their use were officially permitted, could impart to the coat the glistening sheen that is given by the dexterous application of the brush. The gentle art of grooming is not to be taught by theory. Practice is the best teacher. But the novice may learn much by observing the deft methods employed by an expert exhibitor. Mr. Peter Eden of Manchester is generally credited with being the actual inventor of the Yorkshire Terrier. He was certainly one of the earliest breeders and owners, and his celebrated Albert was only one of the many admirable specimens with which he convinced the public of the charms of this variety of dog. He may have given the breed its first impulse, but Mrs. M. A. Foster of Bradford was for many years the head and center of all that pertained to the Yorkshire Terrier, and it was undoubtedly she who raised the variety to its highest point of perfection. Her dogs were invariably good in type. She never exhibited a bad one, and her Huddersfield Ben, Toy Smart, Bright, Sandy, Ted, Bradford Hero, Bradford Marie, and Bradford Queen, the last being a bitch weighing only 24 ounces, are remembered for their uniform excellence. Of more recent examples that have approached perfection may be mentioned Mrs. Walton's Ashton King, Queen and Bright, and her Mont Thaber Duchess. Mr. Mitchell's Westbrook Fred has deservedly won many honors, and Mr. Firmstone's Grand Duke and Mine Damaris, and Mrs. Sinclair's Mascus Superbus, stand high in the estimation of expert judges of the breed. Perhaps the most beautiful bitch ever shown was Waveless, the property of Mrs. R. Marshall, the owner of another admirable bitch in Little Picture. Mrs. W. Shaw's champion Snyton Amethyst is also an admirable specimen. The standard of points laid down by the Yorkshire Terrier Club is as follows. General appearance. That of a long-coated pet dog, the coat hanging quite straight and evenly down each side, a parting extending from the nose to the end of the tail. The animal should be very compact and neat, his carriage being very sprightly, bearing an air of importance. Although the frame is hidden beneath a mantle of hair, the general outline should be such as to suggest the existence of a vigorous and well-proportioned body. Head should be rather small and flat, not too prominent or round in the skull, rather broad at the muzzle, with a perfectly black nose. The hair on the muzzle very long, which should be a rich, deep tan, not sooty or gray. Under the chin, long hair about the same color as on the crown of the head, which should be a bright golden tan, and not on any account intermingled with dark or sooty hairs. Hairs on the sides of the head should be very long, of a few shades deeper tan than that on the top of the head, especially about the ear roots. Eyes medium in size, dark in color, having a sharp, intelligent expression, and placed so as to look directly forward. They should not be prominent. The edges of the eyelid should be dark. Ears, small, V-shaped, and carried semi-erect, covered with short hair. Color to be a deep, rich tan. Mouth, good, even mouth, teeth as sound as possible. A dog having lost a tooth or two, through accident or otherwise, is not to disqualify, providing the jaws are even. Body. Very compact, with a good loin, and level on the top of the back. Coat. The hair, as long and as straight as possible, not wavy, should be glossy like silk, not woolly, extending from the back of the head to the root of the tail. Color. A bright steel blue, and on no account intermingled with fawn, light or dark hairs. All tan should be darker at the roots than at the middle of the hairs, shading off to a still lighter tan at the tips. Legs. Quite straight, should be of a bright golden tan, well covered with hair. A few shades lighter at the end than at the roots. Feet. As round as possible, toenails black. Tail. Cut to medium length with plenty of hair, darker blue than the rest of the body, especially at the end of the tail, which is carried slightly higher than the level of the back. Weight. Divided into two classes, under five pounds 
and over five pounds to twelve pounds. End of chapter forty two. Chapter forty three The Pomeranian. Long before the Pomeranian dog was common in Great Britain, this breed was to be met with in many parts of Europe, especially in Germany, and he was known under different names, according to his size and the locality in which he flourished. The title of Pomeranian is not admitted by the Germans at all, who claim this as one of their national breeds, and give it the general name of the German Spitz. At Athens, in the Street of Tombs, there is a representation of a little Spitz leaping up to the daughter of a family as she is taking leave of them, which bears the date equivalent to 56 B.C. And in the British Museum there is an ancient bronze jar of Greek workmanship, upon which is engraved a group of winged horses, at whose feet there is a small dog of undoubted Pomeranian type. The date is the 2nd century B.C. It is now generally accepted that wherever our Pomeranian originated, he is a northern or arctic breed. Evidence goes to show that his native land in prehistoric times was the land of the Samoyeds, in the north of Siberia, along the shores of the Arctic Ocean. The Samoyed dog is being gradually introduced into England, and good specimens can be frequently seen at the principal shows. The similarity between our large white Pomeranian and the Samoyed is too great to be accidental, and we are drawn to the conclusion that in prehistoric times a migration of the Samoyeds was made from their native land into Pomerania, the most eastern province of Prussia bordering on the Baltic Sea, and that these people took with them their dogs, which were the progenitors of the present race of Pomeranian or Spitz. But in any case, the Pomeranian dog, so called, has been a native of various parts of Europe from very early times. His advent into England has been of comparatively recent date, at least in any great numbers, so far as can be ascertained, since no ancient records exist on this question. Gainsborough, however, painted the famous actress, Mrs. Robinson, with a large white Pomeranian sitting by her side. In Rees' Encyclopedia, published in 1816, a good picture of a white Pomeranian is given with a fairly truthful description. In this work he is said to be larger than the common sheet dog. Rees gives his name as Canis Pomeranius, from Linnaeus, and Chienloop, from Buffon. From these examples, therefore, we may infer that the large Pomeranian, or wolf spitz, was already known in England towards the end of the 18th century at least. There are, however, no systematic registers of Pomeranians prior to the year 1870. Even ten years later than this last date, so little was the breed appreciated that a well-known writer on dogs began an article on the Pomeranian with the words, The Pomeranian is admittedly one of the least interesting dogs in existence, and consequently his supporters are few and far between. The founders of the Kennel Club held their first dog show in 1870, and in that year only three Pomeranians were exhibited. For the next twenty years, little or no permanent increase occurred in the numbers of Pomeranians entered at the chief dog show in England. The largest entry took place in 1881, when there were fifteen. But in 1890, there was not a single Pomeranian shown. From this time, however, the numbers rapidly increased. Commencing in 1891 with fourteen, increasing in 1901 to sixty, it culminated in 1905 with the record number of 125. Such a rapid advance between the years 1890 and 1905 is unprecedented in the history of dog shows, although it is right to add that this extraordinarily rapid rise in popularity has since been equaled in the case of the now fashionable Pekingese. This tendency to advancement in public favor was contemporaneous with the formation of the Pomeranian Club of England, which was founded in 1891, and through its fostering care of the Pomeranian has reached a height of popularity far in advance of that attained by any other breed of toy dog. One of the first acts of the club was to draw up a standard of points as follows. Appearance. The Pomeranian should be a compact, short-coupled dog, well-knit in frame. He should exhibit great intelligence in his expression and activity and buoyancy in his deportment. Head and nose. Should be foxy in outline or wedge-shaped, the skull being slightly flat, large in proportion to the muzzle, which should finish rather fine and free from lippiness. The teeth should be level and should on no account be undershot. 
the hair on the head and face should be smooth and short-coated the nose should be black in white orange and sable dogs but in other colors may be self but never party color or white ears should be small not set too far apart nor too low down but carried perfectly erect like those of a fox and like the head should be covered with short soft hair eyes should be medium in size not full nor set too wide apart bright and dark in color showing great intelligence in white shaded sable or orange dogs the rims round the eyes should be black neck and body the neck should be rather short well set in the back must be short and the body compact being well ribbed up and the barrel well rounded the chest must be fairly deep and not too wide but in proportion to the size of the dog legs the forelegs must be well feathered perfectly straight of medium length and not such as would be termed leggy or low on leg but in due proportion in length and strength to a well-balanced frame must be fine in bone and free in action the hind legs and thighs must be well feathered neither contracted nor wide behind the feet small and compact in shape shoulders should be clean and well laid back tail the tail is one of the characteristics of the breed and should be turned over the back and carried flat and straight being profusely covered with long harsh spreading hair coat there should be two coats an undercoat and an overcoat the one a soft fluffy undercoat the other a long perfectly straight coat harsh in texture covering the whole of the body being very abundant round the neck and fore part of the shoulders and chest where it should form a frill of profuse standing off straight hair extending over the shoulders the hind quarter should be clad with long hair of feathering from the top of the rump to the hock color all whole colors are admissible but they should be free from white or shadings and the whites must be quite free from lemon or any other color a few white hairs in any of the self colors shall not necessarily disqualify at present the whole colored dogs are white black brown light or dark blue as pale as possible orange which should be as deep and even in color as possible beaver or cream dogs other than white with white foot or feet leg or legs are decidedly objectionable and should be discouraged and cannot compete as whole colored specimens in party colored dogs the color should be evenly distributed on the body in patches a dog with white or tanned feet or chest would not be a party color shaded sables should be shaded throughout with three or more colors the hair is to be as uniformly shaded as possible with no patches of self color in mixed classes where whole colored and party colored pomeranians compete together the preference should if in other points they are equal be given to the whole colored specimens where classification is not by colors the following is recommended for adoption by show committees one not exceeding seven pounds pomeranian miniatures two exceeding seven pounds pomeranians three pomeranians and pomeranian miniatures mixed the early type of a pomeranian was that of a dog varying from ten or twelve pound weight up to twenty pound weight or even more and some few of about twelve pounds and over are still to be met with but the tendency among present-day breeders is to get them as small as possible so that diminutive specimens weighing less than five pounds are now quite common and always fetch higher prices than the heavier ones the dividing weight as arranged some ten years ago by the pomeranian club is eight pounds and the kennel club has recently divided the breed into two classes of pomeranians and pomeranians miniature as a rule the white specimens adhere more nearly to the primitive type and are generally over eight pounds in weight but through the exertions of many breeders several are now to be seen under this limit the principal breeders of this color in england today are miss hamilton of roselle miss chell miss lee roberts mrs pope and mrs goodall copestake the first two whites to become full champions under kennel club rules were rob of roselle and konig of roselle both belonging to miss hamilton of roselle more black pomeranians have been bred in england than any other color and during the last fifteen years the number of good specimens that have appeared at our great exhibitions has been legion 
there do not seem to be so many really good ones today as heretofore this is explained perhaps by the fact that other colors are now receiving more and more attention from breeders a typical small black of today is billy t the property of mr and mrs stanley mappin he scales only five and a half pounds and is therefore as to size and weight as well as shape style and smartness of action a good type of toy pomeranian he was bred by mrs cates and is the winner of over fifty prizes and many specials to enumerate all the first-class blacks during the last thirty years would be impossible but those which stand out first and foremost have been black boy king pippin kaffir boy bayswater swell kensington king marland king black prince hatchem nip walkley queenie viva gate acre zulu glimpton king edward and billy t the brown variety has for a long time been an especial favorite with the public and many good ones have been bred during the last ten years there are many different shades of browns varying from a dark chocolate to a light beaver but in all cases they should be whole colored an admirable example of the brown pomeranians is the incomparable champion tina this beautiful little lady was bred by mrs adis from bayswater swell ex kitsy and scaled a little under five pounds she won over every pomeranian that competed against her besides having been many times placed over all other dogs of any breed in open competition the shaded sables are among the prettiest of all the various colors which pomeranians may assume they must be shaded throughout with three or more colors as uniformly as possible with no patches of self-color they are becoming very popular and good specimens are much sought after at high prices mrs hall walker has been constant in her devotion to this variety for several years and she possesses a very fine team in champions dainty boy dainty bell Bybury bell and in gate acre sable sioux mrs vale nicholas also has recently been most successful with shaded sables champion nanke poe over eight pounds and champions sable might and adam bear witness to this statement her lovely mite is a typical example of a small pomeranian of this color he was bred by mr hurst by little nipper ex laurel fluffy and scales only four and a quarter pounds mention should also be made of mrs ives dragonsfly mrs boucher's lady wolfino miss bland's marlin topaz mr walter winan's morning light and mr fowler's may duchess the blues or smoke-colored pomeranians have likewise their admirers and among those who have taken up these as a specialty may be mentioned miss ives mrs parker mrs loy and miss ruby cook another color which has attained of late years increasing popularity in england is orange these should be self-colored throughout and light shadings though not disqualifying should be discouraged the principal breeder of the orange pomeranian today is mr w brown of raleigh essex who has probably more specimens in his kennels than any other breeder of this color tiny boy the boy and orange boy are his best and all three are approved sires mrs hall walker is an admirer of this color and her gate acre philander lupino and orange girl are great prize winners miss hamilton of roselle has for many years bred oranges and has given to the pomeranian club of which she is president two challenge cups for pomeranians of this color mrs birch also is a lover of this hue and possesses such good dogs as rufus rusticus and cherrywinkle there is still another variety which bears the name of party colored as the name implies these dogs must be of more than one color and the colors should be evenly distributed on the body in patches for example a black dog with a white foot or leg or chest would not be a party color as a matter of fact there have been bred in england very few party colored pomeranians they seem to be freaks which are rarely produced it does not follow that by mating a black dog to a white dog or vice versa a party colored will be necessarily obtained on the contrary it is more likely that the litter will consist of some whole colored blacks and some whole colored whites miss hamilton's maif king of roselle and mrs vale nicholas's shelton novelty are the two most prominent species at the present time 
although Mrs. Harcourt Clare's Magpie and Mr. Temple's Layswood Tontit were perhaps better known some time ago. Among toy dogs, this particular breed has enjoyed an unprecedented popularity. The growth in the public favor among all classes has been gradual and permanent during the last fifteen years, and there are no signs that it is losing its hold on the love and affection of a large section of the English people. His handsome appearance, his activity and hardihood, his devotedness to his owner, his usefulness as a house-dog, and his many other admirable qualities will always make the Pomeranian a favorite both in the cottage and in the palace. End of chapter 43 Chapter 44 In the fourth chapter of Macaulay's History of England, we read of King Charles the Second that he might be seen before the dew was off the grass in St. James Park, striding among the trees, playing with his spaniels, and flinging corn to his ducks, and these exhibitions endeared him to the common people, who always liked to see the great unbend. There would appear to be much divergence of opinion as to the origin of this breed, and the date of its first appearance in England, but it was certainly acclimatized here as early as the reign of Henry the Eighth and it is generally thought that it is of Japanese origin, taken from Japan to Spain by the early voyagers to the east, and thence imported into England. The English toy spaniels of today, especially the Blenheim variety, are also said by some to be related to some sporting spaniels which belonged to Queen Mary about the year 1555, and might have been brought over from Germany. Mary kept a pack of spaniels for hunting purposes. There is another theory advanced, and with some reason, that the English toy spaniel of the present day derived its origin from the cocker spaniel, as these larger dogs have the same colors and markings, black and tan, tricolor, and red and white. The cocker also occasionally has the spot on the forehead, which is a characteristic of the Blenheim. Be the origin of the King Charles Spaniel and its advent in this country what it may, King Charles the Second so much indulged and loved these little friends that they followed him hither and thither as they pleased, and seemed to have been seldom separated from him. By him they were loved and cherished and brought into great popularity. In his company they adorn canvas and ancient tapestries, and are reputed to have been allowed free access at all times to Whitehall, Hampton Court, and other royal palaces. There are now four recognized varieties of the English toy spaniel, or, more properly speaking, five, as the Marlborough Blenheims are considered a distinct type. The latter are said by some to be the oldest of the toy spaniels, by others to have been first brought over from Spain during the reign of King Charles II by John Churchill, first Duke of Marlborough, from whose home, Blenheim Palace, the name was derived and has ever since been retained. If we may take the evidence of Van Dyck, Watteau, Francois Boucher, and Gruz, in whose pictures they are so frequently introduced, all the toy spaniels of bygone days had much longer noses and smaller, flatter heads than those of the present time, and they had much longer ears, these in many instances dragging on the ground. The Marlborough Blenheim has retained several of the ancestral points. Although this variety is of the same family and has the same name as the short-nosed Blenheim of the present day, there is a great deal of difference between the two types. The Marlborough is higher on the legs, which need not be so fully feathered. He has a much longer muzzle and a flatter and more contracted skull. The Marlborough possesses many of the attributes of a sporting spaniel, but so also does the modern Blenheim, although perhaps in a lesser degree. He has a very good scent. Mr. Rodden B. Lee states that the Blenheims of Marlborough were excellent dogs to work the coverts for cox and pheasant, and that excepting in color there is in reality not much difference in appearance between the older orange and white dogs, not as they are today with their abnormally short noses, round skulls, and enormous eyes, and the liver and white cockers which H. B. Challen drew for Daniel's Rural Sports in 1801. This will bear out the statement that the smaller type of spaniel may be descended from the cockers. 
The ground color of this dog is white, with chestnut encircling the ears to the muzzle, the sides of the neck are chestnut, as are also the ears. There is a white blaze on the forehead, in the center of which should be a clear lozenge-shaped chestnut spot, called the beauty spot, which, by inbreeding with other varieties, is fast being lost. Chestnut markings are on the body and on the sides of the hind legs. The coat should incline to be curly. The head must be flat, not broad, and the muzzle should be straight. The chestnut should be of a rich color. The four varieties, the King Charles, Tricolor, or, as he has been called, Charles I Spaniel, the modern Blenheim and the Ruby, have all the same points, differing from one another in color only, and the following description of the points as determined by the Toy Spaniel Club serves for all. Head Should be well domed and in good specimens is absolutely semi-globular, sometimes even extending beyond the half-circle and projecting over the eyes so as nearly to meet the upturned nose. Eyes The eyes are set wide apart with the eyelids square to the line of the face, not oblique or fox-like. The eyes themselves are large and dark as possible so as to be generally considered black, their enormous pupils which are absolutely of that color increasing the description. There is always a certain amount of weeping shown at the inner angles. This is owing to a defect in the lacrimal duct. Stop. The stop, or hollow between the eyes, is well marked as in the bulldog, or even more so. Some good specimens exhibit a hollow deep enough to bury a small marble. Nose. The nose must be short and well turned up between the eyes, and without any indication of artificial displacement afforded by a deviation to either side. The color of the end should be black, and it should be both deep and wide with open nostrils. Jaw The muzzle must be square and deep, and the lower jaw wide between the branches, leaving plenty of space for the tongue and for the attachment of the lower lips, which should completely conceal the teeth. It should also be turned up, or finished, so as to allow of its meeting the end of the upper jaw turned up in a similar way, as above described. EARS The ears must be long, so as to approach the ground. In an average-sized dog, they measure 20 inches from tip to tip, and some reach 22 inches, or even a trifle more. They should be set low on the head, hang flat to the sides of the cheeks, and be heavily feathered. In this last respect, the King Charles is expected to exceed the Blenheim, and his ears occasionally extend to twenty-four inches. Size The most desirable size is indicated by the accepted weight of from seven to ten pounds. Shape In compactness of shape, these spaniels almost rival the pug but the length of coat adds greatly to the apparent bulk, as the body, when the coat is wetted, looks small in comparison with that dog. Still, it ought to be decidedly cobby, with strong, stout legs, short, broad back and white chest. The symmetry of the King Charles is of importance, but it is seldom that there is any defect in this respect. Coat the coat should be long, silky, soft, and wavy, but not curly. In the Blenheim there should be a profuse mane extending well down in the front of the chest. The feather should be well displayed on the ears and feet, and in the latter case so thickly as to give the appearance of their being webbed. It is also carried well up on the backs of the legs. In the black and tan the feather on the ears is very long and profuse, exceeding that of the Blenheim by an inch or more. The feather on the tail, which is cut to the length of three and a half to four inches, should be silky, and from five to six inches in length, constituting a marked flag of a square shape, and not carried above the level of the back. Color The color differs with the variety. The black and tan is a rich, glossy black and deep mahogany tan. Tan spots over the eyes and the usual markings on the muzzle, chest, and legs are also required. The ruby is a rich chestnut red and is whole-colored. 
the presence of a few white hairs intermixed with the black on the chest of a black and tan or intermixed with the red on the chest of a ruby spaniel shall carry weight against a dog but shall not in itself absolutely disqualify but a white patch on the chest or white on any other part of a black and tan or ruby spaniel shall be a disqualification the blenheim must on no account be whole colored but should have a ground of pure pearly white with bright rich chestnut or ruby red markings evenly distributed in large patches the ears and cheeks should be red with a blaze of white extending from the nose up the forehead and ending between the ears in a crescentic curve in the center of this blaze at the top of the forehead there should be a spot of red the size of a sixpence tan ticks on the forelegs and on the white muzzle are desirable the tricolor should in part have the tan of the black and tan with markings like the blenheim in black instead of red on a pearly white ground the ears and under the tail should also be lined with tan the tricolor has no spot that beauty being particularly the property of the blenheim the all red king charles is known by the name of ruby spaniel the color of the nose is black the points of the ruby are the same as those of the black and tan differing only in color the king charles variety used to consist of black and tan and black and white spaniels and it is thought that by the interbreeding of the two specimens the tricolor was produced the color of the king charles now is a glossy black with rich mahogany tan spots over the eyes and on the cheeks there should also be some tan on the legs and under the tail the prince charles or tricolor should have a pearly white ground with glossy black markings evenly distributed over the body in patches the ears should be lined with tan tan must also be seen over the eyes and some on the cheeks under the tail also tan must appear the blenheim must also have a pearly white ground with bright rich chestnut or ruby red markings evenly distributed in patches over the body the ears and cheeks must be red and a white blaze should stretch from the nose to the forehead and thence in a curve between the ears in the middle of the forehead there should be on the white blaze a clear red spot about the size of a sixpence this is called the blenheim spot which as well as the profuse mane adds greatly to the beauty of this particular toy spaniel unfortunately in a litter of blenheims the spot is often wanting the ruby spaniel is of one color a rich unbroken red the nose is black there are now some very beautiful specimens of ruby spaniels but it is only within the last quarter of a century that this variety has existed it seems to have originally appeared in a litter of king charles puppies when it was looked upon as a freak of nature taking for its entire color only the tan markings and losing the black ground the different varieties of toy spaniels have been so much interbred that a litter has been reputed to contain the four kinds, but this would be a very rare occurrence. <clears throat> the Blenheim is now often crossed with the tricolor, when the litter consists of puppies quite true to the two types. The crossing of the King Charles with the ruby is also attended with very good results. The tan markings on the King Charles becoming very bright and the color of the ruby also being improved neither of these specimens should be crossed with either the blenheim or the tricolor as white must not appear in either the king charles or the ruby spaniel it is regretted by some of the admirers of these dogs that custom has ordained that their tails should be docked as portrayed in early pictures of the king charles and the blenheim varieties the tails are long well flagged and inclined to curve gracefully over the back and in none of the pictures of the supposed ancestors of our present toy spaniels even so recent as those painted by sir edwin landseer do we find an absence of the long tail if left intact the tail would take two or three years to attain perfection but the same may be said of the dog generally which improves very much with age and is not at its best until it is three years old and even then continues to improve although the toy spaniels are unquestionably true aristocrats by nature birth and breeding 
and are most at home in a drawing-room or on a well-kept lawn, they are by no means deficient in sporting proclivities, and, in spite of their short noses, their scent is very keen. They thoroughly enjoy a good scamper, and are all the better for not being too much pampered. They are very good house-dogs, intelligent and affectionate, and have sympathetic, coaxing little ways. One point in their favor is the fact that they are not noisy and do not yap continually when strangers go into a room where they are, or at other times, as is the habit with some breeds of toy dogs. Those who have once had King Charles Spaniels as pets seldom care to replace them by any other variety of dog, fearing lest they might not find in another breed such engaging little friends and companions, gentle as of yore, and also comforters. Although these dogs need care, they possess great powers of endurance. They appreciate warmth and comfort, but do not thrive so well in either extreme heat or intense cold. One thing to be avoided is the wetting of their feathered feet, or, should this happen, allowing them to remain so. And, as in the case of all dogs with long ears, the interior of the ear should be carefully kept dry to avoid the risk of canker. In going back to a period long before the last century was halfway through, we find that a great number of these ornamental pets were in the hands of working men living in the east of London, and the competition among them to own the best was very keen. They held miniature dog shows at small taverns and paraded their dogs on the sanded floor of tap rooms, their owners sitting round smoking long churchwarden pipes. The value of good specimens in those early days appears to have been from five pounds to two hundred and fifty pounds, which latter sum is said to have been refused by a comparatively poor man for a small black and tan with very long ears, and a nose much too long for our present-day fancy. Among the names of some of the old prominent breeders and exhibitors may be mentioned those of C. Eistrop, J. Garwood, J. A. Bugs, and Mrs. Forder. It is interesting to note, on looking over a catalogue of the Kennel Club show, that in 1884 the classes for Toy Spaniels numbered five, with two championship prizes, one each for Blenheims and Black and Tans, and the total entries were 19. At this date neither tricolors nor rubies were recognized as a separate variety by the Kennel Club, and they had no place in the register of breeds until the year 1902. At the Kennel Club show in 1904, 31 classes were provided, and 8 challenge certificate prizes were given, the entries numbering 109. The formation of the Toy Spaniel Club in 1885, and the impetus given to breeders and exhibitors by the numerous shows with good classification, have caused this beautiful breed to become more popular year by year. Fifty years ago the owners might be almost counted on the fingers of one's hands. Now probably the days of the year would hardly cover them. Among the most successful exhibitors of late years have been the Honorable Mrs. McLaren Morrison, the Honorable Mrs. Lighton, Mrs. Graves, Mrs. L. H. Thompson, Miss Young, Mrs. H. B. Looker, Mrs. Privet, Miss Hall, the Mrs. Clarkson and Grantham, Mrs. Dean, Mr. H. Taylor, Mrs. Bright, Mrs. Adamson, Miss Spofforth, Mrs. Hope Patterson, Mrs. Lydia Jenkins, and Miss E. Taylor. The novice fancier desirous of breeding for profit, exhibition, or pleasure, when price is an object for consideration, is often better advised to purchase a healthy puppy from a breeder of repute, rather than to be deluded with the notion that a good adult can be purchased for a few pounds, or to be carried away with the idea that a cheap, indifferently bred specimen will produce first-class stock. It takes years to breed out bad points, but good blood will tell. When you are purchasing a bitch with the intention of breeding, Many inquiries should be made as to the stock from which she comes. This will influence the selection of the sire to whom she is to be mated, and he should excel in the points in which she is deficient. 
It is absolutely necessary to have perfectly healthy animals. And if the female be young and small stock is desired, her mate should be several years her senior. A plain specimen of the right blood is quite likely to produce good results to the breeder. For example, should there be two female puppies in a well-bred litter, one remarkable as promising to have all the requirements for a coming champion, the other large and plain, this latter should be selected for breeding purposes, as, being stronger, she will make a better and more useful mother than her handsome sister, who should be kept for exhibition or for sale at a remunerative price. The modern craze for small specimens makes them quite unsuitable for procreation. A brood bitch should not be less than nine pounds in weight, and even heavier is preferable. A sire the same size will produce small and far more typical stock than one of five or six pounds, as the tendency is to degenerate, especially in head points. But small size can be obtained by suitably selecting the parents. The early spring is the best season for breeding, as it gives the puppies a start of at least six months in which to grow and get strong before the cold weather sets in, although, of course, they can be bred at any time, but autumn and winter puppies are more troublesome to rear. It is always wise to administer occasionally, both to puppies and adults, a dose of worm medicine, so as to give no chance to internal parasites, the most troublesome ill with which the dog owner has to wrestle causing even more mortality than the dreaded scourge of distemper. The rules of hygiene cannot be overlooked, as upon them hangs the success of the breeder. Plenty of fresh air, light, and sunshine are as necessary as food. Puppies of this breed are essentially delicate, and must be kept free from cold and drafts, but they require liberty and freedom to develop and strengthen their limbs, otherwise they are liable to develop rickets. Their food should be of the best quality, and after the age of six months, nothing seems more suitable than stale brown bread, cut up, dice size, and moistened with good stock gravy, together with minced, lean, underdone roast beef, with the addition, two or three times a week, of a little well-cooked green vegetable, varied with rice or soot pudding and plain biscuits. Fish may also be given occasionally. When only two or three dogs are kept, table scraps will generally be sufficient, but the pernicious habit of feeding at all times and giving sweets, pastry, and rich dainties is most harmful and must produce disastrous results to the unfortunate animal. Two meals a day at regular intervals are quite sufficient to keep these little pets in the best condition, although puppies should be fed four times daily in small quantities. After leaving the mother, they will thrive better if put on dry food, and a small portion of scraped or finely minced lean meat given them every other day, alternately with a chopped hard-boiled egg and stale bread crumbs. End of chapter 44 Chapter 45 The Pekingese and the Japanese Few of the many breeds of foreign dogs now established in England have attained such a measure of popularity in so short a time as the Pekingese. Of their early history, little is known beyond the fact that at the looting of the summer palace of Peking in 1860, bronze effigies of the dogs, known to be more than 2,000 years old, were found within the sacred precincts. The dogs were, and are to this day, jealously guarded under the supervision of the chief eunuch of the court, and few have ever found their way into the outer world. So far as the writer is aware, the history of the breed in England dates from the importation in 1860 of five dogs taken from the Summer Palace, where they had, no doubt, been forgotten on the flight of the court to the interior. Admiral Lord John Hay, who was present on active service, gives a graphic account of the finding of the little dogs in a part of the garden frequented by an aunt of the emperor 
who had committed suicide on the approach of the Allied forces. Lord John and another naval officer, a cousin of the late Duchess of Richmond's, each secured two dogs. The fifth was taken by General Dunn, who presented it to Queen Victoria. Lord John took pains to ascertain that none had found their way into the French camp, and he heard then that the others had all been removed to Jehal within the court. It is therefore reasonable to suppose that these five were the only palace dogs, or sacred temple dogs of Peking, which reached England, and it is from the pair which lived to a respectable old age at Goodwood that so many of the breed now in England trace their descent. Many years ago, Mr. Alfred de Rothschild tried, through his agents in China, to secure a specimen of the palace dog for the writer in order to carry on the Goodwood strain, but without success. Even after correspondence with Peking, which lasted more than two years, but we succeeded in obtaining confirmation of what we had always understood, namely, that the palace dogs are rigidly guarded, and that their theft is punishable by death. At the time of the Boxer Rebellion, only spaniels, pugs, and poodles were found in the Imperial Palace when it was occupied by Allied forces. The little dogs, having once more preceded the court in the flight to see Gnafnu. The Duchess of Richmond occasionally gave away a dog to intimate friends, such as the Dowager Lady Warncliffe, Lady Dorothy Neville, and others. But in those days the Pekingese was practically an unknown quantity, and it can therefore be more readily understood what interest was aroused about eleven years ago by the appearance of a small dog, similar in size, color, and general type, to those so carefully cherished at Goodwood. This proved to be none other than the since well-known sire Ah Kum, owned by Mrs. Douglas Murray, whose husband, having extensive interest in China, had managed after many years to secure a true palace dog, smuggled in a box of hay, placed inside a crate which contained a Japanese deer. Ah Kum was mated without delay to two Goodwood bitches, the result being, in the first litters, champion Goodwood Low and Goodwood Putt Sing. To these three sires some of the bluest Pekingese blood is traceable. Champion Goodwood Chum, Champion Chu Heir of Alderborn, Champion Jia Jia Manchu Tao Tai, Goodwood Ming, Marland Myth, and others. It must, however, be clearly admitted that since the popularity of the breed has become established, we unluckily have seen scores of Pekingese in the show ring who have lost all resemblance to the original type, and for this the Pekingese club is in some measure to blame. The original points for the guidance of breeders and judges were drawn up by Lady Samuelson, Mrs. Douglas Murray, and Lady Algernon Gordon Lennox, who fixed the maximum size at ten pounds, a very generous margin. Since then the club has amended the scale of points, no doubt in order to secure a larger membership, and the maximum now stands at eighteen pounds. Is it therefore to be wondered at that confusion exists as to what is the true type? At shows there should be two distinct classes, the palace dog and the Peking Spaniel, or any other name 
which would enable the breeds to be kept distinct. The following is the scale of points as issued by the Pekingese Club. Head Massive Broad skull Wide and flat between the ears Not dome-shaped Wide between the eyes Nose Black Broad Very short and flat Eyes Large Dark Prominent Round Lustrous Stop Deep ears Heart-shaped Not set too high Leather never long enough to come below the muzzle Not carried erect But rather drooping Long feather Muzzle Very short and broad Not underhung nor pointed wrinkled mane profuse extending beyond the shoulder blades forming ruff or frill round front of neck shape of body heavy in front broad chest falling away lighter behind lion like not too long in the body coat and feather condition long with thick undercoat straight and flat not curly nor wavy rather coarse but soft feather on thighs legs tail and toes long and profuse color all colors allowable red fawn black black and tan sable brindle white and partly colored black masks and spectacles round the eyes with lines to the ears are desirable legs short forelegs heavy bowed out at elbows hind legs lighter but firm and well-shaped. Feet, flat not round, should stand well up on toes, not on ankles. Tail, curled and carried well up on loins, long, profuse straight feather. Size, being a toy dog, the smaller the better, Provided type and points are not sacrificed. Anything over 18 pounds should disqualify. When divided by weight, classes should be over 10 pounds and under 10 pounds. Action. Free, strong, and high. Crossing feet or throwing them out in running should not take off marks. Weakness of joints should be penalized. Lady Algernon Gordon Lennox has occasionally been criticized for her advocacy of whole-colored specimens, but in support of this preference it can be proved that the original pair brought to Goodwood, as well as Mrs. Murray's Ah Coom, were all of the golden chestnut shade, and, as no brindled, party-colored, or black dog has ever been born at Goodwood or Broughton, we have some authority for looking upon whole color as an important point. This view was in the first place confirmed by the late Chinese ambassador in London, and further by Baron Speck von Sternberg, who was for many years minister at Peking, and had very special facilities for noting the points of the palace dogs. In every case a black muzzle is indispensable, also black points to the ears, with trousers, tail, and feathering a somewhat lighter shade than the body. There is considerable divergence of the opinion 
as to the penalization of what, in other breeds known as the Dudley nose, but on this point there must be some difficulty in the shows. In the Pekinese, the color of the nose varies in a remarkable way, especially in the case of the bitches. For instance, a pinkish tinge was always visible on the nose of Goodwood May before the birth of her puppies, but it resumed its normal color when the puppies were a few weeks old. As a representative type, Chu Air of Alderborn resembles most nearly the old Goodwood dogs. He has the same square, cobby appearance, broad chest, bowed legs, profuse feather, and large, lustrous eyes, points which are frequently looked for in vain nowadays, and his breeder and owner may well be proud of him. The Pekinese differs from the Japanese dog in that it appears to be far stronger in constitution and withstands the changes of the English climate with much greater ease. In fact, they are as hardy under healthy conditions as any English breed, and the only serious trouble seems to be with the weakness which is developing in the eyes. Small abscesses frequently appear when the puppies are a few months old, and, although they may not affect the sight, they almost inevitably leave a bluish mark, while in some cases the eye itself becomes contracted. Whether this is one of the results of inbreeding it is difficult to say, and it would be of interest to know whether the same trouble is met with in China. The Pekinese bitches are excellent mothers, provided they are not interfered with for the first few days. This was discovered at Goodwood years ago by the fact that, on two or three occasions, one celestial lady, who had been given greater attention than she considered necessary, revenged herself by devouring her own family of puppies. One thing seems from experience to be especially advisable, as far as things can be arranged, to breed in the spring rather than the autumn. The puppies need all the open air and exercise that is possible, and where rickety specimens are so frequently met with, it is only natural that a puppy who starts life with the summer months ahead is more likely to develop well than one born in the autumn. Great attention should be paid with reference to the frequent, almost certain presence of worms, which trouble seems more prevalent with the Pekinese than with many other breed. Wherever possible, fish should be given as part of the dietary. Some Pekinese devour it with relish, others will not touch it, but there is no doubt it is a useful item in the bill of fare. Bread well soaked in very strong stock, sheep's head and liver are always better as regular diet than meat, but in cases of debility a little raw meat given once a day is most beneficial. It would not be fitting to close an article on Pekinese without bearing testimony to their extraordinarily attractive characteristics. They are intensely affectionate and faithful, and have something almost cat-like in their domesticity. They display far more character than the so-called toy dog usually does, and for this reason it is all important that pains should be taken to preserve the true type in a recognition of the fact that quality is more essential than quantity. As their breed name implies, these tiny, black-and-white, long-haired lap-dogs are reputed to be natives of the land of the chrysanthemum, 
the Japanese who have treasured them for centuries have the belief that they are not less ancient than the dogs of Malta. There seems to be a probability, however, that as the breed may claim to be Chinese just as surely as Japanese, the Honorable Mrs. McLaren Morrison, an authority on exotic dogs, whose opinion must always be taken with respect, is inclined to believe that they are related to the short-nosed spaniels of Tibet, while other experts are equally of opinion that the variety is an offshoot of the spaniels of Peking. It is fairly certain that they are indigenous to the Far East, whence we have derived so many of our small, snub-nosed, large-eyed, and long-haired pets. The Oriental peoples have always bred their lap-dogs to small size, convenient for carrying in the sleeve. The sleeve-dog and the chin-dog are common and appropriate appellations in the East. The Japanese Spaniel was certainly known in England half a century ago, and probably much earlier. Our seamen often brought them home as presents for their sweethearts. These early imported specimens were generally of the larger kind, and if they were bred from, which is doubtful, it was by crossing with the already long-established King Charles or Blenheim Spaniels, their colors were not invariably white and black. Many were white and red, or white with lemon-yellow patches. The coloring other than white was usually about the long fringed ears and the crown of the head, with a line of white running from the point of the snub black nose between the eyes as far as the occiput. This blaze up the face was commonly said to resemble the body of a butterfly, whose closed wings were represented by the dog's expansive ears. The white and black coloring is now the most frequent. The points desired are a broad and rounded skull, large in proportion to the dog's body, a wide, strong muzzle, and a turned-up lower jaw. Great length of the body is not good. The back should be short and level. The legs are by preference slender and much feathered. The feet large and well separated. An important point is the coat. It should be abundant, particularly about the neck, where it forms a ruffle, and ought to be quite straight and very silky. The Japanese spaniel is constitutionally delicate, requiring considerable care in feeding. A frequent, almost a daily change of diet is to be recommended, and manufactured foods are to be avoided. Rice usually agrees well. Fresh fish, sheep's head, tongue, chicken livers, milk, or batter puddings are also suitable and occasionally give oatmeal porridge, alternated with a little scraped raw meat as an especial favor. For puppies, newly weaned, it is well to limit the supply of milk foods and to avoid red meat. Finely minced rabbit or fish are better. Of the Japanese Spaniels, which have recently been prominent in competition, may be mentioned Miss Serena's champion Fuji of Kobe, a remarkably beautiful bitch, who was under five pounds in weight, and who in her brief life gained six full championships. Mrs. Gregson's champion Tora of Braywick, a fine red and white dog, somewhat over seven pounds, is also to be remembered as a typical example of the breed. 
together with Kara, the smallest Jap ever exhibited or bred in this country, weighing only two and a half pounds when two and a half years old. Lady Samuelson's Togo and Otoyo of Braywick, and Mrs. Hull's champion, Daddy Jap. There has lately been a tendency to lay too much stress upon the diminutive size in this variety of dog, to neglect of well-formed limbs and free movement, but on the whole it may be stated with confidence that the Japanese is prospering in England, thanks largely to the energetic work of the Japanese Chin Club, which was formed some three years ago to promote the best interest of the breed. The following is the official standard issued by the club. Head should be large for size of animal, very broad with slightly rounded skull. Muzzle, strong and wide, very short from eyes to nose. Upper jaw should look slightly turned up between the eyes. Lower jaw should also be turned up or finished so as to meet it, but should the lower jaw be slightly underhung, it is not a blemish provided the teeth are not shown in consequence. Nose, very short in the muzzle part. The end or nose proper should be wide, with open nostrils, and must be the color of the dog's marking, i.e., black and black-marked dogs, and red or deep flesh color in red or lemon-marked dogs. Eyes, large, dark, lustrous, rather prominent, set wide apart. Ears, small and V-shaped, nicely feathered, set wide apart and high on the head, and carried slightly forward. Neck, should be short and moderately thick. Body, very compact and squarely built, with a short back, rather wide chest, and of generally cobby-shaped. The body and legs should really go into a square, i.e., the length of the dog should be about its height. Legs. The bones of the legs should be small, giving them a slender appearance, and they should be well feathered. Feet. Small and shaped, somewhat long. If feathered, the tufts should never increase the width of the foot, but only its length a trifle. Tail, carried in a tight curl over the back, it should be profusely feathered, so as to give the appearance of a beautiful plume on the animal's back. Coat, profuse, long, straight, rather silky, it should be absolutely free from wave or curl, and not lie too flat, but have a tendency to stand out, especially at the neck, so as to give a thick mane or ruff, which with profuse feathering on thighs and tail gives a very showy appearance. Color, either black and white or red and white, i.e. party-colored. The term red includes all shades, sable, brendel, lemon, or orange, but the brighter and clearer the red the better. The white should be clear white, and the color, whether black or red, should be evenly distributed in patches over the body, cheeks, and ears. Height at shoulder, about ten inches. Weight. The desirable is from four pounds to nine pounds. The smaller size is preferable, if good shape. End of chapter 45 Chapter 46 The Maltese Dog and the Pug 
no doubt has been cast upon the belief that the small white silky canis melateus is the most ancient of all lapdogs of the western world it was a favorite in the time of phidias it was an especial pet of the great ladies of imperial rome it appears to have come originally from the adriatic island of melita rather than from the mediterranean malta although this supposition cannot be verified there is however no question that it is of european origin and that the breed as we know it today has altered exceedingly little in type and size since it was alluded to by aristotle more than three hundred years before the christian era one may gather from various references in literature and from the evidence of art that it was highly valued in ancient times when his favorite dog dies wrote theophrastus in illustration of the vain man he deposits the remains in a tomb and erects a monument over the grave with the inscription offspring of the stock of malta the offspring of the stock of malta were probably first imported into england during the reign of henry the eighth it is certain that they were regarded as meat playfellows for mincing mistresses in the reign of elizabeth whose physician dr caius alluded to them as being distinct from the spaniel gentle or comforter early writers aver that it was customary when maltese puppies were born to press or twist the nasal bone with the fingers in order that they may seem more elegant in the sight of men a circumstance which goes to show that our forefathers were not averse to improving artificially the points of their dogs the snowy whiteness and soft silky texture of its coat must always cause the maltese dog to be admired but the variety has never been commonly kept in england a fact which is no doubt due to the difficulty of breeding it and to the trouble in keeping the dog's long jacket clean and free from tangle thirty or forty years ago it was more popular as a lapdog than it has ever been since and in the early days of dog shows many beautiful specimens were exhibited this popularity was largely due to the efforts of mr r mandeville of southwark who has been referred to as virtually the founder of modern maltese his fido and lily were certainly the most perfect representatives of the breed during the decade between eighteen sixty and eighteen seventy and at the shows held at birmingham islington the crystal palace and cremorne gardens this beautiful brace was unapproachable it is a breed which to be kept in perfection requires more than ordinary attention not only on account of its silky jacket which is peculiarly liable to become matted and is difficult to keep absolutely clean without frequent washing but also on account of a somewhat delicate constitution the maltese being susceptible to colds and chills if affected by such causes the eyes are often attacked and the water running from them induces a brown stain to mar the beauty of the face skin eruptions due to unwise feeding or parasites due to uncleanliness are quickly destructive to the silky coat and constant watchfulness is necessary to protect the dog from all occasions for scratching the diet is an important consideration always and a nice discernment is imperative in balancing the proportions of meat and vegetable too much meat is prone to heat the blood while too little induces eczema scraps of bread and green vegetables well mixed with gravy and finely minced lean meat form the best dietary for the principal meal of the day and plenty of exercise is imperative the following is the standard description and points of the maltese club of london head should not be too narrow but should be of a terrier shape not too long but not apple-headed ears should be long and well feathered and hang close to the side of the head the hair to be well mingled with the coat of the shoulders eyes should be a dark brown with black eye rims and not too far apart nose should be pure black legs and feet legs should be short and straight feet round and the pads of the feet should be black body and shape should be short and cobby low to the ground and the back should be straight from the top of the shoulders to the tail tail and carriage should be well arched over the back and well feathered coat length and texture should be a good length the longer the better of a silky texture not in any way woolly and should be straight color it is desirable that they should be pure white but slight lemon marks should not count against them condition and appearance should be of a sharp terrier appearance with a lively action 
The coat should not be stained, but should be well groomed in every way. Size. The most approved weights should be from 4 pounds to 9 pounds. The smaller the better, but it is desirable that they should not exceed 10 pounds. There seems to be no doubt that the fawn-colored pug enjoys the antiquity of descent that is attached to the greyhound, the Maltese dog, and some few other venerable breeds. Although much has been written on the origin of these dogs, nothing authentic has been discovered in connection with it. Statements have appeared from time to time to the effect that the pug was brought into this country from Holland. In the early years of the last century it was commonly styled the Dutch pug, but this theory does not trace the history far enough back, and it should be remembered that at that period the Dutch East India Company was in constant communication with the Far East. Others declare that Muscovy was the original home of the breed, a supposition for which there is no discernible foundation. The study of canine history receives frequent enlightenment from the study of the growth of commercial intercourse between nations, and the trend of events would lead one to the belief that the pug had its origin in China particularly in view of the fact that it was with that country that most of the blunt-nosed toy dogs with tails curled over their backs are associated the pug was brought into prominence in great britain about sixty years ago by lady willoughby de Eresby of grimthorpe near lincoln and mr morrison of wallam green who each independently established the kennel of these dogs with such success that eventually the fawn pugs were spoken of as either the willoughby or the Morrison Pugs. At that period the black variety was not known. The Willoughby Pug was duller in color than the Morrison, which was of a brighter, ruddier hue, but the two varieties have since been so much interbred that they are now indistinguishable, and the fact that they were ever familiarly recognized as either Willoughby's or Morrison's is almost entirely forgotten. A fawn Pug may now be either silver gray or apricot, and equally valuable. Whatever may be the history of the pug as regards its nativity, it had not been long introduced into England before it became a popular favorite as a pet, and it shared with King Charles Spaniel the affection of the great ladies of the land. The late Queen Victoria possessed one, of which she was very proud. The pug has, however, now fallen from his high estate as a lady's pet, and his place has been usurped by the toy Pomeranian, the Pekingese, and Japanese all of which are now more highly thought of in the drawing-room or boudoir. But the pug has an advantage over all these dogs, as from the fact that he has a shorter coat, he is cleaner and does not require so much attention. It was not until the establishment of the Pug Dog Club in 1883 that a fixed standard of points was drawn up for the guidance of judges when awarding the prizes to pugs. Later on, the London and Provincial Pug Club was formed, and standards of points were drawn up by that society. These, however, have never been adhered to. The weight of a dog or a bitch, according to the standard, should be from 13 pounds to 17 pounds, but there are very few dogs indeed that are winning prizes who can draw the scale at the maximum weight. One of the most distinctive features of a fawn pug is the trace, which is a line of black running along the top of the back from the occiput to the tail. It is the exception to find a fawn pug with any trace at all now. The muzzle should be short, blunt, but not up-faced. Most of the winning pugs of the present day are undershot at least half an inch, and consequently must be up-faced. Only one champion of the present day possesses a level mouth. The toenails should be black according to the standard, but this point is ignored altogether. In fact, the standard, as drawn up by the club, should be completely revised for it is no true guide the color which should be either silver or apricot fawn the markings on the head which should show a thumb mark or diamond on the forehead together with the orthodox size are not now taken into consideration and the prizes are given to oversized dogs with big skulls that are patchy in color and the charming little pugs which were once so highly prized are now the exception rather than the rule while the large, lustrous eyes, so sympathetic in their expression, are seldom seen. The black pug is a recent production. He was brought into notice in 1886, when Lady Brassey exhibited some at the Maidstone Show. By whom he was manufactured is not a matter of much importance, 
as with the fawn pug in existence there was not much difficulty in crossing it with the shortest faced black dog of small size that could be found and then back again to the fawn and the thing was done fawn and black pugs are continually being bred together and as a rule if judgment is used in the selection of suitable crosses the puppies are sound in color whether fawn or black in every respect except markings the black pug should be built on the same lines as the fawn and be a cobby little dog with short back and well-developed hind quarters wide in skull with square and blunt muzzle and tightly curled tail end of chapter forty six chapter forty seven the brussels griffon away back in the seventies numbers of miners in yorkshire and the midlands are said to have possessed the little wiry coated and wiry dispositioned red dogs which accompanied their owners to work being stowed away in pockets of overcoats until the dinner hour when they were brought out to share their master's meals perchance chasing a casual rat in between times old men of to-day who remember these little red tarriers tell us that they were the originals of the present-day brussels griffons and to the sporting propensities of the aforesaid miners is attributed the gameness which is such a characteristic of their latter-day representatives no one who is well acquainted with the brussels griffon would claim that the breed dates back like the greyhound to hoary antiquity or indeed that it has any pretensions to have come over with the conqueror the dog is not less worthy of admiration on that account it is futile to inquire too closely into his ancestry like topsy he growed and we must love him for himself alone even in the last fifteen years we can trace a certain advance in the evolution of the brussels griffon when the breed was first introduced under this name into this country underjaw was accounted of little or no importance whereas now a prominent chin is rightly recognized as being one of the most important physical characteristics of the race then again quite a few years ago a griffon with a red pin wire coat was rarely met with but now this point has been generally rectified and every show specimen of any account whatever possesses the much desired covering the first authentic importations of brussels griffons into this country were made by mrs kingscote miss adela gordon mrs frank pierce and fletcher who at that time circa eighteen ninety four kept a dog shop in regent street mrs handley spicer soon followed and it was at her house that in eighteen ninety six the griffon bruxellois club was first suggested and then formed the brussels griffon club of london was a later offshoot of this club and like many children would appear to be more vigorous than its parent griffons soon made their appearance at shows and won many admirers though it must be admitted that their progress up the ladder of popularity was not so rapid as might have been expected the breed is especially attractive in the following points it is hardy compact portable very intelligent equally smart and alert in appearance affectionate very companionable and above all it possesses the special characteristic of wonderful eyes ever changing in expression and compared with which the eyes of many other toy breeds appear as a glass bead to a fathomless lake griffons are hardy little dogs though like most others they are more susceptible to damp than to cold while not greedy like the terrier tribe they are usually good feeders and good doers and not tiresomely dainty with regard to food as is so often the case with toy spaniels it must be admitted that griffons are not the easiest of dogs to rear particularly at weaning time from five to eight weeks is always a critical period in the puppyhood of a griffon and it is necessary to supersede their maternal nourishment with extreme caution farinaceous foods do not answer and usually cause trouble sooner or later a small quantity of scrapped raw beef an egg spoonful at four weeks increasing to a teaspoonful at six may be given once a day and from four to five weeks two additional meals of warm milk goats for preference and not more than a tablespoon at a time should be given from five to six weeks the mother will remain with the puppies at night only and three milk meals may be given during the day with one of scrapped meat at intervals of about four hours care being taken to give too little milk rather than too much at six weeks the puppies may usually be taken entirely from the mother 
and at this time it is generally advisable to give a gentle vermifuge, such as ruby. A very little German rusk may also be added to the milk meals, which may be increased to one and a half tablespoons at a time, but it must always be remembered that in nine cases out of ten, trouble is caused by overfeeding rather than underfeeding, and until the Rubicon of eight weeks has been passed, care and oversight should be unremitting. At eight weeks old, force or brown breadcrumbs may be added to the morning milk, chopped meat may be given instead of scrapped at midday, the usual milk at tea time, and a dry biscuit such as plasmin for supper. At ten weeks old, the milk at tea time may be discontinued, and the other meals increased accordingly, and very little further trouble need be feared, for Griffons very rarely suffer from teething troubles. Brussels Griffons are divided into three groups, according to their appearance, and representatives of each group may be, and sometimes are, found in one and the same litter. First and foremost, both in importance and in beauty, comes the Griffon Bruxellois, a cobby compact little dog with wiry red coat, large eyes, short nose, well turned up and sloping back, very prominent chin and small ears. Secondly comes the Griffons of any other color, or as they are termed in Brussels, Griffons Belges. These are very often Griffons of the usual color, with a mismark of white or black, or occasionally they may be gray or fawn. But the most approved color, and certainly the most attractive, is black and tan. The third group of Brussels Griffon is that termed smooth, or in Brussels, Griffon Brabancon. The smooth Griffon is identical with the rough in all points except for being short-haired. As is well known, smooth Griffons are most useful for breeding rough ones with the desired hard red coat, and many well-known show dogs with rough coats have been bred from smooth ones. For example, Sparklets, Champion Copthorn Lobster, Champion Copthorn Treasure, Champion Copthorn Talk of the Town, and Copthorn Blunderbuss. This and many other facts in connection with breeding Griffons will be learnt from experience, always the best teacher. The descriptive particulars of the Brussels Griffon are General appearance A lady's little dog, intelligent, sprightly, robust, of compact appearance, reminding one of a cob and captivating the attention by a quasi-human expression. Head Rounded, furnished with somewhat hard, irregular hairs, longer round the eyes and the nose and cheeks. Ears Erect when cropped as in Belgium, semi-erect when uncropped. Eyes Very large, black or nearly black. Eyelids edged with black. Eyelashes long and black. Eyebrows covered with hairs, leaving the eye they encircle perfectly uncovered. Nose Always black. Short, surrounded with hair converging upward to meet those which surround the eyes. Very pronounced stop. Lips. Edged with black, furnished with a mustache. A little black in the mustache is not a fault. Chin. Prominent without showing the teeth, and edged with a small beard. Chest. Rather wide and deep. Legs. As straight as possible of medium length. Tail. Erect and docked to two-thirds. Color. In the Griffons Bruxellois, red. In the Griffons Belges, preferably black and tan, but also gray or fawn. In the Petit Brabancon, red or black and tan. Texture of coat. Harsh and wiry, irregular, rather long and thick. In the Brabancon, it is smooth and short. Weight. Lightweight, 5 pound maximum, and heavyweight, 9 pound maximum. Faults. The faults to be avoided are light eyes, silky hair on the head, brown nails, teeth showing, and a hanging tongue or a brown nose. End of chapter 47. Chapter 48. The Miniature Breeds. Except in the matter of size, the general appearance and qualifications of the miniature black and tan terrier should be as nearly like the larger breed as possible, for the standard of points applies to both varieties, excepting that erect or what are commonly known as tulip ears of semi-erect carriage 
are permissible in the miniatures. The officially recognized weight for the toy variety is given as under 7 pounds, but none of the most prominent present-day winners reach anything like that weight. Some, in fact, are little more than half of it, and the great majority are between 4 pounds and 5 pounds. Probably the most popular specimens of the miniature black and tan at the present time are Mr. Whaley's Glenartney Sport and Mr. Richmond's Mary Adam. Mary Adam is only four and a half pounds in weight, and he is a beautifully proportioned, with a fine, long head, a small, dark eye, small ears, and the true type of body. His markings of deep black and rich tan are good, and his coat is entirely free from the bare patches which so often mar the appearance of these toys, giving the suggestion of delicacy. The miniature black and tan is certainly not a robust dog, and has lost much of the terrier boisterousness of character by reason of being pampered and coddled. But it is a fallacy to suppose that he is necessarily delicate. He requires to be kept warm, but exercise is better for him than eiderdown quilts and silken cushions, and judicious feeding will protect him from the skin diseases to which he is believed to be liable. Under proper treatment he is no more delicate than any other toy dog, and his engaging manners and cleanliness of habit ought to place him among the most favored of ladies' pets and lapdogs. It is to be hoped that the efforts now being made by the Black and Tan Terrier Club will be beneficial to the increased popularity of this diminutive breed. For the technical description and scale of points, the reader is referred to the chapter on the larger variety of Black and Tan Terrier. Of late years, toy bull terriers have fallen in popularity. This is a pity, as their Lilliputian self-assertion is most amusing. As pets, they are most affectionate, excellent as watchdogs, clever at acquiring tricks, and always cheerful and companionable. They have good noses and will hunt diligently, but wet weather or thick undergrowth will deter them, and they are too small to do serious harm to the best-stocked game preserve. The most valuable toy bull terriers are small and very light in weight, and these small dogs usually have apple heads. Pony Queen, the former property of Sir Raymond Turwitt Wilson, weighed under three pounds, but the breed remains toy up to fifteen pounds. When you get a dog with a long wedge-shaped head, the latter in competition with small apple-headed dogs always takes the prize, and a slightly contradictory state of affairs arises from the fact that the small dog, with an imperfectly shaped head, will sell for more money than a dog with a perfectly shaped head which is larger. In drawing up a show schedule of classes for this breed, it is perhaps better to limit the weight of competitors to 12 pounds. The Bull Terrier Club put 15 pounds as the lowest weight allowed for the large breed, and it seems a pity to have an interregnum between the large and miniature variety. Still, in the interests of the small valuable specimens, this seems inevitable and opportunist principles must be applied to doggy matters as to other business in this world. At present there is a diversity of opinion as to their points, but roughly they are a long flat head, wide between the eyes, and tapering to the nose, which should be black, ears erect and bat-like, straight legs, and rather distinctive feet. Some people say these are cat-like. Toy bull terriers ought to have an alert, gay appearance coupled with refinement, which requires a nice whip tail. The best color is pure white. A brindle spot is not amiss, and even a brindle dog is admissible, but black marks are wrong. The coat ought to be close and stiff to the touch. Toy bull terriers are not delicate as a rule. They require warmth and plenty of exercise in all weathers. The most elegant, graceful, and refined of all dogs are the tiny Italian greyhounds. Their exquisitely delicate lines, their supple movements and beautiful attitudes, their soft large eyes, their charming coloring, their gentle and loving nature, and their scrupulous cleanliness of habit, all these qualities justify the admiration bestowed upon them as drawing-room pets. They are fragile, it is true, fragile as eggshell china, not to be handled roughly. But their constitution is not necessarily delicate and many have been known to live to extreme old age. Miss Mackenzie's Jack, one of the most beautiful of the breed ever known, lived to see his seventeenth birthday, and even then was strong and healthy. Their fragility is more apparent than real, and if they are not exposed to cold or damp, they require less pampering than they usually receive. 
this cause has been a frequent source of constitutional weakness and it was deplorably a fault in the italian greyhounds of half a century ago one cannot be quite certain as to the derivation of the italian greyhound its physical appearance naturally suggests a descent from the gaze hound of the ancients with the added conjecture that it was purposely dwarfed for the convenience of being nursed in the lap greek art presents many examples of a very small dog of greyhound type and there is a probability that the diminutive breed was a familiar ornament in the atrium of most roman villas in pompeii a dwarfed greyhound was certainly kept as a domestic pet and there is therefore some justification for the belief that the italian prefix is not misplaced in very early times the italian greyhound was appreciated van dyke neller and watteau frequently introduced the graceful figures of these dogs as accessories in their portraits of the court beauties of their times and many such portraits may be noticed in the galleries of windsor castle and hampton court mary queen of scots is supposed to have been fond of the breed as more surely were charles i and queen anne some of the best of their kind were in the possession of queen victoria at windsor and balmoral where sir edwin landseer transferred their graceful forms to canvas among the more prominent owners of the present time are the baroness campbell von lawrence whose rosemead laura and una are of superlative merit alike in outline color style length of head and grace of action mrs florence scarlet whose svelta saltarello and sola are almost equally perfect mrs matthews the owner of champion signor our smallest and most elegant dog show and mr charlwood who has exhibited many admirable specimens among them sussex queen and sussex princess the italian greyhound club of england has drawn up the following standard and scale of points general appearance a miniature english greyhound more slender in all proportions and of ideal elegance and grace and shape symmetry and action head skull long flat and narrow muzzle very fine nose dark in color ears rose-shaped placed well back soft and delicate and should touch or nearly touch behind the head eyes large bright and full of expression body neck long and gracefully arched shoulders long and sloping back curved and drooping at the quarters legs and feet four legs straight well set under the shoulder fine pasterns small delicate bone hind legs hocks well let down thighs muscular feet long hair foot tail coat and color tail rather long with low carriage skin fine and supple hair thin and glossy like satin preferably self-colored the color most prized is golden fawn but all shades of fawn red mouse cream and white are recognized Blacks, brindles, and pied are considered less desirable. Action. High stepping and free. Weight. Two classes, one of eight pounds and under, the other over eight pounds. The diminutive Shetland sheepdog has many recommendations as a pet. Like the sturdy little Shetland pony, this dog has not been made small by artificial selection. It is a collie in miniature, no larger than a Pomeranian. And it is perfectly hardy wonderfully sagacious and decidedly beautiful at first glance the dog might easily be mistaken for a belgian butterfly dog for its ears are somewhat large and upstanding with a good amount of feather about them but upon closer acquaintance the collie shape and nature become more pronounced the body is long and set low on stout short legs which end in long shaped feathered feet the tail is a substantial brush beautifully carried and the coat is long and inclined to silkiness, with a considerable neck frill. The usual weight is from six to ten pounds, the dog being of smaller size than the bitch. The prettiest are all white or white with rich sable markings, but many are black and tan or all black. The head is short and the face not so aquiline as that of the large collie. The eyes are well proportioned to the size of the head and have a singularly soft round brightness, reminding one of the eye of a woodcock or a snipe. The Shetlanders use them with the sheep, and they are excellent little workers, intelligent and very active, and as hardy as terriers. 
dog lovers in search of novelty might do worse than take up this attractive and certainly genuine breed end of chapter forty eight chapter forty nine practical management many people are deterred from keeping dogs by the belief that the hobby is expensive and that it entails a profitless amount of trouble and anxiety but to the true dog lover the anxiety and trouble are far outbalanced by the pleasures of possession and as to the expense that is a matter which can be regulated at will a luxuriously appointed kennel of valuable dogs who are pampered into sickness may indeed become a serious drain upon the owner's banking account but if managed on business principles the occupation is capable of yielding a very respectable income one does not wish to see dog-keeping turned into a profession and there seems to be something mean in making money by our pets but the process of drafting is necessary when the kennel is overstocked and buying and selling are among the interesting accessories of the game second only to the pleasurable excitement of submitting one's favorites to the judgment of the show ring the delights of breeding and rearing should be their own reward as they usually are yet something more than mere pin money can be made by the alert amateur who possesses a kennel of acknowledged merit and who knows how to turn it to account a champion ought easily to earn his own living some are a source of handsome revenue occasionally one hears of very high prices being paid for dogs acknowledged to be perfect specimens of their breed for the saint bernard sir belvedere sixteen hundred pounds were offered plin limon was sold for a thousand the same sum that was paid for the bulldog rodney stone for the collies southport perfection and ormskirk emerald mr megson paid a thousand sovereigns each size is no criterion of a dog's market value mrs ashton cross is said to have refused two thousand pounds for her celebrated pekingese chu er and there are many lap dogs now living that could not be purchased for that high price these are sums which only a competent judge with a long purse would dream of paying for an animal whose tenure of active life can hardly be more than eight or ten years and already the dog's value must have been attested by his success in competition it requires an expert eye to perceive the potentialities of a puppy and there is always an element of speculative risk for both buyer and seller many a dog that has been sold for a song has grown to be a famous champion at cruft's show in nineteen o five the bulldog mahomet was offered for ten pounds no one was bold enough to buy him yet eighteen months afterwards he was sold and considered cheap at a thousand uncertainty adds zest to a hobby that is in itself engaging thanks to the influence of the kennel club and the institution of dog shows which have encouraged the improvement of distinct breeds there are fewer nondescript mongrels in our midst than there were a generation or so ago a fuller knowledge has done much to increase the pride which the british people take in their canine companions and our present population of dogs has never been equaled for good quality in any other age or any other land the beginner cannot easily go wrong or be seriously cheated but it is well when making a first purchase to take the advice of an expert and to be very certain of the dog's pedigree age temper and condition the approved method of buying a dog is to select one advertised for sale in the weekly journals devoted to the dog a better way still if a dog of distinguished pedigree is desired is to apply direct to a well-known owner of the required breed or to visit one of the great annual shows such as cruft's manchester the ladies kennel association the kennel club crystal palace in october the scottish kennel club or birmingham and there choose the dog from the benches buying him at his catalogued price in determining the choice of a breed it is to be remembered that some are better watchdogs than others some more docile some safer with children the size of the breed should be relative to the accommodation available to have a st bernard or a great dane galumping about a small house is an inconvenience and sporting dogs which require constant exercise and freedom are not suited to the confined life of a bloomsbury flat nor are the long-haired breeds at their best draggling around in the wet muddy streets of a city for town life the clean-legged terrier the bulldog 
the pug and the skipper key are to be preferred bitches are cleaner in the house and more tractable than dogs the idea that they are more trouble than dogs is a fallacy the difficulty arises only twice in a twelvemonth for a few days and if you are watchful there need be no misadventure if only one dog or two or three of the smaller kinds be kept there is no imperative need for an outdoor kennel although all dogs are the better for life in the open air the house dog may be fed with meat scraps from the kitchen served as an evening meal with rodnim or a dry biscuit for breakfast the duty of feeding him should be in the hands of one person only when it is everybody's and nobody's duty he is apt to be neglected at one time and overfed at another regularity of feeding is one of the secrets of successful dog keeping it ought also to be one person's duty to see that he has frequent access to the yard or garden that he gets plenty of clean drinking water plenty of outdoor exercise and a comfortable bed for the toy and delicate breeds it is a good plan to have a dog room set apart with a suitable cage or basket kennel for each dog even delicate toy dogs however ought not to be permanently lodged within doors and the dog room is only complete when it has as an annexe a grass plot for playground and free exercise next to wholesome and regular food fresh air and sunshine are the prime necessaries of healthy condition weakness and disease come more frequently from injudicious feeding and housing than from any other cause among the free and ownerless pariah dogs of the east disease is almost unknown for the kennels of our british bred dogs perhaps a southern or a southwestern aspect is the best but wherever it is placed the kennel must be sufficiently sheltered from rain and wind and it ought to be provided with a covered run in which the inmates may have full liberty an awning of some kind is necessary trees afford good shelter from the sun rays but they harbor moisture and damp must be avoided at all costs when only one outdoor dog is kept a kennel can be improvised out of a packing case supported on the bricks above the ground with the entrance properly shielded from the weather no dog should be allowed to live in a kennel in which he cannot turn round at full length properly constructed portable and well ventilated kennels for single dogs are not expensive and are greatly to be preferred to any amateur makeshift a good one for a terrier need not cost more than a pound it is usually the single dog that suffers most from imperfect accommodation his kennel is generally too small to admit of a good bed of straw and if there is no railed-in run attached he must needs be chained up the dog that is kept on the chain becomes dirty in his habits unhappy and savage his chain is often too short and is not provided with swivels to avert kinks on a sudden alarm or on the appearance of a trespassing tabby he will often bound forward at the risk of dislocating his neck the yard dog's chain ought always be fitted with a stop link spring to counteract the effect of the sudden jerk the method may be employed with advantage in the garden for several dogs a separate rope being used for each unfriendly dogs can thus be kept safely apart and still be to some extent at liberty there is no obvious advantage in keeping a watchdog on the chain rather than in an enclosed compound unless he is expected to go for a possible burglar and attack him a wire netting enclosure can easily be constructed at very little expense for the more powerful dogs the use of wrought iron railings is advisable and these can be procured cheaply from sprats or bolton and pauls fitted with gates and with revolving troughs for feeding from the outside opinions differ as to the best material for the flooring of kennels and the paving of runs asphalt is suitable for either in mild weather but in summer it becomes uncomfortably hot for the feet unless it is partly composed of cork concrete has its advantages if the surface can be kept dry flagstones are cold for winter as also are tiles and bricks for terriers who enjoy burrowing earth is the best ground for the run and it can be kept free from dirt and buried bones by a rake over in the morning while tufts of grass left round the margins supply the dog's natural medicine the movable sleeping bench must of course be of wood raised a few inches above the floor with a ledge to keep in the straw or other bedding wooden floors are open to the objection that they absorb the urine but 
dogs should be taught not to foul their nest and in any case a frequent disinfecting with a solution of pearson's or jay's fluid should obviate impurity while fleas which take refuge in the dust between the planks may be dismissed or kept away with a sprinkling of paraffin whatever the flooring scrupulous cleanliness in the kennel is a prime necessity and the inner walls should be frequently lime-washed it is important too that no scraps of rejected food or bones should be left lying about to become putrid or to tempt the visits of rats which bring fleas if the dogs do not finish their food when it is served to them it should be removed until hunger gives appetite for the next meal many breeders of the large and thick-coated varieties such as st bernard's newfoundlands old english sheepdogs and rough-haired collies give their dogs nothing to lie upon but clean bare boards the coat is itself a sufficient cushion but in winter weather straw gives added warmth and for short-haired dogs something soft if it is only a piece of carpet or a sack is needed as a bed to protect the hawks from abrasion with regard to feeding this requires to be studied in relation to the particular breed one good meal a day served by preference in the evening is sufficient for the adult if a dried dog cake or a handful of rodnum be given for breakfast and perhaps a large bone to gnaw at clean cold water must always be at hand in all weathers and a drink of milk colored with tea is nourishing. Goat's milk is particularly suitable for the dog. Many owners keep goats on their premises to give a constant supply. It is a mistake to suppose, as many persons do, that meat diet provokes eczema and other skin troubles. The contrary is the case. The dog is by nature a carnivorous animal, and wholesome flesh, either cooked or raw, should be his staple food horse flesh which is frequently used in large establishments is not so fully to be relied upon as ordinary butcher meat there is no serious objection to bullocks heads sheep's heads bullocks tripes and paunches and a little liver given occasionally is an apparent food which most dogs enjoy but when it can be afforded wholesome butcher's meat is without question the proper food oatmeal porridge rice barley linseed meal and bone meal ought only to be regarded as occasional additions to the usual meat diet and are not necessary when dog cakes are regularly supplied well-boiled green vegetables such as cabbage turnip tops and nettle tops are good mixed with the meat potatoes are questionable of the various advertised dog foods many of which are excellent the choice may be left to those who are fond of experiment or who seek for convenient substitutes for the old-fashioned and wholesome diet of the household sickly dogs require invalids treatment but the best course is usually the simplest and given a sound constitution to begin with any dog ought to thrive if he is only properly housed carefully fed and gets abundant exercise end of chapter forty nine chapter fifty breeding and whelping the modern practice of dog breeding in great britain has reached a condition which may be esteemed as an art at no other time and in no other country have the various canine types been kept more rigidly distinct or brought to a higher level of perfection formerly dog owners apart from the keepers of packs of hounds paid scant attention to the differentiation of breeds and the conservation of type and they considered it no serious breach of duty to ignore the principles of scientific selection and thus contribute to the multiplication of mongrels discriminate breeding was rare and if a bulldog should mate himself with a greyhound or a spaniel with a terrier the alliance was regarded merely as an inconvenience so careless were owners in preventing the promiscuous mingling of alien breeds that it is little short of surprising so many of our canine types have been preserved in their integrity the elimination of the nondescript cur is no doubt largely due to the work of the homes for lost dogs that are instituted in most of our great towns every year some twenty six thousand homeless and ownerless canines are picked up by the police in the streets of london 
and during the forty-seven years which have elapsed since the dog's home at battersea was established upwards of eight hundred thousand dogs have passed through the books a few to be reclaimed or bought the great majority to be put to death a very large proportion of these have been veritable mongrels not worth the value of their licenses diseased and maimed curs or bitches in whelp and turned ruthlessly adrift to be consigned to the oblivion by the lethal chamber where the thoroughbred seldom finds its way and if as many as five hundred undesirables are destroyed every week at one such institution tis clear that the ill-bred mongrel must soon altogether disappear but the chief factor in the general improvement of our canine population is due to the steadily growing care and pride which are bestowed upon the dog and to the scientific skill with which he is being bred admitting that the dogs seen at our best contemporary shows are superlative examples of scientific selection one has yet to acknowledge that the process of breeding for show points has its disadvantages and that in the sporting and pastoral varieties more especially utility is apt to be sacrificed to ornament and type and stamina to fancy qualities not always relative to the animal's capacities as a worker the standards of perfection and scales of points laid down by the specialist clubs are usually admirable guides to the uninitiated but they are often unreasonably arbitrary in the insistence upon certain details of form generally in the neighbourhood of the head while they leave the qualities of type and character to look after themselves or to be totally ignored it is necessary to assure the beginner in breeding that points are essentially of far less moment than type and a good constitution the one thing necessary in the cultivation of the dog is to bear in mind the purpose for which he is supposed to be employed and to aim at adapting or conserving his physique to the best fulfilment of that purpose remembering that the greyhound has tucked up loins to give elasticity and bend to the body in running that a terrier is kept small to enable him the better to enter an earth that a bulldog is massive and undershot for encounters in the bull ring that the collie's ears are erected to assist him in hearing sounds from afar as those of the bloodhound are pendant the more readily to detect sounds coming to him along the ground while his head is bent to the trail nature has been discriminate in her adaptations of animal forms and the most perfect dog yet bred is the one which approaches nearest to nature's wise intention the foregoing chapters have given abundant examples of how the various breeds of the dog have been acquired manufactured improved resuscitated and retained broadly speaking two methods have been adopted the method of introducing an outcross to impart new blood new strength new character and the method of inbreeding to retain an approved type an outcross is introduced when the breed operated upon is declining in stamina or is in danger of extinction or when some new physical or mental quality is desired new types and eccentricities are hardly wanted however and the extreme requirements of an outcross may nowadays be achieved by the simple process of selecting individuals from differing strains of the same breed mating a bitch which lacks the required points with the dog in whose family they are prominently and consistently present inbreeding is the reverse of outcrossing it is a practice of mating animals closely related to each other and it is within limits an entirely justifiable means of preserving and intensifying family characteristics it is a law in zoology that an animal cannot transmit a quality which it does not itself innately possess or which none of its progenitors has ever possessed by mating a dog and a bitch of the same family therefore you concentrate and enhance the uniform number of possibly heterogeneous ancestors by exactly a half right back to the very beginning there is no surer way of maintaining uniformity of type and an examination of the most extended pedigree of almost any famous dog will show how commonly inbreeding is practised inbreeding is certainly advantageous when managed with judgment and discreet selection but it has its disadvantages also for it is to be remembered that faults and blemishes are inherited as well as merits and that the faults have a way of asserting themselves with annoying persistency furthermore breeding between animals closely allied in parentage is prone to lead to degeneracy physical weakness and mental stupidity while impotence and sterility are frequent concomitants 
and none but experienced breeders should attempt so hazardous an experiment observation has proved that the union of father with daughter and mother with son is preferable to an alliance between brother and sister perhaps the best union is that between cousins for the preservation of general type however it ought to be sufficient to keep to one strain and to select from that strain members who while exhibiting similar characteristics are not actually too closely allied in consanguinity to move perpetually from one strain to another is only to court an undesirable confusion of type in founding a kennel it is advisable to begin with the possession of a bitch as a companion the female is to be preferred to the male she is not less affectionate and faithful and she is actually much cleaner in her habits in the house if it is intended to breed by her she should be very carefully chosen and proved to be free from any serious fault and predisposition to disease not only should her written pedigree be scrupulously scrutinized but her own constitution and that of her parents on both sides should be minutely inquired into a bitch comes into season for breeding twice in a year the first time when she is reaching maturity usually at the age of from seven to ten months her condition will readily be discerned by the fact of an increased attentiveness of the opposite sex and the appearance of a mucus discharge from the vagina she should then be carefully protected from the gallantry of suitors dogs kept in the near neighbourhood of a bitch on heat who is not accessible to them go off their feet and suffer in condition with most breeds it is unwise to put a bitch to stud before she is eighteen months old but mr stubbs recommends that a bull bitch should be allowed to breed at her first heat while her body retains the flexibility of youth and there is no doubt that with regard to the bulldog great mortality occurs in attempting to breed from maiden bitches exceeding three years old in almost all breeds it is the case that the first three litters are the best it is accordingly important that a proper mating should be considered at the outset and a prospective sire selected either through the medium of stud advertisements or by private arrangement with the owner of the desired dog for the payment of the requisite stud fee varying from a guinea to ten or fifteen pounds the services of the best dogs of the particular breed can usually be secured it is customary for the bitch to be the visitor and it is well that her visit should extend to two or three days at the least when possible a responsible person should accompany her if the stud dog is a frequenter of shows he can usually be depended upon to be in sound physical condition no dog who is not so can be expected to win prizes but it ought to be ascertained beforehand that he is what is known as a good stock getter the fee is for his services not for the result of them both owners of stud dogs will grant two services and this is often desirable especially in the case of a maiden bitch or of a stud dog that is overwrought as so many are it is most important that both the mated animals should be free from worms and skin disorders fifty per cent of the casualties among young puppies are due to one or other of the parents having been in an unhealthy condition when mated a winter whelping is not advisable it is best for puppies to be born in the spring or early summer thus escaping the rigours of inclement weather during the period of gestation the breeding bitch should have ample but not violent exercise with varied and wholesome food including some preparation of bone meal and at about the third week whether she seems to require it or not she should be treated for worms at about the sixtieth day she will begin to be uneasy and restless a mild purgative should be given usually salad oil is enough but if constipation is apparent castor oil may be necessary on the sixty-second day the whelps may be expected and everything ought to be in readiness for the event a coarsely constituted bitch may be trusted to look after herself on these occasions no help is necessary and one may come down in the morning to find her with a litter comfortably nestling at her side but with the toy breeds and the breeds that have been reared in artificial conditions difficult or protracted parturition is frequent and human assistance ought to be at hand in case of need the owner of a valuable bull bitch for example would never think of leaving her to her own unaided devices all undue interference however should be avoided and it is absolutely necessary that the person attending her should be one with whom she is fondly familiar
in anticipation of a possibly numerous litter a foster mother should be arranged for beforehand comfortable quarters should be prepared in a quiet part of the house or kennels warm and free from draughts clean bedding of wheat and straw should be provided but the bitch should be allowed to make her nest in her own instinctive fashion let her have easy access to drinking water she will probably refuse food for a few hours before her time but a little concentrated nourishment such as brand's essence or a drink of warm milk should be offered to her in further preparation for the confinement a basin of water containing antiseptic for washing in towels warm milk a flask of brandy a bottle of ergotine and a pair of scissors are commodities which may all be required in emergency the ergot which must be used with extreme caution and only when the labor pains have commenced is invaluable when parturition is protracted and there is difficult straining without result its effect is to contract the womb and expel the contents but when the puppies are expelled with ease it is superfluous for a bitch of ten pounds in weight ten drops of the extract of ergot in a teaspoonful of water should be ample given by the mouth the scissors are for severing the umbilical cord if the mother should fail to do it in her own natural way sometimes a puppy may be enclosed within a membrane which the dam cannot readily open with tongue and teeth if help is necessary it should be given tenderly and with clean fingers occasionally a puppy may seem to be inert and lifeless and after repeatedly licking it the bitch may relinquish all effort at restoration and turn her attention to another that is being born in such a circumstance a rejected little one may be discreetly removed and a drop of brandy at the point of the finger smeared upon its tongue may revive animation or it may be plunged up to the neck in warm water the object should be to keep it warm and to make it breathe when the puppies are all born the dam may be given a drink of warm milk and then left alone to their toilet and to suckle them if any should be dead these ought to be disposed of curiosity in regard to the others should be temporarily repressed and inspection of them delayed until a more fitting opportunity if any are then seen to be malformed or to have cleft palates these had better be removed and mercifully destroyed it is the experience of many observers that the first whelps born in a litter are the strongest largest and healthiest if the litter is a large one the last born may be noticeably puny and this disparity in size may continue to maturity the wise breeder will decide for himself how many whelps should be left to the care of their dam the number should be relative to her health and constitution and in any case it is well not to give her so many that they will be a drain upon her these breeds of dogs that have been most highly developed by man and that appear to have the greatest amount of brain and intelligence are generally the most prolific as to the number of puppies they produce st bernards pointers setters are notable for the usual strength of their families st bernards have been known to produce as many as eighteen whelps at a birth and it is no uncommon thing for them to produce from nine to twelve a pointer of mr barclay fields phoebe produced twenty-one at a birth phoebe reared ten of these herself and almost every one of the family became celebrated it would be straining the natural possibilities of any bitch to expect her to bring up eighteen puppies healthily half that number would tax her natural resources to the extreme but nature is extraordinarily adaptive in tempering the wind to the shorn lamp and a dam who gives birth to a numerous litter ought not to have her family unduly reduced it was good policy to allow phoebe to have the rearing of as many as ten out of her twenty-one a bitch having twelve will bring up nine very well one having nine will rear seven without help and a bitch having seven will bring up five better than four breeders of toy dogs often rear the overplus offspring by hand with the help of a maw and thompson feeding bottle peptonized milk and one or more of the various advertised infants foods or orphan puppy foods others prefer to engage or prepare in advance a foster mother the foster mother need not be of the same breed but she should be approximately of similar size and her own family ought to be of the same age as the one of which she is to take additional charge one can usually be secured through advertisement in the canine press some owners do not object to taking one from a dog's home which is an easy method in consideration of the circumstance that by far the larger number of lost dogs are bitches sent adrift because they are in wealth 
the chief risk in this course is that the unknown foster mother may be diseased or verminous or have contracted the seeds of distemper or her milk may be populated with embryo worms these are dangers to guard against a cat makes an excellent foster mother for toy dog puppies worms ought not to be a necessary accompaniment of puppyhood and if the sire and dam are properly attended to in advance they need not be the writer has attended at the birth of puppies not one of whom has shown the remotest sign of having a worm and the puppies have almost galloped into healthy happy maturity protected from all the usual canine ailments by constitutions impervious to disease he has seen others almost eaten away by worms great wreathing knots of them have been ejected they have been vomited they have wriggled out of the nostrils they have perforated the stomach and wrought such damage that most of the puppies succumbed and those that survived were permanently deficient in stamina and liable to go wrong on the least provocating the puppy that is free from worms starts life with a great advantage End of chapter fifty chapter fifty one part one some common ailments of the dog and their treatment the experienced dog owner has long ago realized that cleanliness wholesome food judicious exercise and a dry comfortable and well-ventilated kennel are the surest safeguards of health and that attention to these necessaries saves him an infinitude of trouble and anxiety by protecting his dogs from disease on the first appearance of illness in his kennels the wise dog owner at once calls in the skill of a good veterinary surgeon but there are some of the minor ailments which he can deal with himself whilst he ought at least to be able to recognize the first symptoms of the dreaded distemper and give first aid until the vet arrives to apply his remedies and give professional advice distemper although more than one hundred years have elapsed since this was first imported to this country from france a great amount of misunderstanding still prevails among a large section of dog breeders regarding its true nature and origin the fact is the disease came to us with a bad name for the french themselves deemed it incurable in this country the old-fashioned plan of treatment was wont to be the usual rough remedies emetics purgatives the seton and the lancet failing in this specifics of all sorts were eagerly sought for and tried and are unfortunately still believed in to a very great extent this temper has a certain course to run and in this disease nature seems to attempt the elimination of the poison through the secretions thrown out by the nasopharyngeal mucous membrane our chief difficulty in the treatment of this temper lies in the complications thereof we may and often do have the organs of respiration attacked we have sometimes congestion of the liver or mucous inflammation of the bile ducts or some lesion of the brain or nervous structures combined with epilepsy convulsions or chorea this temper is also often complicated with severe disease of the bowels and at times with an affection of the eyes causes whether it be that the distemper virus the poison seedling of the disease really originates in the kennel or is the result of contact of one dog with another or whether the poison floats to the kennel on the wings of the wind or is carried there on a shoe or the point of a walking stick the following facts ought to be borne in mind one anything that debilitates the body or weakens the nervous system paves the way for the distemper poison two the healthier the dog the more power does he possess to resist contagion three when the disease is epizootic it can often be kept at bay by proper attention to diet and exercise frequent change of kennel straw and perfect cleanliness four the predisposing causes which have come more immediately under my notice are debility cold damp starvation filthy kennels unwholesome food impure air and grief the age at which dogs take distemper they may take distemper at any age the most common time of life is from the fifth till the eleventh or twelfth month symptoms there is first and foremost a period of latency or of incubation in which there is more or less of dullness and loss of appetite and this glides gradually into a state of feverishness 
the fever may be ushered in with chills and shivering the nose now becomes hot and dry the dog is restless and thirsty and the conjunctivae of the eyes will be found to be considerably injected sometimes the bowels are at first constipated but they are more usually irregular sneezing will also be frequent and in some cases cough dry and husky at first the temperature should be taken and if there is a rise of two or three degrees the case should be treated as distemper and not as a common cold at the commencement there is but little exudation from the eyes and nose but as the disease advances this symptom will become more marked being clear at first so too will another symptom which is partially diagnostic of the malady namely increased heat of body combined with a rapid falling off in flesh sometimes indeed proceeding quickly on to positive emaciation as the disease creeps downwards and inwards along the air passages the chest gets more and more affected the discharge of mucus and pus from the nostrils more abundant and the cough loses its dry character becoming moist the discharge from the eyes is simply mucus and pus but if not constantly dried away will gum the inflamed lids together that from the nostrils is not only purulent but often mixed with dark blood the appetite is now clean gone and there is often vomiting and occasional attacks of diarrhoea now in mild cases we may look for some abatement of the symptoms about the fourteenth day the fever gets less inflammation decreases in the mucous passages and appetite is restored as one of the first signs of returning health more often however the disease becomes complicated diagnosis the diagnostic symptoms are the severe catarrh combined not only with fever but speedy emaciation pneumonia as we might easily imagine is a very likely complication and a very dangerous one there is great distress in breathing the animal panting rapidly the countenance is anxious the pulse small and frequent and the extremities cold the animal would fain sit up on his haunches or even seek to get out into the fresh air but sickness weakness and prostration often forbid his movements if the ear or stethoscope be applied to the chest the characteristic signs of pneumonia will be heard these are sounds of moist crepitations etc bronchitis is probably the most common complication in fact it is always present except in very mild cases the cough becomes more severe and often comes on in tearing paroxysms causing sickness and vomiting the breathing is short and frequent the mouth hot and filled with viscid saliva while very often the bowels are constipated if the liver becomes involved we shall very soon have the jaundiced eye and the yellow skin diarrhoea is another very common complication we have frequent purging and maybe sickness and vomiting fits of a convulsive character are frequent concomitants of distemper epilepsy is sometimes seen owing no doubt to degeneration of the nerve centres caused by blood poisoning there are many other complications and skin complaints are common after it treatment this consists firstly in doing all in our power to guide a specific catarrhal fever to a safe termination and secondly in watching for and combating complications whenever we see a young dog ailing losing appetite exhibiting catarrhal symptoms and getting thin with a rise in temperature we should not lose an hour if he be an indoor dog find him a good bed in a clean well ventilated apartment free from lumber and free from dirt if it be summer have all the windows out or opened if winter a little fire will be necessary but have half the window opened at the same time only take precautions against his lying in a draught fresh air in cases of distemper and indeed in fevers of all kinds cannot be too highly extolled the more rest the dog has the better he must be kept free from excitement and care must be taken to guard him against cold and wet when he goes out of doors to obey the calls of nature the most perfect cleanliness must be enjoined and disinfectants used such as permanganate of potash carbolic acid pearsons or easel if the sick dog on the other hand be one of a kennel of dogs then quarantine must be adopted 
the hospital should be quite removed from the vicinity of all other dogs and as soon as the animal is taken from the kennel the latter should be thoroughly cleansed and disinfected and the other dogs kept warm and dry well fed and moderately exercised food and drink for the first three or four days let the food be light and easily digested in order to induce the animal to take it it should be as palatable as possible for small dogs we cannot have anything better than milk porridge at all events the dog must if possible be induced to eat he must not be horned unless there be great emaciation he must not overeat but what he gets must be good as to drink dogs usually prefer clean cold water and we cannot do harm by mixing therewith a little plain nitre medicine begin by giving a simple dose of castor oil just enough and no more than will clear out the bowels by one or two motions drastic purgatives and medicines such as mercury jalap aloes and podophyllin cannot be too highly condemned for very small toy dogs such as italian greyhounds yorkshire terriers etc i should not recommend even oil itself but manna one dram to two drams dissolved in milk by simply getting the bowels to act once or twice we shall have done enough for the first day and have only to make the dog comfortable for the night on the next day begin with a mixture such as the following solution of acetate of ammonia thirty drops to one hundred twenty sweet spirits of nitre fifteen drops to sixty salicylate of soda two grains to ten thrice daily in a little camphor water if the cough be very troublesome and the fever does not run very high the following may be substituted for this on the second or third day syrup of squills ten drops to sixty tincture of henbane ten drops to sixty sweet spirits of nitre ten drops to sixty in camphor water a few drops of dilute hydrochloric acid should be added to the dog's drink and two teaspoonfuls to a quart of water of the chlorate of potash this makes an excellent fever drink especially if the dog can be got to take decoction of barley barley water instead of plain cold water best made of keenan robinson's patent barley if there be persistent sickness and vomiting the medicine must be stopped for a time small boluses of ice frequently administered will do much good and doses of dilute prussic acid from one to four drops in a little water will generally arrest the vomiting if constipation be present we must use no rough remedies to get rid of it a little raw meat cut into small pieces minced in fact or a small portion of raw liver may be given if there be little fever if there be fever we are to trust for a time to injections of plain soap and water diarrhoea although often a troublesome symptom is it must be remembered a salutary one unless therefore it becomes excessive do not interfere if it does give the simple chalk mixture three times a day but no longer than is needful the discharge from the mouth and nose is to be wiped away with a soft rag or better still some toe which is afterwards to be burned wetted with a weak solution of carbolic the forehead eyes and nose may be fomented two or three times a day with moderately hot water with great advantage it is not judicious to wet a long-haired dog much but a short-haired one may have the chest and throat well fomented several times a day and well rubbed dry afterwards heat applied to the chests of long-haired dogs by means of a flat iron will also effect good the following is an excellent tonic sulphate of quinine one eight to three grains powdered rhubarb two to ten grains extract of taraxacum three to twenty grains make a bolus thrice daily during convalescence good food viral sprats in valid food and in valid biscuit moderate exercise fresh air and protection from cold this with an occasional mild dose of castor oil or rhubarb are to be our sheet anchors i find no better tonic than the tablets of phosphorin one quarter of a tablet thrice daily rolled in tissue paper for a toy dog up to two tablets for a dog of mastiff size bronchitis 
dogs that have been exposed to wet or that have been put to lie in a damp or draughty kennel with insufficient food are not less liable than their masters to catch a severe cold which if not promptly attended to may extend downward to the lining membranes of bronchi or lungs in such cases there is always symptoms more or less of fever with fits of shivering and thirst accompanied with dullness a tired appearance and loss of appetite the breath is short inspirations painful and there is a rattling of mucus in chest or throat the most prominent symptom perhaps is the frequent cough it is at first dry ringing and evidently painful in a few days however or sooner it softens and there is a discharge of frothy mucus with it and in the latter stages of pus and ropey mucus treatment keep the patient in a comfortable well ventilated apartment with free access in and out if the weather be dry let the bowels be freely acted upon to begin with but no weakening discharge from the bowels must be kept up after the bowels have been moved we should commence the exhibition of small doses of tartar emetic with squills and opium thrice a day if the cough is very troublesome give this mixture tincture of squills five drops to thirty paregoric ten drops to sixty tartar emetic one sixteenth of a grain to one grain syrup and water a sufficiency thrice daily we may give a full dose of opium every night in mild cases carbonate of ammonia may be tried it often does good the dose being from two grains to ten in camphor water or even plain water the chronic form of bronchitis will always yield if the dog is young to careful feeding moderate exercise and the exhibition of cod liver oil with a mild iron tonic the exercise however must be moderate and the dog kept from the water a few drops to a teaspoonful of paregoric given at night will do good and the bowels should be kept regular and a simple laxative pill given now and then diarrhoea or looseness of the bowels or purging is a very common disease among dogs of all ages and breeds it is nevertheless more common among puppies about three or four months old and among dogs who have reached the age of from seven to ten years it is often symptomatic of other ailments causes very numerous in weakly dogs exposure alone will produce it the weather too has no doubt much to do with the production of diarrhoea in most kennels it is more common in the months of july and august although it often comes on in the very dead of winter puppies if overfed will often be seized with this troublesome complaint a healthy puppy hardly ever knows when it has had enough and it will moreover stuff itself with all sorts of garbage acidity of the stomach follows with vomiting of the ingesta and diarrhoea succeeds brought on by the acrid condition of the kind which finds its way into the duodenum this stuff would in itself act as a purgative but it does more it abnormally excites the secretions of the whole alimentary canal and a sort of subacute mucous inflammation is set up the liver too becomes mixed up with the mischief throws out a superabundance of bile and thus aids in keeping up the diarrhoea among other causes we find the eating of indigestible food drinking foul or tainted water too much green food raw punches foul kennels and damp draughty kennels symptoms the purging is of course the principal symptom and the stools are either quite liquid or semi-fluid bilious looking dirty brown or clay colored or mixed with slimy mucus in some cases they resemble dirty water sometimes as already said a little blood will be found in the dejection owing to congestion of the mucous membrane from liver obstruction in case there be blood in the stools a careful examination is always necessary in order to ascertain the real state of the patient blood it must be remembered might come from piles or polypi or it might be dysenteric and proceed from ulceration of the rectum and colon in the simplest form of diarrhoea unless the disease continues for a long time there will not be much wasting and the appetite will generally remain good but capricious in bilious diarrhoea with large brown fluid stools and complete loss of appetite there is much thirst and in a few days the dog gets rather thin 
although nothing like so rapidly as in the emaciation of distemper the treatment will it need hardly be said depend upon the cause but as it is generally caused by the presence in the intestine of some irritating matter we can hardly err by administering a small dose of castor oil combining with it if there be much pain which you can tell by the animal's countenance from five to twenty or thirty drops of laudanum or of the solution of the muriate of morphia this in itself will often suffice to cut short an attack the oil is preferable to rhubarb but the latter may be tried the simple not the compound powder those from ten grains to two drams of bolus if the diarrhoea should continue next day proceed cautiously remember there is no great hurry and a sudden check to diarrhoea is at times dangerous to administer dog doses of the aromatic chalk and opium powder or give the following medicine three times a day compound powdered catechu one grain to ten powdered chalk with opium three grains to thirty mix if the diarrhoea still continues good may accrue from a trial of the following mixture laudanum five to thirty drops dilute sulphuric acid two to fifteen drops in camphor water this after every liquid motion or if the motions may not be observed three times a day if blood should appear in the stools give the following quino powder one to ten grains powder ipecac one fourth to three grains powdered opium one half to two grains this may be made into a bolus with any simple extract and given three times a day the food is of importance the diet should be changed the food requires to be of a non-stimulating kind no meat being allowed but milk and bread sago or arrowroot or rice etc to drink either pure water with a pinch or two of chlorate and nitrate of potash in it or patent barley water if the dog will take it the bed must be warm and clean and free from draughts and in all cases of diarrhoea one cannot be too particular with the cleanliness and disinfection of the kennels end of chapter fifty one part one chapter fifty one part two constipation more commonly called costiveness is also a very common complaint it often occurs in the progress of other diseases but is just as often a separate ailment perhaps no complaint to which our canine friends are liable is less understood by the non-professional dog doctor and by dog owners themselves often caused by weakness in the coats of the intestine the exhibition of purgatives can only have a temporary effect in relieving the symptoms and is certain to be followed by reaction and consequently by further debility want of exercise and bath common cause Ewart was never more correct in his life than when he said, Many dogs have a dry, constipated habit, often greatly increased by the bones on which they are fed. This favors the disposition to mange, etc. It produces indigestion, encourages worms, blackens the teeth, and causes fetid breath. Symptoms The stools are hard, usually in large round balls, and defecation is accomplished with great difficulty the animal often having to try several times before he succeeds in effecting the act and this only after the most acute suffering the feces are generally covered with white mucus showing the heat and semi-dry condition of the gut the stool is sometimes so dry as to fall to pieces like so much oatmeal there is generally also a deficiency of bile in the motions and in addition to simple costiveness we have more or less loss of appetite with a two-pale tongue, dullness and sleepiness, with slight redness of the conjunctiva. Sometimes constipation alternates with diarrhea, the food being improperly commingled with the gastric and other juices, ferments, spoils, and becomes, instead of healthy blood-producing chyme, an irritant purgative. Treatment Hygienic treatment more than medicinal. Mild doses of castor oil, compound rhubarb peel, or olive oil may at first be necessary sometimes an enema will be required if the medicine will not act plenty of exercise and a swim daily with a good run after the swim or instead of the swim a bucket bath water thrown over the dog 
give oatmeal rather than flour or fine bread as the staple of his diet but a goodly allowance of meat is to be given as well with cabbage or boiled liver or even a portion of raw liver fresh air and exercise in the fields you may give a bolus before dinner such as the following compound rhubarb pill one to five grains quinine one eight to two grains extract of taraxacum two to ten grains mix fits whatever be the cause they are very alarming in puppies they are called convulsions and resemble epileptic fits keep the dog very quiet but use little force simply enough to keep him from hurting himself keep out of the sun or in a darkened room when he can swallow give from two to twenty grains according to size of bromide of potassium in a little camphor water thrice daily for a few days only milk food keep quiet skin diseases in the whole range of dog ailments included in the term canine pathology there are none more bothersome to treat successfully nor more difficult to diagnose than those of the skin there are none either that afford the quack or patent nostrum monger a larger field for the practice of his fiendish gifts if i were to be asked the questions why do dogs suffer so much from skin complaints and why does it appear to be so difficult to treat them i should answer the first thus through the neglect of their owners from want of cleanliness from injudicious feeding from bad kenneling and from permitting their favorites such free intercourse with other members of the canine fraternity overcrowding is another and distinct source of skin troubles my answer to the second question is that the layman too often treats the trouble in the skin as if it were the disease itself whereas it is generally merely a symptom thereof examples to plaster medicated oils or ointments all over the skin of a dog suffering from constitutional eczema is about as sensible as would be the painting white of the yellow skin in jaundice in order to cure the disordered liver but even those contagious diseases that are caused by skin germs or animalcules will not be wholly cured by any applications whatever constitutional remedies should go hand in hand with this and indeed so great is the defensive power of strong pure blood rich in its white corpuscles or loose sacites that i believe i could cure even the worst forms of mange by internal remedies good food and tonics etc without the aid of any dressing whatever except pure cold water in treating of skin diseases it is usual to divide them into three sections one the non-contagious two the contagious and three ailments caused by external parasites one the non-contagious a erythema this is a redness with slight inflammation of the skin the deeper tissues underneath not being involved examples that seen between the wrinkles of well-bred pugs mastiffs or bulldogs or inside the thighs of greyhounds etc if the skin breaks there may be discharges of pus and if the case is not cured the skin may thicken and crack and the dog make matters worse with his tongue treatment review and correct the methods of feeding a dog should be neither too gross nor too lean exercise perfect cleanliness the early morning sluice down with cold water and aquasia tonic he may need a laxative as well locally dusting with oxide of zinc or the violet powder of the nurseries a lotion of lead or arnica fomentation followed by cold water and when dry dusting as above a weak solution of boracic acid any chemist will sometimes do good b prurigo itching all over with or without scurf sometimes thickening treatment regulation of diet green vegetables fruit if he will take it brushing and grooming but never roughly try for worms and for fleas c eczema the name is not a happy one as applied to the usual itching skin disease of dogs eczema proper is an eruption in which the formed matter dries off into scales or scabs 
and dog eczema so called is as often as not a species of lichen then of course it is often accompanied with vermin nearly always with dirt and it is irritated out of all character by the biting and scratching of the dog himself treatment must be both constitutional and local attend to the organs of digestion give a moderate dose of opening medicine to clear away offending matter this simple aperient may be repeated occasionally say once a week and if diarrhea be present it may be checked by the addition of a little morphia or dilute sulfuric acid cream of tartar with sulphur is an excellent derivative being both diuretic and diaphoretic but it must not be given in doses large enough to purge at the same time we may give thrice daily a tonic pill like the following sulfate of quinine one eight to three grains sulfate of iron one half grain to five grains extract of hyacinthus one eight to three grains extract of taraxacum and glycerin enough to make a pill locally perfect cleanliness cooling lotions patted on to the sore places sprats cure benzoated zinc ointment after the lotion has dried in wash carefully once a week using the ointment when skin is dry or the lotion to allay irritation two contagious skin diseases these are usually called mange proper and follicular mange or scabies i want to say a word on the latter first it depends upon a microscopic animalcule called the acarus folliculorum the trouble begins by the formation of patches from which the hair falls off and on which may be noticed a few pimples scabs form the patches extend or come out on other parts of the body head legs belly or sides skin becomes red in white-haired dogs other of this trouble very offensive more pain than itching seems to be the symptomatic rule whole body may become affected treatment dress the affected parts twice a week with the following creosote two drams linseed oil seven ounces solution of potash one ounce first mix the creosote and oil then add the solution and shake better to shave the hair off around the patches kennels must be kept clean with garden soap and hot water and all bedding burned after use from three months to six will be needed to cure bad cases mange proper is also caused by a parasite or acarus called the sarcops canus unlike eczema this mange is spread from dog to dog by touch or intercommunication just as one person catches the itch from another the symptoms at first this may escape attention but there are vesicles which the dog scratches and breaks and thus the disease spreads the hair gets matted and falls off regions of the body most commonly affected head chest back rump and extremities there may not be much constitutional disturbance from the actual injury to the skin but from his suffering so much from the irritation and the want of rest the health suffers treatment avoid the use of so-called disinfectants most of those sold as such are simply deodorizers and applied to the skin are useless nor are they of much use in cleaning the kennels nothing suits better for woodwork than first carbolic wash and then a thorough scrubbing with hot water and garden soap some ointment must be used to the skin and as i am writing for laymen only i feel cherry in recommending such strong ones as the green iodide of mercury if you do use it mix it with twice its bulk of the compound sulphur ointment do over only a part or two at a time the dog to be washed after three days but the compound sulphur ointment itself is a splendid application and it is not dangerous three skin complaints from vermin the treatment is obvious get rid of the cause as their diagnosis is so difficult whenever the dog owner is in doubt make certain by treating the dog not only by local applications but constitutionally as well in addition to good diet perfect cleanliness of coat kennel and all surroundings and application of the ointment or oil let the dog have all the fresh air possible and exercise 
but never over exciting or too fatiguing then a course of arsenic seldom fails to do good i do not believe in beginning the exhibition of arsenic too soon i prefer paying my first attentions to the digestive organs and state of the bowels the form of exhibition which i have found suit as well as any is a tasteless liquor arsenicalis it is easily administered it ought to be given mixed with the food as it ought to enter the blood with the chyle from the diet it ought day by day to be gradually not hurriedly increased symptoms of loathing of food and redness of conjunctiva call for the cessation of its use for two or three days at least when it is to be recommended at the same size of those given when left off there are two things which assist the arsenic at least to go well with it they are iron in some form and vero the latter will be needed when there is much loss of flesh a simple peel of sulphate of iron and extract of licorice may be used dose of liquor arsenicalis from one to six drops ter die to commence with gradually increased to five to twenty drops dandruff a scaly or scurfy condition of the skin with more or less of irritation it is really a shedding of the scaly epidermis brought on by injudicious feeding or want of exercise as a primary cause the dog in cases of this kind needs cooling medicines such as small doses of the nitrate and chlorates of potash perhaps less food bowels to be seen to by giving plenty of green food with a morsel of sheep's melt or raw liver occasionally wash about once in three weeks a very little borax in the last water say a drum to a gallon use mild soap never use a very hard brush or sharp comb tar soap rights may be tried parasites internal worms we have roughly speaking two kinds of worms to treat in the dog one the round and two the tape one round worms they are in shape and size not unlike the garden worm but harder pale and pointed symptoms sometimes these are alarming for the worm itself is occasionally seized with the mania for foreign travel and finds its way into the throat or nostrils causing the dog to become perfectly furious and inducing such pain and agony that it may seem charity to end its life the worms may also crawl into the stomach and give rise to great irritation but are usually dislodged therefrom by the violence accompanying the act of vomiting their usual habitat however is the small intestines where they occasion great distress to their host the appetite is always depraved and voracious at times there is colic with sickness and perhaps vomiting and the bowels are alternately constipated or loose the coat is harsh and staring there usually is short dry cough from reflex irritation of the bronchial mucous membrane a bad smelling breath and emaciation or at least considerable poverty of flesh the disease is most common in puppies and in young dogs the appearance of the ascaris in the dog's stool is of course the diagnostic symptom treatment i have cured many cases with santonin and areca nut powder betel nut dose ten grains to two drams or turpentine dose from ten drops to one and one half drams beaten up with yolk of egg but areca nut does better for tapeworm so we cannot do better than trust to pure santonin the dose is from one grain for a toy up to six grains for a mastiff mix it with a little butter and stick it well back in the roof of the dog's mouth he must have fasted previously for twelve hours and had a dose of castor oil the day before in four or five hours after he has swallowed the santonin let him have a dose of either olive oil or decoction of aloes dose two drums to two ounces or more repeat the treatment in five days spratt's cure may be safely depended on for worms the perfect cleanliness of the kennel is of paramount importance the animal's general health requires looking after and he may be brought once more into good condition by proper food and a course of vegetable tonics if wanted in show condition we have plasmon to fall back upon and borrows and welcomes extract of malt 
there is a round worm which at times infests the dog's bladder and may cause occlusion of the urethra a whipworm inhabiting the cecum another may occupy a position in the mucous membrane of the stomach some infest the blood and others the eye two tapeworms there are several kinds but the treatment is the same in all cases the commonest in the country is the cucumerin this is a tapeworm of about fifteen inches in average length although i have taken them from newfoundland pups fully thirty inches long it is a semi-transparent entozoan each segment is long compared to its breadth and narrowed at both ends each joint has when detached an independent sexual existence the dog often becomes infested with this parasite from eating sheep's brains and dogs thus afflicted and allowed to roam at pleasure over fields and hills where sheep are fed sow the seeds of gid in our flocks to any extent we know too well the great use of collie dogs to the shepherd or grazier to advise that dogs should not be employed as assistants but surely it would be to their owner's advantage to see that they were kept in a state of health and cleanliness treatment we ought to endeavor to prevent as well as to cure we should never allow our dogs to eat the entrails of hares or rabbits never allow them to be fed on raw sheep's intestines nor the brains of sheep never permit them to lounge around butchers shops nor eat offal of any kind let their food be well cooked and their skins and kennels kept scrupulously clean dogs that are used for sheep and cattle ought twice a year at least to go under treatment for the expulsion of worms whether they are infested or not an anthelmintic would make sure and could hardly hurt them for the expulsion of tape worms we depend mostly on areca nut in order that the tape worm should receive the full benefit of the remedy we order a dose of castor oil the day before in the morning and recommend no food to be given that day except beef tea or mutton broth the bowels are thus empty next morning so that the parasite cannot shelter itself anywhere and is therefore sure to be acted on infusion of cusco is sometimes used as an anthelmintic so is wormwood and the liquid extract of male fern and in america spigelia root and pumpkin seeds the best tonic to give in cases of worms is the extract of quassia extract of quassia one to ten grains extract of hyacinthus one half to five grains to make one pill thrice daily parasites external fleas washing with sprats medicated soap extra clean kennels dusting with keating and afterwards washing this may not kill the fleas but it drives them off take the dog on the grass while dusting and begin along the spine never do it in the house ticks i have noticed these disagreeable bloodsuckers only on the heads and bodies of sporting or collie dogs who had been boring for some time through coverts and thickets they soon make themselves visible as the body swells up with the blood they suck until they resemble small soft warts about as big as a pea they belong to the natural family ixodiade treatment if not very numerous they should be cut off and the part touched with the little turps the sulphuret of calcium will also kill them so will the more dangerous white precipitate or even a strong solution of carbolic acid which must be used sparingly however lice the lice are hatched from nits which we find clinging in rows and very tenaciously too to the hairs the insects themselves are more difficult to find but they are on puppies sometimes in thousands to destroy them i have tried several plans oil is very effectual and has safety to recommend it common sweet oil is as good as cure as any and you may add a little oil of anise and some sublimed sulphur which will increase the effect quassia water may be used to damp the coat the matted portions of a long-haired dog's coat must be cut off with scissors for there the lice often lurk the oil dressing will not kill the nits so that vinegar must be used after a few days the dressing must be repeated and so on three or four times 
to do any good the whole of the dog's coat must be drenched in oil and the dog washed with good dog soap and warm water twelve hours afterwards End of chapter 51, part 2. End of Dogs and All About Them by Robert Layton.